Revan was an individual who played pivotal roles as both a Jedi and a Sith during his lifetime. One of the most impactful individuals that ever lived, Revan had a complex trajectory through the universe. His teachings would continue to live on, even long after his time, and spark a chain of events which will warp the face of the galaxy millennia after his death. A complex path lies ahead, so we must begin at the beginning. A particular human male was born approximately in 3994. This child would eventually be discovered as Force-sensitive, and, as is the case with most such children, he would be accepted into the Jedi Order. The Jedi Master Kreia became his first master, the first of many, and it would appear she knew him better than most. Perhaps. I think it is fair to say that few did. Revan had a mother and father, parents, ancestors, like all Jedi do. And when he awakened to his potential, I was there to see it. But where he was born, where he came from, I do not know, any more than I know where he walks now. Some said that Revan was born in the outer regions, beyond the Rim, and that's what called to him during the Mandalorian Wars. And after, it was the call of home. He came to me, yes both before and after, before Revan knew himself. And after, in the times when Revan was coming to his own and learning he was more than he had been told. At one time, Revan was my Padawan in times past, long ago. This young human, whose birth name remains unknown to history, trained along with a fellow student named Alec. Both received training from the Jedi Master, Jar Lestin, who in time noted the young man's insatiable desire for knowledge, believing it was simply youthful exuberance and eagerness. All but Master Vrook shared the sentiment, for Vrook was wary of this desire for knowledge. But then again, Vrook was always quick to criticize when it came to the lure of the dark side. The youngling studied and learned much, in particular studying Force Bonds and other uncommon Force Powers during his time as a Padawan. With time, alongside his friend Alec, he achieved the rank of Jedi Knight. At this point in time, he would presumably have been in his late twenties. The two young men became acknowledged among the most promising members of the Jedi Order, although Alec was commonly referred to as the second of the two. Meanwhile, the first would be recognized for his charisma, as well as his power and skill. But Revan, when he had learned all he could, had other masters, that fool Ja and other Jedi on other planets. He learned from each, but in the end, he turned back to me. When he realized there was nothing more to be learned from the Jedi except how one could leave them forever. Even though young Revan talked to Kreia and intended to leave the Order, he did not do so yet. Shortly after the two achieved the rank of Jedi Knight, in the year 3964, warriors of the Mandalorian culture began an invasion of the Galactic Republic territories in the Outer Rim. Swiftly, the Mandalorian Wars began to engulf the larger galaxy. The Republic turned to the Jedi Council for aid, but the Council of the Jedi refused to be involved in this conflict. Their main reason for this was the belief that the true threat of the conflict was yet to show itself, and if the Jedi involved themselves, they may be weakened, and this unknown threat would be that much greater. They chose to wait until this unknown threat revealed itself, as the Mandalorian Wars ravaged the galaxy. Most members of the Order remained silent on this matter, but the young Jedi Knight chose to speak up. He approached members of the Order and argued that the Jedi must actively aid the Republic military against the Mandalorians. Because of this, the Republic media branded him as the Jedi's own crusader, and this crusader began to build a following of Jedi who shared his beliefs, even though the Order discouraged his efforts. The young man's influence grew like wildfire, as did the Mandalorian threat. Casualties and wounds to the Republic's power continued to spread. 
Alec, of course, was the first who followed him, and the young man, who would later be known as Revan, was recognized as the honorary master of his followers. Against the wishes of the council, the young crusader and his followers involved themselves in the Mandalorian Wars, scouting the enemy lines and searching for ways to convince the Jedi Order to join the war. In a short amount of time, this faction of Jedi that followed him became known as the Revenkist Movement, and he became known as the Revenkist. The Revenkist and his followers continued recruiting Jedi and talking to anyone who would listen. They looked for ways to prove to the Jedi Council something that would warrant their official entry into the war. Yet, no matter what they brought to the Council, they refused the request. A grim opportunity presented itself when a Jedi named Pharaoh brought the planet Cathar to the Revenkist's attention. Pharaoh's entire species, the Cathar, had vanished from their homeworld a decade ago. Only buildings remained, and the Republic believed this was simply the result of mass migration due to disease. But Pharaoh, along with the Revenkist, believed this was the Mandalorian's doing, and he believed it was the crucial evidence needed to convince the Council that the Mandalorians were a threat that must be stopped. If the Jedi Order was forced to face Mandalorian atrocities, they would not be able to deny his request. The young Revenkist stayed on Cathar for a while, looking for evidence of whatever tragedy occurred here. At that time, the Jedi Council ordered the recall, or if necessary, the detention of the Revenkists. This was mainly driven by the rumor that the Mandalorians had been weakened from within by some sort of conspiracy or rebellion within their ranks. This rumor was sufficient reason to demand that the Revenkist and his followers disband. Alec, now known as Captain Malek, returned to Cathar to the young Revenkist, followed by the Jedi Masters to ensure their order was delivered clearly and obeyed. The Jedi Masters ordered the Revenkist and his followers to abandon their quest, claiming the Mandalorians were no special threat. The Revenkist started to believe all was lost, and that the Order could never be persuaded to join the conflict. But in the midst of their discussion, he discovered a Mandalorian mask underfoot. He picked it up, and immediately the entire group of Jedi was enveloped in a false vision of the past. Hundreds of Cathar are storming towards the beach. They are pursued by Mandalorians. The Revenkist and the Jedi try to defend the Cathar, but their lightsabers are useless. This vision, it is of the past. The Cathar and the Mandalorians are phantoms. They continue undisturbed. The Cathar are herded into the ocean. The leader of the Mandalorian forces, Marshal Cassus Fett, orders his troops to prepare to massacre the Cathar from the ships in the sky. The Mandalorians pull back, leaving the Cathar in the water. The Jedi shout at them, but none can hear, and they remain unable to aid the helpless Cathar. Suddenly, a Mandalorian female flies in front of the Cathar and pleads with Fett on their behalf. She says that the Cathar are defeated. There's no need for this genocide. They don't need to do this. Fett declares that the species of Cathar is to be annihilated for dishonoring the Mandalorians during the Great Sith War that happened several years ago. And if this warrior chooses to stand with the Cathar in their final moments, Fett says, she should perish alongside them as well. Fett salutes her efforts before authorizing the warships to fire, killing the Cathar along with the female Mandalorian. The Cathar, the people, and the planet scream around the Jedi. And then it's over. With the vision's end, the Jedi were left alone on the beach, but they had seen what the Cathar had seen, and they felt what they felt. Cruelty, pain, and the death of a species boiled away in the sea. Fett intended to leave only buildings of the Cathar to stand as a reminder of their existence, but this mask was a testament he neglected to destroy.
carrying the memory of the tragedy that was hidden from the universe until now. Inspired by the unknown Mandalorian sacrifice, the Revenkist put the mask upon his face. I don't know your name, but I will take up your cause, he said. I will not remove your mask until there's justice, until the Mandalorians have been defeated once and for all. So swears Revan. The Jedi Council was deeply affected by this discovery, and although they were still unwilling to lead the Jedi Order into the war, they permitted the intervention of Revan and his faction on behalf of the Republic. Officially, of course, they still denounced Revan's actions as unwise and too hasty, and dissuaded the rest of the Order from joining his cause. Revan and his Jedi joined the Republic military in battling the Mandalorians openly. At this time, the Jedi Mitra Surik, one of the first who joined him, would become one of Revan's most valuable and trusted lieutenants. In little time, Revan's leadership resulted in a string of military victories. He successfully proved himself as a capable military leader, and in under a year, he would be named Supreme Commander and have a third of the Republic military under his direct command. Under his leadership, the Republic began pushing back the Mandalorians. But such a success did not come without a price. Revan's tactics often included moral shortcuts, which involved obtaining victory at the cost of sacrificing resources, territory, and people. They developed a cold approach, colder than that of any Jedi. But this approach was the only one that could work against the Mandalorians, for their brutal and merciless tactics could only be countered in such a way. Over the course of the next two years, as they continued aiding the Republic effort in the war, the two discovered an ancient ruin of the Rakata species near the Jedi Enclave on Dantooine. In secret, they explored these ruins. The rooms held within appeared to be so old they predated the Republic. Before they crossed the threshold to the inner chamber of this temple, Malak warned Revan of the consequences, believing that the Council would banish them if they attempted to enter this place. Regardless of his warning, Revan entered, and Malak followed. Here, in the inner chamber, they discovered a star map, a relic of the Rakata species, which showed a part of the location of the Rakatan space station, known as the Starforge. The Starforge was a space station built by the Rakatan Infinite Empire in 30,000 before the Battle of Yavin. It was constructed above the star Abo in the Lihon system and drew upon the star's energy and matter, which, when combined with the power of the Force, was capable of creating an endless supply of ships, droids, and any other material. Known as the Builders, the Rakata species constructed this space station through the use of slaves from many worlds, including Dantooine, Coruscant, Manan, and Tatooine, to name a few. But this technological wonder came at a cost. The Rakata were a cruel and savage species by nature. The Starforge, linked to the Force, began feeding off of these negative traits and became an immense tool of dark side power. Their long-term use of dark side power corrupted their society and turned them into a race of merciless warriors. The Rakata used their potent Force-powered technologies to conquer and enslave every other species they came across throughout their known galaxy. During the reign of their infinite empire, they were characterized by their cruelty, savagery, and arrogance. They were known to strip entire planets of their resources, terraform worlds to fit their own shifting needs, to kill entire slave workforces, and to eat and defile the bodies of slain enemies, and even members of their own species. After generations of galactic supremacy for thousands of years, the Infinite Empire began to fracture. 
constant tensions between internal factions suddenly erupted into a devastating civil war caused by the Starforge's corrupting influence. Already weakened by warfare, the Rakata were suddenly struck by a deadly plague that spread rapidly through their ranks and decimated the species. It was later theorized that the disease was created by a slave species because it had only infected the builders themselves. This plague nearly exterminated the Rakata species and brought the Infinite Empire to its knees. Thereafter, the Rakata suddenly and inexplicably began to lose their connection to the Force. They were unable to uncover the source of their failing sensitivity. In time, it would be revealed that a mysterious mutation in the plague had stripped the builders of their powers. Millions of Rakata died as a result, and those that survived had lost their connection to the Force. As the Force users were culled from the population, the Rakata lost the ability to use their own technology. Soon, they were forced to rely on inferior devices that were not dependent on the Force. Sensing weakness in their masters, slave species rebelled, and large-scale insurrections occurred across the galaxy, resulting in the total collapse of the Infinite Empire in 25,200. As a result of their vulnerability, the Rakata were unable to suppress the massive outbreak of violent slave rebellions and uprisings against their rule. The remaining Rakata could do nothing but abandon their conquests and retreat to the safety of their homeworld of Lihon. Their species began a slow descent into barbarity, as they lived in tribes that would continually fight amongst themselves. Over centuries, the Builders were purposefully erased from the records of their slave subjects, and the Infinite Empire slipped from the pages of galactic history. A faction among the Rakata held memories and knowledge of the Starforge, and with so much time having passed, the Rakatan Elders decided to destroy the Starforge in order to finally put their bloody past behind them. But. As the Rakata could no longer use the Force, they had no way of fulfilling their quest. The Temple of the Ancients on Lihon was said to contain the secrets of the Starforge, but as they were no longer Force-sensitive, they could not use them. Thus, the Rakatan ancestors locked the knowledge of the Starforge away in the Temple of the Ancients, so it could never be used again. And so, they remained on the planet of Lihon, with the Starforge looming in the skies above, waiting to be found, while the rest of the galaxy continued to move forward, oblivious of its existence. The star map Revan and Malak discovered on Dantooine was the first connection the galaxy had to the Starforge, but it was only one piece of the puzzle which led to it, an incomplete map, and Revan knew that if they succeeded in finding more star maps, they could find the Starforge. He could deduct very little about what the Starforge itself was, based on the findings in these ruins, but he knew it was a powerful tool, capable of turning the tide of any war. With such a tool at his disposal, the fall of the Mandalorians would be inevitable. Soon thereafter, they would find another map on the Wookiee homeworld of Kashyyyk. But the map too was still incomplete, and with the Mandalorian threat demanding their full attention, the two paused their search for the time being. On his journey to gather information and establish a tactical base on the Outer Rim to use against the Mandalorians, Revan discovered stories of a world which was a taboo in Mandalorian culture, Malachor V. As the Mandalorians refused to set foot on it, this planet represented the perfect location for a military base. Revan explored the planet's surface, and here he found the Treus Academy, a place engulfed in dark side energies. Here he found evidence that the ancient Sith had once occupied the Treus Academy, but they abandoned it, meaning they are currently somewhere else. Deeply intrigued by the information he found here, 
Revan was also troubled. He concluded that the Republic, in its current state, was not prepared to defend itself or the wider galaxy from the return of these ancient Sith. He knew they would return eventually, and he knew he had to prepare the galaxy for that moment in time. Revan believed that a new government, a new rule, needed to rise in the place of the Republic. For the Republic, under its current rulership, would never be strong enough to fight back such an invasion. The Republic would need to become a military force which held the power to fight back these ancient Sith once they returned. He had to think far ahead, not just of the current Mandalorian threat. No, the Mandalorians were merely one threat looming on the horizon, and reinstituting the Treyas Academy and building a strong army of his own would be the answer to all the threats that may soon emerge. No price was too high, and Revan willingly submitted to the dark side of the Force, drawing power from it. He proceeded in re-establishing the Treyas Academy in secret and using the dark side to bind the most trusted followers to his will. This ensured they would do his bidding and act as a powerful army of Jedi who will stop at nothing to save the galaxy. Revan's choices were always his own. It was not teaching or circumstance or example, it was him. And there is something that the Council may never understand, that perhaps Revan never fell. The difference between a fall and a sacrifice is sometimes difficult, but I feel that Revan understood that difference more than anyone knew. The galaxy would have fallen if Revan had not gone to war. Perhaps he became the Dark Lord out of necessity, to prevent a greater evil, someone who was willing to wage war to save others. But that is my belief, since I knew Revan from long ago, as a master knows their apprentice. Revan did not renounce the Jedi ways, or the Jedi Order. He and Malak continued to battle the Mandalorians, in many instances across the known galaxy. One such endeavor took place on the planet Taris, where Revan led a group of Jedi to free slaves who were about to be sold on the slave market. Among these freed slaves was a young Force-sensitive Cathar named Juhani. One of Revan's Jedi advised her to join the Jedi Order, which she did thereafter. They pushed onwards, fighting, until Revan and Malak lost a battle against the Mandalorian Marshal Cassius Fett, the one responsible for the Cathar genocide. This defeat prompted Revan to change his tactics. His orders called for more aggressive action for greater sacrifices. He ordered a large part of his forces, under now General Mitra Surik, to attack the Mandalorian strongholds on Onderon and Duxon. These numerous attacks probed the Mandalorian lines for weaknesses, and Surik carried out his orders, despite her weakened forces. For Surik, this was the most impactful mark of the war she experienced, as the battle on Duxon lasted for months. The Mandalorians were deeply entrenched after decades of fortifying the moon. They were well defended by hidden minefields, traps, anti-air turrets, and the ferocious beasts of the jungle itself. As a result, the battle on Duxon was one of the bloodiest in the entire war. Once the battle was over, the bodies of Republic soldiers and the hulks of fallen spacecraft littered the jungle floor. According to the Mandalorians, the Republic lost many of their forces taking Duxon, and for every Mandalorian soldier who fell, the Republic paid with ten of theirs. This was where the Mandalorian Wars truly took their toll on Surik. Surik carried out her orders, even though it resulted in the deaths of those who followed them. If you ask us to charge, will it make a difference? Will our sacrifice mean something? Most of those left under her command were lost during a desperate charge across a minefield as they attempted to strike at the Mandalorian emplacements. In the end, the countless deaths brought about victory. They retook Onderon and its companion moon, Duxon. These events were paid in blood, and losses that would appear unacceptable for any other commander. But this victory would set the stage for the final phases of the war. 
once Revan decided that a critical point had been reached and the war's end was drawing near, he ordered the construction of a superweapon known as the Mass Shadow Generator, which had been designed by the Zabrak engineer Beodur. This device was to serve as a centerpiece of a trap, which, once detonated, would eliminate all targets within its vicinity, ending the war once and for all. The device was to be detonated on the planet of Malachor V. Its location was ideal for the task. 3960 before the Battle of Yavin, the Republic fleet established for the task was split in two, one half under the command of Revan, the other under the command of Surik. Surik's forces would serve as bait to draw the Mandalorians into the range of the mass shadow generator while those under Revan's command would launch a direct assault on Mandalore's flagship. Many of the soldiers and Jedi present at the battle happened to be those who were not big supporters of Revan or his tactics. Some later believed Revan purposefully assigned them to the battle in order to eliminate them. A change of plans occurred, however, when Revan was delayed by a Mandalorian scouting party. His ship arrived in the Malachor system to find a vast battle long underway. With time, Mandalore, the leader of the Mandalorians, realized that defeat was inevitable, and as a final attempt, he decided to challenge Revan to single combat. Revan accepted Mandalore's challenge, and the two engaged in a duel to the death aboard Mandalore's flagship. Mandalore was a powerful opponent, but despite his best efforts, he would eventually be overcome. By the duel's end, Mandalore lay dying at Revan's feet. Mandalore removed his mask, coughing up blood, and began to speak. He told Revan that he had been betrayed. In his dying breaths, Mandalore explained that he had been manipulated by a red-skinned Sith who tricked him to attack the Republic convinced the Mandalorians would be victorious. Before he died, Mandalore gave Revan the coordinates to the Ice World, where he met this mysterious Sith. Revan took Mandalore's mask, the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, as his spoils of war. He knew that the Mandalorians would be unable to unite again without it. The war was not yet over. The Republic forces and Revan's Jedi continued pushing the Mandalorians closer to Malachor V as planned, and once they were close enough, Surik turned to Beodur and gave the command. I remember standing on the bridge with you and watching the destruction of the Republic, watching ships full of soldiers and Jedi burn and die. I remember the look you had when you turned to me. It was the longest you'd ever looked at me. You didn't say anything, just a nod. Events moved quickly then, even in my dreams. Flashes, explosions, you falling. I could feel the pain around me. And then the memory. The drifting hulks of the Mandalorian ships, the dead, allies, friends, strangers. And then the echo, lingering. The sound I awakened to in my nightmares. None of us realized the magnitude of what we unleashed. A slaughter caused by one of my creations. Revan's vessel was beyond the range of the superweapon as it deployed. And both he and Surik watched in horror as most of the Mandalorian fleet and a large number of Republic vessels were drawn into a massive gravity vortex which obliterated the surface of Malachor V. Malachor V was turned into a broken cluster of planetoids that were only tenuously fused together by the gravitational anomalies present in the system. Orbiting the broken remains of the planet was the wreckage of countless Mandalorian and Republic warships. All that remained on the surface of the planet was a desolate graveyard echoing with the deaths of thousands of Jedi, Republic soldiers and Mandalorians. With the planet fractured to its core, thousands died on both sides of the battle. 
The Mandalorians suffered far greater losses, of course, and in the wake of the devastation, those that remained transmitted their unconditional surrender to the Republic forces and marked the ending of the Mandalorian Wars. In the weeks that followed, Revan ordered that the remaining Mandalorian soldiers be stripped of their armor and weaponry. Their basilisk war droids, powerful, semi-sentient combat droids, were to be dismantled. Revan refused to return Mandalore's mask in order to prevent the next Mandalore from rising, thus not allowing the Mandalorian clans to unite under a shared banner. Many of the Mandalorian troops became mercenaries and bounty hunters. With the matter of the Mandalorian Wars resolved, Revan turned to his next objective. When he first discovered Malachor V and the secret Treyas Academy there, Revan had learned of a lurking threat of the Sith growing in the unknown regions. He also knew that the galaxy was not ready to defend itself, and that in order to save the Republic from impending doom, he needed to conquer it and make it stronger. But tactics such as those which brought about the devastation of Malachor V were not something he wanted to see repeated, so he opted for a more discreet way of eliminating his targets. Revan constructed an assassination droid, using Zerka's HK-24 design as a basis for his model. He included several of his own upgrades and ensured the droid would be the perfect tool to eliminate any political opponent in order to selectively and discreetly achieve his goals. The droid bore the mark of HK-47 and would have a rather unique view on life. Statement. Oh, master, who deserved what and why is of no consequence. It is only killing a target and how it is done that matters. HK-47 was built by Revan to be a lethal assassin droid, albeit one with a sharp wit, combined with a barely concealed hatred of organic beings. Many years into the future, HK-47 would share his opinions on the Mandalorian Wars with Surik. HK presumed that Revan had an ulterior motive when he destroyed Malachor V. He believed that the devastation wrought by Malachor's destruction was intended to break the Jedi and make them loyal to Revan alone. After Malachor, Revan's most trusted general, Mitra Surik, lost her connection to the Force as a result of the Mass Shadow Generator's destruction. The destruction of Malachor V was so powerful it fractured the very fabric of the Force and transmitted a Force echo within its vicinity, which would kill any being capable of hearing it. Surik was strong in the Force, and once the echo reached her, she felt the pain and heard the screams of all souls who died in the devastation of the planet. Horrified by it, her mind instinctively ripped itself away from the Force to protect itself. As such, she could no longer hear its call, nor be influenced through it. She was free. Now the Jedi Council demanded the return of Revan and those under him, so that they answer for their actions. Revan and Malak refused to obey. They took the rest of their forces into the unknown regions of the galaxy, claiming they went to pursue the remaining Mandalorians. In truth, no one in the known galaxy truly knew where Revan had gone. Surik, on the other hand, was free of his influence, and she chose to obey the Council. Upon learning of her choice, Malak advised Revan to use HK-47 to eliminate Surik. If I were out to kill you, we would not be speaking. But Revan, seeing Surik as a Jedi who was already dead, did no such thing. Instead, he allowed her to travel to Coruscant and stand in front of the Jedi Council and be a demonstration of their hypocrisy, their choice to stand still, to do nothing while countless innocents died, then to dare to preach lessons about peace, lectures on maintaining it, discussing, debating, pondering, commenting on the darkness of the galaxy, when they had never set foot into it all the while condemning those willing to endure the horrors and evils hiding in the dark. And now, one of those who dared to do so stands before them, one 
who was willing to wage war, to kill, to sacrifice those who stood by her in hopes of ending the horror that would never stop, and to end the lives of enemies as swiftly as those of friends with a single nod of her head. Facing the false echo, she could hear all of their dying screams, then ripped her entire being away from the very fabric of the force in order to stay alive, and would do it all again in a heartbeat. Her reward? You are exiled, and you are a Jedi no longer. There is one last thing. Your lightsaber. Surrender it to us. Surik left known space for a time. No Jedi could sense her, and she could never be found by anyone, even Revan until she chose to be found. The case of Surik was intriguing to some of the Jedi on the Council, and it appears Revan's demonstration of hypocrisy via Surik did not go entirely unnoticed. Most notably, Master Zezkai El felt that they were punishing Surik not because of her acts, but because of what she represented, the fallen Jedi and that Surik would be the perfect opportunity to examine why and how so many Jedi fell to the dark side, and how they could alter their ways to prevent that fall. He began to wonder how correct the Jedi Order was, how their code might not truly represent the ideal upon which their teachings should be based. So many questions, and yet so few were answered, as others on the Council more conservative members, such as Master Atrus, thought nothing of this. We have not lost a Jedi this day. You felt it. She has lost herself. She is no Jedi. She walked Revan's path, but she was not strong enough. I fear it is our teachings that may have led Revan to choose the path he did. We are not the ones who taught him. We take responsibility, Atrus, not cast blame. The choice of one was the choice of us all. Revan's teacher intended no harm. And Revan had many teachers since. Yet they all stem from the same source. Her teachings violated the Jedi Code and lead all who listen to the dark side, as they did the exile. The impact Surik made on the Jedi Order was undeniable. Some Jedi, Jedi Masters included, left the Order once they began to search for answers and came to recognize that the Order was flawed. Even when presented with a unique situation, a Jedi separated from the Force, the Council desperately clung to their teachings, blinding themselves further. They described Surik as a dead Jedi, a dead spot in the Force, whose future was uncertain. A terrible thing. Kreia believed the opposite. She believed Surik was a unique being, the most unique in all of the universe. For she was the only individual who was in reality free of the Force, free from its influence, its touch, her choices, her own. You were deafened. At last, you could hear. You were broken. You were whole. You were blinded. And at last, you saw. Forgive me, mistress, but I must ask... The Exile. I've never seen another affect you so strongly. Was she important to you once? We all have our heroes, and when we watch them fall, we die inside. She made a choice once, and I did not. The day we judged her, I stood in the chamber, and she was... She was so right. She was so certain of it. I doubted myself, but not now. She will never make me doubt myself again. Revan and Malak traveled alone to Rekyad, the ice world, following Mandalore's directions, which led them to a pair of ice columns several kilometers high. Here, they found the Sith tomb which belonged to the Sith Lord Dramath II. Within this sarcophagus, they found a datacron which confirmed Mandalore's tale. About two years before he declared war on the Republic, Mandalore was approached by a man with skin the color of blood. This being was a pure-blood Sith. The species had vanished after the Great Hyperspace War and hasn't been seen in Republic space in over a thousand years. 
This creature came to Mandalore, claiming to be the emissary of a powerful master. This emissary was sent to find the tomb and the remains of Dramath II, an ancient ruler. Mandalore helped him and led him to this very tomb where Revan and Malak stand as they examine the Datacron's contents. In exchange for Mandalore's help, the Sith told him of a vision his master had had, of the Mandalorians rising up against the Republic, crushing its world, until the Mandalorians stood victorious. Of course, a powerful leader such as Mandalore the Ultimate would not wage war on the Republic based on the word of a stranger. This Sith used the power of the Dark Side to manipulate Mandalore. The spell was broken moments before his death, when Mandalore lay dying at Revan's feet. Revan pondered why the ancient Sith would do such a thing. If indeed they tricked the Mandalorians, what would the point of such a plan be? He had many theories. One of them presumed the Sith wanted to learn and test the limits of Republic power and capability when faced with such an open assault. Of course, the Mandalorians too would need to be conquered once the ancient Sith returned, so it would only serve as an opportune plan to pin two potential opponents against one another. Whatever the outcome, it would be favorable for the Sith, for the galaxy would be weakened and theirs for the taking. The Datacron in Dramath's sarcophagus contained hyperspace coordinates that led to a planet called Nathema. Revan and Malak had never heard of such a place. They followed the trail in search of answers, hoping to learn more about the unknown Sith and his master. Once they reached Nathema, they were shocked to learn, in sense, that the planet was completely barren of the Force. It was not an easy thing to ignore. For Force sensitives, such a place would take its toll with each passing moment. Upon landing, they found the definition of a barren world. There appeared to be nothing alive here, but there were remnants of civilization. Revan and Malak searched the empty buildings, looking for anything that would take them to the next step in their journey. Examining the technology and records they found, the two learned of the Sith Lord Vitiate, who had lived around a thousand years ago. They found records dating back to 4999, which indicated that the Sith Lord Vitiate summoned many of the remaining Sith at the time to Nathema, after they had been defeated by the Republic and the Jedi in the Great Hyperspace War. He promised to lead the Sith to a new future of prosperity, and invited them to join him in a ritual of Sith magic. According to the records Revan found on Nathema, that was the last recorded day of life on the planet. And whatever happened on that day, whatever Lord Vitiate did, resulted in the destruction of life on a planetary scale. Not only that, it also made the planet completely barren of the Force. It was difficult to focus, and the constant exposure to this void and the Force would surely result in severe stress and perhaps even mental collapse of any force-sensitive being that would spend time here. It was strange that there appeared to be no record of any sort after that time, meaning someone, presumably Lord Vitiate, prevented anyone from coming to this world in a thousand years since then. Among the records on Nathema, they found the astrogation charts which led to a storm-covered world, Drummond Kaas. According to records, Emperor Vitiate gathered the young generations of the Sith and took them to this place to build the foundations of his new Sith Empire. Determined to locate the Sith threat, Revan and Malak followed this trail. The third planet of the Drummond system, terrestrial, breathable, and covered in jungles and oceans, Drummond Kaas is engulfed in a pervasive shroud of dark side energy, making it the perfect home for the Sith. 
and once Revan and Malak arrived, they discovered it to indeed be the capital of a reconstituted Sith Empire under the rule of the Sith Emperor. They posed as mercenaries and spent months gathering information about the world and its ruler. They would learn that Vitiate, still in rule after all this time, indeed plotted to invade the Republic. Using their accumulated knowledge, the two decided to stop the Emperor. Pride played a vital part in their decision. And it is understandable. A Jedi who had brought the entirety of the Mandalorians to their knees and slew Mandalore himself would surely be capable of killing just another man. And with his apprentice by his side, they could save the galaxy for a second time. They found a member of the Imperial Guard who was willing to sneak them inside the Emperor's citadel. But the two had little knowledge of the Emperor's power or his guard. At the end of their training, each and every member of the Imperial Guard was bound to the Emperor's will through a powerful ritual. This makes betrayal an impossibility. As the Imperial Guard led them closer to the Emperor, they believed their plan was in motion. Instead, they were being led into a trap. The Emperor had sensed the two approaching. He was waiting for them to arrive in his throne room. The massive doors crashed behind them. No guard was there, because none was needed. The two Jedi confronted him, but they would not even make their attack before they fell. They underestimated the Emperor's power, and he dominated their minds in seconds. Their will was shattered. The Emperor looked into Revan's mind, examining how to make use of these peculiar Jedi who attempted to kill him. But at the same time, Revan saw the reflection of the Emperor and the evil within. He could see that invading the Republic was amongst his plans, but it was only a stepping stone. Power and immortality was his obsession. The dark side consumed him from within like a disease, and it grew faster than he could feed it. Nathema, an entire world, was consumed to sate his hunger. And yet it wasn't enough. But with such hunger, there's fear. He is afraid of death, terrified of it. The thought of near-infinite power slipping away has driven him mad. In this twisted, perverse vision of the world, the only way to succeed, to preserve what he has achieved, was to annihilate every potential threat in the galaxy. Nathema was just the beginning. The hunger for power, the fear, it is guiding him to destroy every single world in existence, until nothing remains but an emperor over an empty and lifeless galaxy. But such thoughts were kept secret, hidden in his mind. If his dark council and those who served under him learned of this, if they knew or even assumed that Drummond Kaas could be the next Nathema, they would never obey his command, for all living things were his pawns. He waited and accumulated power before he could set his plans in motion. Annihilating the Republic was only one piece of a much larger plan. With Revan and Malak now under his control, his plans could be accelerated, for these were no ordinary puppets of the Emperor. No, these two held much knowledge and skill in defending the known galaxy and its Republic. They also held the knowledge of this Starforge. The Emperor granted them the title of Darth, making them Sith Lords, and sent them back to the galaxy as the vanguard of his invasion of the Republic. They were to report back to him only once all resistance was crushed, and the Republic was ready for the taking. Darth Revan and Darth Malak, their minds no longer their own, departed Drummond Kaas in search of the Starforge, with the intent of using it to overpower the Republic. First, they used the star maps they had found on Dantooine and Kashyyyk to locate similar star maps on planets Manan, Tatooine, and Korriban. While on Korriban, Revan took note of the Sith Academy there which had been established several decades prior, during the Great Sith War which resulted in the collapse of the Sith Empire. Despite knowing of the Academy's existence, the Jedi Order had left it be and did not lead an assault on the facility after the conclusion of the war. 
Revan and Malak found the final star map they needed on Korriban. Around this time, Revan created his own Sith holocron, which documented his thoughts on the nature of the relationship between a Sith master and his apprentice. Among the significant portion of data included within, Revan noted within this holocron that any master who takes on more than a single apprentice is a fool, and that only once the apprentice learns enough to overpower the master would he be worthy enough to take his place. This is the only way each successive apprentice would become stronger. He shared his views on the fact that the strongest must rule, and if one has several apprentices, they would unite and overthrow the one who is in power, defeating the purpose of producing stronger apprentices. This would imply that he expected to be killed by Malak at one point in time, when Malak became strong enough to fairly and unequivocally demonstrate that he is more powerful than Revan. With the Korriban star map discovered, using the information from the other star maps, Darth Revan and Darth Malak were able to triangulate the location of the Starforge, and they immediately set out to find it. They entered the Lihon system and confirmed the location of the Starforge. As they approached the Starforge, they soon found their communications and navigational systems disabled. The Temple of the Ancients on the planet Lihon broadcasted a disruptor field which disabled any vessel that came close enough. As they approached Lihon for a crash landing, they could see the planet's surface littered with the wreckage of spaceships unfortunate enough to have stumbled across the planet's hidden location. After their crash landing, it was evident that they needed to disable the disruptor field in order to leave this planet and reach the Starforge. To their surprise, they were taken captive by the native Black Rakata tribe. Revan could not understand the primitive's language, so he tore the knowledge from the one, the Rakatan leader, enabling him to learn Rakatan. With this language, he learned that the source of the disruptor field was in the Temple of the Ancients, but the Black Rakata could not enter it. For this, he used another tribe of the Rakata, the more civilized one, to breach the temple. These Rakata elders still held knowledge of the Starforge, and unlike the Black Rakata, they intended to destroy the Starforge as a means of undoing their dark history. Revan learned much of the Rakata and their history from the elders. He learned that the elders were no longer as violent as their ancestors had been. They wanted to move on from the events of their dark past and restore their species' force sensitivity. They had the ability to lower the force field which blocked the temple's entrance, but they themselves had no purpose to do it. They could no longer use its technology or that of the Starforge due to their loss of force sensitivity, so they locked it away in the temple, behind a force field that could be brought down only through a complex chant by the elders. Therefore, Revan made a deal with them. They agreed to lower the temple's defenses for Revan and Revan alone to enter. In exchange, Revan would destroy the Starforge and help the Rakata free themselves from their dark history. However, once the elders lowered the temple's defenses, Revan broke his word and alongside Malak entered the temple. He disabled the disruptor field which prevented ships from leaving the planet. Before departing, Revan left his holocron in the lowest level of the temple, in the wall behind the main console. The two Sith Lords finally reached the Starforge and had access to its might. They would now use its power to bring the Republic to its knees and prepare it for the Emperor's invasion. The two foolish Jedi had underestimated the Emperor's power when they faced him, but he too underestimated their wills. They were not powerful enough to free themselves from the instructions he had placed within their minds. Their minds were strong, and they tried to fight back in any way they could, but they failed. Until now, exposed to the energies of the Starforge, they were more powerful than ever. And with the dark side pouring through them stronger than ever before, their minds became powerful enough to fight back. They twisted and perverted the information they were given, as they fell deeper into the grasp of the dark side, they gained greater strength, and their minds became powerful enough to block out all memory of the Sith and the Emperor, and they were partially free from this control. But the order remained, fragments of memory. 
They called themselves Sith. They were Sith, and they still obeyed and intended to attack the Republic. But they believed this decision, the intent, the desire, was their own, and they knew nothing of the Emperor waiting on Drummond Kaas for their return. Darth Revan and his apprentice Darth Malak declared themselves leaders of a new Sith Empire, assuming command of the Republic troops which had followed them into the unknown regions after the Mandalorian Wars. Darth Revan made them into the military of his new empire, with Darth Malak as his second in command, his apprentice. The Starforge manufactured ships, weapons, and other war material to supply these troops. The two quickly turned to Korriban, reinforcing the Sith Academy to supply their empire with Sith apprentices. Revan continued to research the potential of the Starforge. Taking a fragment of it, no bigger than a fingertip, he experimented with it and discovered its potential to create anything out of anything. It would take whatever it was given, be it the force or simple physical mass, and return to the basic building blocks of the universe – water, air, carbon, and even life. It could then construct whatever was desired from these elements. But Revan did not take the Starforger's power lightly. In fact, he was keenly aware of its power and influence, keeping the Rakatan history in mind. He knew that the Rakatans' reliance on this space station led to their destruction. As a result, Revan viewed the station as a threat and minimized his exposure to the Starforge. Darth Malak saw this decision as a weakness. With the potential of the Starforge at his side, and his dark Jedi troops, Revan laid out a twenty-year-long plan of conquering the Republic. The first target was the Republic shipyard on the planet Forost. His forces seized most of the Republic warships there and destroyed the rest. This battle marked the beginning of the Jedi Civil War. The Battle of Forost marked the beginning of the Jedi Civil War. Revan built connections and established partnerships, most notably with the Zerka Corporation. With a reputation of an unethical opportunist, the Zerka Corporation was a galaxy-spanning business involved in many fields, focused on profit, and one that didn't hesitate to take advantage of illegal activities such as slavery when an appropriate legal loophole was found to exploit it. In one instance, the Zerka Corporation was so focused on profit that it allowed the starvation of colonists when they couldn't pay for Zerka's high prices. With vast resources on their side, Revan offered Zerka a trade monopoly within the territory of his empire, in exchange for their logistical and economic support across the galaxy. A vital part of Revan's strategy, a continuation of his strategy at Malakor V, was to capture and corrupt as many Jedi as possible. These captured Jedi would be tortured and converted to the dark side. Revan's specifically trained Sith assassins learned the art of infiltration and stealth to enable them to strike swiftly at targets across the galaxy and capture enemy Jedi while killing those who would not turn. Revan began to use HK-47 to eliminate a number of political figures, ensuring he would weaken the Republic sufficiently in key areas, but causing the least amount of damage to its economy and military in the process, so that then he could take control and rebuild it to be stronger. One example was the assassination of an Achani senator. The Achani were a culture of respected warriors, famous for being known as the best duelists of their time. However, the Achani were planning to separate from the Galactic Republic, thus weakening its infrastructure. Revan had HK-47 eliminate an Achani senator, which provoked a chain of events that destabilized their government to such a point that separating from the Republic was no longer an option, ensuring the Republic would remain intact. Quite a challenging element to balance it must have been to Revan, to make plans to defeat the Republic but yet keep it strong enough to make it a worthy prize for the taking. With time, the dark side began taking its toll, and Darth Malak started losing his focus. He began to openly resent his master. With enough time, he began openly expressing his opinion, and in one instance, as they were aboard Revan's flagship, he accused Revan of being too soft to be a Sith. 
Raven, of course, would not respond too kindly to such an accusation. This discussion ignited into a heated argument, which evolved into a lightsaber duel between the Master and the Apprentice, the result of which fortunately brought about no fatalities. The duel did, however, result in the Master reasserting his superiority over his apprentice and the removal of Malak's jaw. Malak was put in line and forced to wear a vocabulator for the rest of his life. Two years into the Jedi Civil War, Revan's ship detected a small fleet of enemy vessels in the Outer Rim. He gave orders to his forces to attack the fleet. Unaware, he was heading into a trap. A small Jedi strike team, led by Bastila Shan, boarded his flagship. Bastila had the unique ability of battle meditation, which strengthened the resolve of her allies, while it weakened her enemies through the Force. Her talents were known to Revan and Malak, and she was a significant threat that needed to be eliminated, for her battle meditation could empower an entire fleet of soldiers and Jedi, while weakening an equal number of opponents. As Bastila's Jedi strike team reached the bridge of Revan's vessel, Revan eliminated several Jedi that attacked him. He was then faced with Shan and three other Jedi. Revan eliminated them all except for their leader. Bastila attacked him, but Revan successfully deflected her lightsaber strikes. At this moment, Malak, on his own vessel in the area, sensed that his master was in danger. But instead of coming to his aid, Malak saw an opportunity to kill two targets at once. He ordered his crew to open fire upon the bridge of Revan's ship, hoping to kill the Jedi attackers and his master. As Malak's ship fired on, the bridge began to collapse. Malak's plan failed, for Bastila escaped the vessel before it was destroyed, but he remained pleased nonetheless at having eliminated at least one of his targets, as he now observes Revan's ship disintegrate under his assault. With Revan dead, Malak takes his master's place, and declares himself the new ruler of the Sith. He takes an apprentice, and continues waging war on the Republic, but not in the way Revan planned. Malak quickly becomes more brutal and merciless than his former master ever was. He cares little about conquering planets in order to make use of them. Instead, he destroys them entirely, and wins battles through the sheer size of his armadas, relying on brute force on his path to victory against the Republic. But even though his war efforts continue on the path of success, Malak fears Bastila's battle meditation and invests significant resources into finding her. Malak, it appears, never shared Revan's beliefs, for he did not kill his master in a direct confrontation, but instead, under unfair circumstances, when his attention was divided and when he faced more than a single enemy. Malak did not learn the lesson Revan sought to teach, but this does not mark the end of those teachings. They remain alive, hidden behind the wall in the Temple of the Ancients. And one day, one distant day into the future, they will be found and keep Darth Revan's legacy alive. Roughly one year after Malak's betrayal, Bastila's location is established aboard the Andas Pyre, a Republic cruiser in orbit around Taris. Malak's apprentice, Darth Bandon, leads an assault on the Andas Pyre in hopes of taking Bastila alive. Once the attack comes, the crew of the Andas Pyre is put on alert. The crew scrambles and attempts to put up a fight, but they don't stand a chance against the Dark Jedi. Within minutes, many of the crew are slaughtered by Darth Bandon's troops and Dark Jedi. Bastila realizes there's no choice left but to escape. 
for she cannot fight so many dark Jedi on her own. Before launching her escape pod, she uses her battle meditation to aid any of the survivors in their escape. They fight back with vigor, only to fall in the end. As the destruction of the Endar Spire approaches, Bastila launches her escape pod towards the planet below. Taris, hoping her attempts to aid the crew made at least some difference. Damn, another Dark Jedi! I'll try to hold them off! You get to the escape pods! Go! The crew of the Endar Spire seemingly put up a meaningless fight. But their collective attempts were not entirely in vain. For their resistance distracted Darth Bandon's forces sufficiently for few of the soldiers to reach the escape pods. Whoa, hold on. Don't try and get up yet. You were smashed up pretty bad when we crash-landed here on Terrace. Don't worry, we should be safe here in this apartment. I gave you something to help you sleep. Just get some rest and let the cult opacs do their job. Good to see you up instead of thrashing about in your sleep. You must have been having one hell of a nightmare. I was wondering if you were ever going to wake up. I'm Karth, one of the Republic soldiers from the Endar Spire. I was with you in the escape pod. Well, you've been slipping in and out of consciousness for a couple of days now, so I imagine you're pretty confused about things, but try not to worry. We're safe. At least for the moment. We're in an abandoned apartment on the planet of Terrace. You were banged up pretty bad when our escape pod crashed, but luckily I wasn't seriously hurt. I was able to drag you away from our crash site and all the confusion, and I stumbled into this abandoned apartment. By the time the Sith arrived on the scene, we were long gone. Terrace is under Sith control. Their fleet is orbiting the planet, they've declared martial law, and they've imposed a planet-wide quarantine. But I've been in worse spots. There is no way the Republic will be able to get anyone through the Sith blockade to help us. If we're going to find Bastila and get off this planet, we can't rely on anybody but ourselves. The two soldiers, along with Bastila, are the only survivors of the Endar Spire. But their crash landing has not gone unnoticed. They need to escape Terrace before the Sith find them. I believe Bastila was on one of the escape pods that crashed down here in Terrace. For the sake of the Republic war effort, we have to try and find her. The whole planet is under quarantine. No ships can land or take off. So if Bastila's going to escape Terrace, she's going to need our help. And we'll probably need hers. Time is running out. And not just for the three survivors of the Endar Spire. Malak's vessel roams the skies of Terrace, anticipating Bastila's capture. The three must escape the planet soon. Where did you get those clothes? A trash compactor in the lower city? Do I know you? No? Then why are you speaking to me? Can't you tell from my clothing that I'm of the nobility? Get away from me. I can't be seen talking with a common rabble. Obtaining information is a challenge, but one must know where to look. Anything I can do to help a potential customer out. What do you want to know? The two soldiers learn that Bastila's escape pod crashed in the Undercity, the lowest layer of Taris. Once they find her, they will need to find a way of escaping the planet. They had heard of a man named Davik, though his reputation is a bit alarming. Oh, Davik's a legitimate businessman, if you get my drift. Smuggling, slaving, extortion. Mm -hmm. I have to pay him a protection fee every month, but it's reasonable. And I get most of my inventory through Davik and his suppliers. So I'm just smart enough not to ask where it came from, you understand? Even dealing with him may be a better option than relying on the Sith dropping the quarantine. Uh, it's not smart to say bad things about the people in power, if you get my meaning. I just wish the Sith would ease up on the quarantine, though. They're killing my business. I can't say I like having them here in Upper City, but it could be worse, and we're still a lot better off than the Lower City, what with those swoop gangs and all. Unfortunately, if Bastila's spot landed in the Undercity, they need to descend into the lower layers of Terrace. 
Descending into the lower city, there's a lot of filth, violence, and crime. Despite these challenges, the two soldiers learn that Bastila is held hostage by one of the swoop gangs. They placed her as a prize in the annual swoop race. With little to no law in the lower city, the only way of saving Bastila is to win this race. But the two soldiers cannot do this on their own, so they ally themselves with one of the gangs, the Hidden Becks. And to ensure victory, they need to steal a piece of technology, a swoop accelerator, from the Black Vulcans who are holding Bastila hostage. Getting into the Vulcan base won't be easy. The front doors are locked tight. But I know someone who might be able to get you in the back way. Mission Veil. Mission? Gaddon, you can't be serious. She's just a kid. How is she supposed to help them with this? Mission's explored every step of every back alley in the lower city. Plus, she knows the undercity sewers better than anyone. If anyone can get inside the Vulcan base, it's her. Your best bet is to look for her in the undercity. Please, you have to help me. Nobody else is going to help me. Even the Bex won't help me. But I can't just leave him there. He, he's my friend. You'll help me, won't you? The soldier insists that Mission help them with their task to steal the accelerator. But she will have none of it. What? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Zalbar's in trouble. He needs our help or they're gonna sell him into slavery. Me, me and Zalbar, we were just wandering around here in the Undercity. You know, looking for stuff we could find, just kind of exploring. We do it all the time. Only this time, they were waiting for us. Gamorian slave hunters. We didn't even have a chance to run. Big Z threw himself at him and then roared for me to run. I, I took off. I figured Zalbar would be right behind me. But there were too many of them. He couldn't get away. As soon as we get Big Z back, I'll show you a way into that Volker base. Now come on! We have to find Zalba before they sell him to slavers, or worse! With some effort, they manage to find Mission's friend, battling the enemies and mutated beasts lurking in the sewers of this world. Once they free him, in return, the Wookiee Zalba swears a life debt to the soldier who saved him. Life debt is the most solemn vow a Wookiee can make. It means he'll stay by your side for the rest of your life. Wherever you go, whatever you do, Zalbar will be with you. I guess this means you're stuck with me, too. Wherever Big Z goes, I'm going. I almost lost him once. It's not gonna happen again. So, I guess I still owe you one secret path into the Volker base. As it turns out, Mission is quite a resourceful young woman. You won't be able to get that computer to lower the energy fields unless you know the proper codes. Lucky for you, I've got them. I picked them off the pocket of a black Volker who had a little too much to drink in the cantina one night. Here, let me get that energy field down for you. With the accelerator stolen and installed into the hidden back swoop bike, all that remains is to win the race and claim Bastila as the prize. It's Zerdra here. I hope you're reading me. Your swoop run is about to begin. Remember, just hold on tight and try not to smash into anything. The prototype accelerator should last about 60 seconds before it overheats and explodes. That should be enough time for you to finish your run. Good luck. The Becks are counting on you. Unsurprisingly, the swoop accelerator ensures victory, and does not explode before succeeding to do so. Your swoop bike was using a prototype accelerator. Clearly an unfair advantage. Because of this hidden Beck treachery, I'm withdrawing the Vulcan's share of the victory prize. I might have something to say about that, Brezhik. <laughs> You were restrained by a neural disruptor! How could you have possibly summoned the will to free yourself? You underestimate the strength of a Jedi's mind, Brezhik. A mistake you won't live to regret. Focus To me! Kill this woman! Kill the swoop rider! Kill them all! With the soldier's help, Bastila manages to overpower the Black Vulcans. Although initially excited to meet her, the soldier quickly learns that Bastila is not at all impressed with his efforts to save her. Brezhik and his Volkers would have left you for dead if I hadn't stepped into that fight. You're lucky I was here to get you out of this mess. Please take me to Karth right away. Between the three of us, I'm sure we can figure out some way to get off this planet before the Sith realize we're here. Much was achieved in a single day, 
and the soldier takes a brief rest as they return to their hideout. Is something wrong? You seem as if something's troubling you. Awakening from his rest, the soldier shares with Bastila the peculiar dream he had of her fighting a masked enemy. This is strange. Such visions are often a sign of force sensitivity. It may be that you have some connection to the force. It would not be unheard of. When we first met, your natural talent may have fed off my own force abilities. It is possible that in the excitement of the battle's aftermath, the force allowed you to witness one of my more intense memories. The force is complicated. Even I, with all my training, cannot fully understand it yet. This is a matter best left to the wise masters of the Jedi Council. Once we escape Terrace, we can seek the guidance of the Council if you wish. They will understand the significance of your vision, if there is any. Now that I'm back in charge of this mission, perhaps we can start doing things properly. Hopefully our escape from Terrace will go more smoothly than when you rescued me from Brezhik. I know you're new at this, Bastila, but a leader doesn't berate her troops just because things aren't going as planned. Don't let your ego get in the way of the real issues here. That hardly strikes me as an appropriate way of addressing your commander, Karth. I am a member of the Jedi Order, and this is my mission. Don't forget that. My battle meditation ability has helped the Republic many times in this war. And it will serve us well here, I'm sure. Your talents might win us a few battles, but that doesn't make you a good leader. A good leader would at least listen to the advice of those who have seen more combat than she ever will. Yes, you're right, of course. I apologize, Karth. This has been a difficult time for me. Of course, I'm happy to listen to your advice. What do you suggest we do? First off, we can't get hung up on who's in charge. We all need to work together if we want to get off this rock. The answer is out there. We just have to find it. Well said, Karth. And the sooner we start looking, the better. I've already been a prisoner of the Volkers, and I don't plan on being captured by the Sith. I think we'll need some help getting off Terrace. Maybe if we ask around, one of the locals can help us out. We should probably start by asking around in the cantinas. Just stick to the area you belong in, and stay out of Davik's business, and you'll be fine. Indeed, Davik was a name that came up a lot recently. And if he truly plays such a big role on Terrace, it's likely he has a way of leaving the planet. Extortion, slavery, smuggling... Davik's got a piece of all the action here on Terrace. Even the Swoop Gang's no better than to get in his way. Davik's part of the Intergalactic Crime Syndicate, but I guess everyone knows that. But I hear he's got a new ship for his smuggling operations, the Ebon Hawk. I don't know much about space travel, but I hear that ship's fast enough to break the Sith blockade. Of course, this is all just secondhand rumor. Where would he keep it, do you know? If Davik does have a ship, he's got it locked up in his estate. Nobody gets in there. Except the people working for Davik and the Exchange. A wise choice to keep Mission at hand. She does possess more knowledge than the regular local, after all. Nobody's ever really been interested in me before. It was just me on my own until the day I saw Zalbar in the Lower City. He was fleeing some kind of trouble back on Kashyyyk. That's all I know, really. Big Z doesn't like to talk about it. In case you didn't notice, he's the strong, silent type. Doesn't much matter to me, though. I accept him for what he is, not what he was. Mission shares that she grew up without parents and only had her brother for support. Without my brother, I don't know where I'd be. He gambled and drank, and he was always borrowing money for his latest get-rich-quick scheme. But he had a good heart. I really miss him since he left. I keep hoping he'll come back someday. He promised me he would. He fell in with a bad crowd. It's all Lena's fault. She's the one who took him from me. Just batted those long lashes at him and off he went. Just the thought of that space tramp makes my blood boil. Subjects closed, as far as I'm concerned. If I'm going to be any help to you, I can't be worrying about my brother running off with some intergalactic skank. Perhaps there will be more time to explore missions past later. For now, it would be best to begin exploring the city for solutions. Though, after several hours, there isn't much success. Bastila, I was wondering something. How did those Vulcars manage to capture a famous Jedi like you? Were you knocked out when your escape pod crashed? No, I was conscious. But my force powers were exhausted from using my battle meditation in the battle for the Ender Spire. Without my help, you might have never gotten off the ship alive. 
Fair enough, but I've seen you Jedi in action. There's, there's no way those thugs could have stood a chance against your lightsaber. My lightsaber was misplaced. I couldn't find it after the crash. I looked everywhere in that part. The Vulcus came and overwhelmed me even as I was searching for my weapon. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You lost your lightsaber? Well, <laughs> I mean, isn't that a violation of some kind of Jedi code or something? This is no laughing matter. During the crash, my lightsaber must have... It, it must have fallen from my belt and rolled under my seat. The Vulcus probably found it there when they searched the wreckage. Hey, 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 don't get mad. I'm sorry. It's just funny to think of a legendary Jedi losing her lightsaber. Take my advice. This is one detail you might want to keep out of the history texts. I hardly consider myself a legend, Karth. Though I will consider your advice when I relate these events to the Jedi Council. There is no need for them to know every detail of what transpired. During their task to get off-world, the three explore the Lower City Cantina, where they meet Candorous Ordo, who may have a solution for getting off Taris. I saw you in the swoop race. Very impressive. You seem like you know how to get results. That's just the kind of person I'm looking for. My name's Candorous Ordo. I work for Davik Kang in the Exchange. The hours aren't great, but they promised me a fortune to work for them and I had nothing better to do. Mandalorian mercs like me are in high demand. But lately, Davik hasn't been paying me what he promised. I don't like getting cheated, so I figure it's time for me to break the Sith quarantine and get off this backwater planet. I've got a plan to escape, Taras, but I can't do it alone. I need someone I know can get the job done to help me. That's where you come in. You don't need to ally yourself with this person. We should move on while we can. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking with your friend, Arata. I saw you win that swoop race and started thinking. Anyone crazy enough to race like that is probably crazy enough to break into the Sith military base. I need someone to steal the Sith launch codes from the base. Without those codes, any ship leaving the atmosphere will be disintegrated by the Sith fleet's automated defense guns. Here's the deal. You bring me those launch codes, and I can provide the vehicle to get us off the planet. Davik's flagship, the Ebon Hawk. Normally I'd do this myself, but everyone knows who I work for. If I broke into the Sith base, they'd send an army down on Davik's estate to get those codes back. That's why I need you. I don't sense any deception from him, which is surprising. This may be exactly what we need. Getting in won't be easy. The Sith base is protected by an encrypted security system. It would take a top-of-the-line astromech droid to slice through it. Lucky for you, I know just the place to get a droid like that. Davik was having one custom-built by Janice Nal. Just tell her Kander has sent you and she'll sell you the droid. Then you can use it to get the launch codes from the Sith base. We join forces and I can get you inside Davik's base and right to the Ebon Hawk. This is too risky. We should find another way. You got another plan, sister? Or are you just objecting because you didn't think of it? No, I don't have another plan. I would rather not place my life in your hands, however. I can say the same about you. That makes us even. Fortunately, we both want to get off this rock, right? While Davik's checking you out, we steal the Ebon Hawk and escape Taurus. I've got an airspeeder nearby to take us to Davik's estate. The sooner we're off Taurus, the better. Summon me, Lord Malak. The search for Bastila is taking too long. We cannot risk her escaping Taras. Destroy the entire planet. The... the entire planet, Lord Malak? But there are billions of people on Taras. We'd be slaughtering countless innocent civilians, not to mention our own men still on the surface. Your predecessor once made the mistake of questioning my orders, Admiral. Surely you are not so foolish as to make the same mistake. Of... of course not, my Lord Malik. I will do as you command, but it will take several hours to position our fleet. Then I suggest you begin immediately. You are dismissed, Admiral. Yes, 
Lord Merrick. So, Candorous, I see you've brought someone with you. Most intriguing, if I do say so myself. You usually travel alone. It's not like you to take on partners, Candorous. You're getting soft. Watch yourself, Gallo. You may be the newest calf hound in the pack, but you aren't top dog yet. Enough. I won't have my top two men killing each other. That's not good business. I'm sure Candorous has an explanation as to why he's not working solo anymore. This is a special case, Dalek. I ran into someone the Exchange might want to recruit. You may have heard something of their exploits already. Ah, yes. Now I recognize your companion. The rider who won the big swoop race. Very impressive, as was your display in the rather heated battle afterwards. I will give you a tour of my operations. I'm certain you'll be most impressed. Ah, there she is. The Ebonhawk. My pride and joy. The fastest ship in the Outer Rim. Unfortunately, the Sith military blockade has grounded my vessel. The Ebonhawk can outrun any vessel in the galaxy. But even she isn't fast enough to avoid the auto-targeting laser cannons of the orbiting Sith fleet. I am, of course, working on acquiring the Sith departure codes so that I may come and go as I please. However, progress has been slow. He will stay in his rooms as my guest for the next few days. I will not accept no for an answer. Feel free to visit the slave quarters at any time during your stay. I must warn you that if you are found anywhere outside the guest wing during your stay, or if you bother my other guests, my security forces will deal with you most harshly. I will return after the investigation into your background is complete. Until then, make yourself comfortable. Come, Callum. Let us leave our guests in peace. Okay, we're inside. Now all we have to do is figure out a way to get past the Ebon Hawk security system, and we can get the rest of your group off this planet. No sense waiting around here, though. The sooner we get off Taurus, the better. Time is running out as Malak's fleet begins its bombardment, and the death of Taurus begins. Damn those Sith, they're bombing the whole planet. I knew they'd turn on us sooner or... Oh, look what we got here. Thieves in a hangar. So, you figured you'd just steal my ship for your getaway and leave me high and dry while the Sith turn the planet into dust? Sorry, but that ain't gonna happen. I'll take care of them, Davik. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Make it quick, Carlo. The Sith mean business. If we don't get to our ships and find somewhere safe, the bombs there drop and will kill us all. I'm going down. I'm taking all of you with me. This thermal detonator will blow us all to bits. Damn those shit! I'll bring this whole hangar down around our ears. Let's get this ship fired up. We'll pick up the rest of your friends and then we'll have to get off this planet. Taris is defenseless against our assault, Lord Malak. They are offering no resistance. The city is in ruins. Resume the bombardment, Commander. Wipe this pathetic planet from the face of the galaxy. Plot a course for Dantooine. There's a Jedi Enclave there where we can find refuge. Incoming fighters! 
Quickly, to the gun turrets. You have to hold the Sith fighters off until we get those hyperspace coordinates punched in. Tween. It seems like a lifetime since I last set foot on her surface. Though in truth, it's only been a few months. We should be safe from Malak here. For now, at least. Safe? You saw what his fleet did to Terrace. There wasn't a building over two stories high left standing. They, they turned the planet into one big pile of rubble. Even the Sith would think twice before attacking Dantooine. There are many Jedi here, including several of the most powerful masters of the Order. There is great strength within this place. We can get supplies here and recuperate. The Academy is a place of mental and spiritual healing. Something we could all use after what we've been through. Maybe you're right. It isn't easy to witness the annihilation of an entire planet. I know Mission must be taking it pretty hard. She will find a way to come to terms with her grief. She's stronger than she appears. We just need to give her time. Now I must go speak with the Council. I need their advice on recent developments. After I've met with them, I will meet you outside the ship. The destruction of a planet is a devastating thing to witness. But it is even more difficult to comprehend that one's entire past and every place and individual they learned to know no longer exists. Huh? Oh, sorry. I was thinking about Terrace. I still can't believe it's gone. I mean, I grew up there and now it's... it's... it's just gone. The Jedi got rid of Revan, so... I figure Malik's days are numbered too. But that doesn't make the pain go away, you know? Look... I'm not saying I can't go on or anything like that, it's just, it's a shock, you know? I mean, I knew the Sith were evil and all, but the reality of it kind of slaps you in the face. But I suppose that's why we need to stop Malik, right? The more time I spend dwelling on Terrace, the more chance some other planet will get wiped out. I guess that's what it comes down to. So don't worry about me. I'll be okay. And if you need my help against Malik or the Sith, I'll be there for you. Much resilience in that one. Dantooine is a world of grasslands, rivers and lakes. It hosts a small population of mostly human farmers. Dantooine has a rich wildlife, no industrial settlements or advancements, and is the home of the Jedi Academy and its council. The Jedi Council begin their deliberation, noting that they would ordinarily be against accepting an adult for training. But this is a special case as this Republic soldier has a very strong connection to the Force. We have been discussing your rather special case. I am Jar, a member of the Jedi Council. With me are Master Vrook, Master Vandar, and of course the Chronicler of our Academy, 
Master Dorak. Padawan Bastila, I am sure you are already familiar with. We are the council in charge of the training facility here on Dantooine. Bastila tells us you are strong in the Force. We are considering you for Jedi training. While most appear to be in favor of this, Master Rook cautions of the risks of the dark side. We need recruits to stand against Malak. With Revan dead... Are you certain Revan is truly dead? What if we undertake to train this one and the Dark Lord should return? We should discuss this matter more fully in private. Bastila, you and your companion must go. This is a matter for the Council alone. As you wish, Master Vandar. We shall return to the Ebon Hawk and leave you to your deliberations. The dark side is strong in this place. I can feel its power. Is this wise? The ancient Jedi sealed this archway. If we pass beyond this door, we can never go back. The Order will surely banish us. Are the secrets of the Star Forge so valuable? Can its power truly be worth the risk? This morning's getting stranger by the minute. First Bastila comes out looking like she saw a ghost, and now you. Well, Bastila did mention that you should go to the council chambers before she left. It's no doubt urgent, so you shouldn't keep them waiting. Bastila has told us of a most unusual development. She claims you and she have shared a dream. A vision of Malak and Revan in the ancient ruins here on Dantooine. These ruins have long been known to us, but we believe them to be merely burial mounds. Perhaps they're more than we first suspected, if Revan and Malak found something there. The soldier remains puzzled as to why the two shared the vision about these ruins. Still, he knows very little about the Force. He is no Jedi, and this occurrence may not be as strange or rare as he imagines. You and Bastila share a powerful connection to the Force, and each other. The Council has decreed that you and Bastila must investigate the ancient ruins you dreamed of. Once the Council deems you ready, you must be trained in the ways of the Jedi, so that you can resist the darkness within yourself, within all of us. Otherwise you are doomed to fail. The ruins are a place of corruption. The dark side is strong there. We cannot risk sending you there unprepared. We must begin your training at once. The path you have chosen to walk is difficult. Intensive training will prepare you physically for the demands of the Order. Meditation will teach you to channel the power of the Force. To truly understand the way of the Jedi, you must open your mind to knowledge. Seek wisdom in the teachings of the great masters of our Order. The Jedi is never alone. Others in the Order will always stand by you. You and Bastila share a special bond. Do not be afraid to turn to her when you need help in your training. The way of the Jedi is difficult. It requires great discipline. Yet even though you are a mere apprentice, your potential is unlimited and your progress amazing. In all my years, I have never seen one who has mastered the initial training so quickly. You've done in weeks what many cannot do in years. I am honored to welcome you fully into the Jedi Order. Soon your apprenticeship will end, and you will be granted the title of Padawan, the lowest rank of those within the Jedi Order. Yet first you must prove yourself worthy. You have learned your studies well, apprentice. As the second test, each Jedi must construct his lightsaber with his own hands. And now it is your time. Listen to me. There is much weight, much craving attached to such a tiny thing of light. 
a lightsaber, any weapon, only achieves worth in how it is wielded, in the effort, in the struggle of one who holds it. Such a weapon does not make a Jedi or a Sith, and at times it makes them much, much less than they are. You have done extremely well in constructing your lightsaber, Apprentice. Are you ready to face the final challenge, Apprentice? You must see the corruption of the dark side for yourself. Even here on Dantooine, there are places where the dark side holds sway. One such place is a grove, some distance from the Enclave, where a source of the dark side exists that corrupts the beasts in the area. The source of this corruption is a young woman, haunted by anger and pain and regret. Your lessons cannot continue until the spreading corruption of the dark side has been stopped. This is your task, Apprentice. May the Force be with you. I will be your doom! You... You are strong. Stronger than me, even in my darkness. I am Juhani, and this is my grove. This is the place of my dark power. This is the place you have invaded. When I embrace the dark side, this is where I sought my solace. It is mine. The soldier senses much anger in Juhani. He investigates further to find out what caused her to fall. When I slew my master, Quatra, I knew I could never go back. And now I revel in my dark power. Power enough to crush the life from someone such as you. Or so I had thought. Juhani appears as someone with a troubled past, and she is easily blinded by her anger. With some discipline and self-care, she could become a great Jedi and an even greater individual. The soldier advises her to give up the path she is headed down. After all, it did not even provide her with sufficient power to defeat a novice. I seem to still have much to learn, both about being a Jedi and about myself. I thank you, Master Jedi. I will return to the Council then. I shall submit myself to their judgment and hope they will forgive me. Again, I thank you. I am sure I will hear great things about you in the future. You have done well, my pupil. The ancient grove has been purified, and Juhani's journey down the dark path has been halted. Juhani is both dedicated and true to the ideals of the Order, yet she was still vulnerable to the dark side, as are we all. She struck her master in anger during her training and injured her greatly, but it was Quatra's choice to test Juhani this way, and it seems to have made its point. Juhani has been redeemed, and you have passed your final test. Congratulations, Apprentice. Or should I say, congratulations, Padawan. Your training is now complete, Padawan. And perhaps now, it is time we dealt with the matter of the dream you and Bastila shared. When we heard of the ruins in your dreams, we sent a Jedi to investigate, but he has not returned. Perhaps sending him in the first place was a mistake. The Force is guiding you through your visions. It may be that exploring the ruins is a task tied to your destiny. Be sure to bring Bastila with you. There is a powerful link between you, and you will need to draw strength from each other during the trials ahead. The Council provided guidance, but the Padawan now wonders why so many questions remain unanswered. For a start, it is unclear why the vision came to the two of them, or how their bond was formed. I truly don't have an answer for you. The Force works as it will, and perhaps we should be grateful for what we've been given. So he's just supposed to accept the fact that he is linked to Bastila? Believe me. I certainly don't find the prospect of being joined to you enjoyable in any fashion. That's a bit harsh. Please, forgive me. I did not mean to imply that you were repulsive in any sense of the word. That we shared something so personal is just not something I'm used to. I've been thinking about what the Jedi Council said about the two of us. There is a bond between us. I do not dispute that. I can feel it, as I'm sure you can. The nature of that bond and its effect on our mission remain in question. The nature of the bond? Please... I'm a Jedi. Such feelings, such attractions are, well, they're beneath me, quite frankly. I admit, I find you intriguing. I, I mean, I find your command of the Force intriguing, but my interest in you is purely academic. Surely you can understand why. This bond we share will shape both our destinies. 
It is not to be taken lightly. So many things have happened to you since Taurus. It's probably a lot for you to absorb. We can speak again later, after you've had time to think about all this. They should return to business anyhow. The ancient ruins appear as a large burial mound, with memorial stones in the front. The traces in the grass indicate someone was here recently. The ruins are silent. The rooms are vast, and the construction is unlike anything they had seen before. Whatever Revan and Malak discovered here is behind them. There's something else in the way. Something ancient. This language is unknown to any of the three. Another unknown language. I think the droid is trying to communicate with us by cycling through a variety of languages. Each time it spoke, it was using a very different alien dialect. The droid can probably understand us. The only problem is it may not have been programmed with the phenomes of a language we can understand. This language is familiar, an archaic variant of the Salkath dialect spoken on the planet Manan. Why would a droid on Dantooine be programmed to speak ancient Selkath? Translation. Communication was vital to ensure that the slaves constructed this temple according to the wishes of the builders. But you are not of the slave species. Neither are you of the builders. You are like the one who came before. It must be referring to Revan. The Dark Lord and Malak likely encountered this droid when they explored these ruins. I am the Overseer. The Builders programmed me to enforce discipline among the slaves while this monument to the power of the Starforge was constructed. At project completion, all slaves were executed. I was reprogrammed to serve should a Builder return in search of knowledge of the Starforge. There are no historical records of slaves or the Starforge. This droid must have been here for a long time. My chronological circuits have marked over ten full revolutions of this system's outmost planet around the sun since the Builders left. Ten revolutions would take more than 20,000 years. If this is true, then this droid is nearly 5,000 years older than the Republic itself. Uh, there must be some mistake. There is no mistake. The Builders constructed my chronological circuitry using the technology of the Starforge itself. My calculations are infallible. These Builders must have been an extinct people. Though it is strange, there's no record of their existence. Even the archives of the Jedi Academy make no mention of them. In the years before the Republic, the Huts were a dominant force in the galaxy, but they never constructed an empire. In fact, I know of no species that would fit with this information. This droid speaks Selkath. Perhaps the Selkath have some connection to the Builders. The Selkath were nothing but slaves and servants of the true masters. Like all the other species, they bowed down before the might of the Builders and the Starforge. Perhaps these Builders are connected to the Sith. I know nothing of these Sith, but they are not the Builders. The Builders are the Builders. Something must have happened to these Builders. The Empire of the Builders is infinite and everlasting. None can stand against their might and the power of the Starforge. If they were still alive, they'd likely have visited this monument at one point, and that would hardly have gone unnoticed by Dantooine's inhabitants. I have been here ever since the completion of this monument. In all this time, no builder has returned to seek information on the Starforge. The Starforge is the glory of the Builders, the apex of their infinite empire. It is a machine of invincible might, a tool of unstoppable conquest. But what is the Starforge? What does it physically do? The... The Starforge is the glory of the Builders, the apex of their infinite empire. It is a machine of invincible might, a tool of unstoppable conquest. The droid is obviously not programmed with the knowledge we seek. The Starforge sounds like some type of weapon, perhaps. Though in fact, it could be anything. Now that the slaves are gone, my purpose is to aid those who seek knowledge of the Starforge, if they are worthy. The ones who came before you, the ones like you. Not builders, but not slaves, sought knowledge of the Starforge and its origins. They proved themselves worthy. They discovered the secrets of the Starforge, locked beyond the sealed door behind me. But there was another who failed to unlock the secrets and paid the ultimate price. The droid must be talking about poor Nemo. The council sent him here to investigate. 
and it cost him his life. Enter the proving clouds to the east and west. Within them, those who understand the will of the builders can unlock their secrets and open the doors. But those who fail will be destroyed by the power of the temple itself. More than this, I'm not programmed to say. Revan and Malik unlocked the sealed door and uncovered the secrets of the Starforge. We have to find out what they uncovered. We have to find a way to unseal these doors to learn more about the Starforge. The Republic is depending on us. The main door forward is sealed. Upon opening the door to the west and the door to the east, each contains a droid of similar construction as the one they had just encountered. But while they appear ancient and fragile, these droids prove immensely difficult to overpower. It is difficult to believe that technology this old can endure so much damage, and cause even more. The droids in each room guard a terminal, each offering a single question. The questions are somewhat obsolete, and easily answered as they require the user to identify planet types best suited for life and death. These questions do shed some light on the view and understanding of a species that would name itself the Builders. Once these questions are answered correctly, the main doors are unsealed. This, this must be what Revan and Malik found when they entered this temple. This must be where their journey down the dark side began. This is a, a map, some sort of intergalactic navigational chart. Revan and Malik must have used this to lead them to the Starforge. We could use this map to follow their path and find the Starforge ourselves, but we must be wary. They may have laid traps or concealed what they found. Whatever the Starforge is that the droid mentioned, this probably isn't it. It doesn't appear capable of producing anything other than a map. I don't know. But Revan and Malak were very interested in finding it. It must be a tool of some type. Or maybe a weapon. Perhaps the Council can tell us more. But I think this map might be the key to finding the Starforge. Whatever it is. See this world here? This looks like Korriban, a Sith world. And if that's Korriban, then this is Kashek and Tatooine. And here's Manan. But there are pieces missing. Incomplete hyperspace coordinates. There's much corrupted data. And there doesn't seem to be anything indicating where the Star Forge itself might be. But these worlds could contain more clues that could be used to triangulate the location of the Star Forge. I was thinking that too. This map can't take us to the Star Forge. But I know that Revan and Malik visited Korriban at least once. Perhaps they discovered something more there. They may have found something on each of the other worlds that completed this map. Maybe if we find all the pieces, they'll lead us to the Star Forge some way to destroy it. That sounds like quite a supposition. What if you're wrong? What if I'm right? We can't ignore this. Finding the Starforge might very well be the key to defeating the Sith. We must inform the Council of what we've discovered. They must decide our next course of action, though I suspect our task has only just begun. This news of a Starforge is disturbing. Action is required, but we must not do so in haste. The Council agrees with the assessment of the Dantooine star map. The Padawan and his crew are tasked to seek these maps out, for sending out large numbers of Jedi at once would raise suspicion. Secrecy and discretion are paramount to your success. You will not be able to hide the fact that you are a Jedi, nor should you. But the true nature of your mission must not reach Malak's ears. You may return here at any time. Dantooine will be a sanctuary for you. A safe haven. The lure of the dark side is difficult to resist. I fear this quest to find the Star Forge could lead you down an all too familiar path. The fate of the galaxy is in your hands, young Padawan. We pray you are up to the challenge. Five planets and hopefully five star maps need to be localized. With the Dantooine star map found, this leaves Tatooine. Kashik, Manan, and Korriban. But before the parting, the Padawan checks in with the crew, in particular its latest addition, a Jedi who requested to join Ebon Hawk's crew on this mission. I feel I must apologize for the way I acted towards you before in the Grove. It was wrong of me. I am sorry for attacking you. I am sorry for thinking you would only try to kill me. I hope that by helping you in your task, I may redeem myself in your eyes and in my own. Juhani has a very long path ahead of her, 
perhaps longer than any Padawan. She is without a doubt prone to the dark side's influence, for she has no control over her emotions. But she is moving in the right direction. Thank you. It is most reassuring to know that you can forgive me, even though I try to take your life. I can only hope that, in our time journeying together, I will succeed. Unlike some of the greatest Sith in history, Juhani's fall was not caused by hunger for power. It is mainly brought on by anger and rage she cannot control. Dealing with this, learning to control her emotions, will build a strong foundation for her growth. But it will not happen quickly. More time is needed to reflect and focus on these faults. More time would do me good. Time to distance myself from that anger. I thank you for your concern and your acceptance. I will strive to prove that I am worthy of your company and trust. On with the mission. The first destination in line is Tatooine. It has a relatively limited area that supports civilization being a massive desert, and the star map there will perhaps be easier to find than on other planets. Before departing, Bastila wants to discuss something with the Padawan. Her expression is easily giving this away. It most certainly is not. I am a Jedi, remember? I have far too much mental discipline to reveal what goes on inside my mind with such obvious physical clues. My thoughts remain hidden, including whatever my feelings are for you. I, I mean, whatever I feel... I mean, whatever I think about you. Indeed. It's quite clear what she thinks of him. I... That is you... Why must you be so impossibly infuriating? You know very well what I am really talking about. I am referring to the bond between us, the one the Jedi Council spoke of. Our connection allows us glimpses into each other's mind. We can feel some of what the other feels, and what I feel within you troubles me. The fact that you are so strong in the Force and have had such relatively little training could have terrible consequences. For you, and for everyone around you. Certainly, it is to be expected from arrogant individuals, or those who use their power lightly. But he has not displayed an affinity to either. In fact, he feels quite in control. Still, Bastila is an experienced Jedi, and she may know a few things he does not. When you need guidance, or advice, or support, I will do my best to help you stay on the path of the light. For now, we should return to our mission. Tatooine is quite a distance away, and in that time the Padawan gets a glimpse into the lives of the crew a bit closer. Apart from Candorus's war stories of epic proportions... An 80-kilometer plunge through the atmosphere, the outside of my armor glowing like the sun with the heat of re-entry, and with barely 30 meters to spare, I twisted and skimmed the... Garth reveals the reason he doesn't trust anyone. When I think of all the men who betrayed us, the one that stands out above all of them is the one that I respected the most, Saul. Admiral Saul Carath betrayed the Republic, and under Malak's command bombarded the planet Telos. Karth's wife died in the bombardment, and his son's body was never found. Admiral Saul Carath is the commander of the entire Sith fleet. He's half the reason Malak has done so well in the war. During this trip, Bastila also fills the Padawan in on the common knowledge about Revan and Malak, and how Malak betrayed and killed his master. We were there to capture Revan alive. The Jedi do not believe in killing their prisoners. No one deserves execution, no matter what their crimes. Lastly, Juhani shares more about her past, that she was enslaved as a child, and that it was the Jedi who set her free from her captors. When I saw a Jedi for the first time, they lived up to everything my imagination had created them to be. From that moment on, I knew that I would have to try to become a Jedi. The foolish delusions of a child. Perhaps I may yet live to see that dream of mine come true. Come, there is much we should do. Let us not waste time talking. Action is what is needed. Juhani has a natural talent for force camouflage, which manipulates the light and sound around her, making her extremely difficult to detect. However, apart from the great energy expenditure, this ability requires a great degree of concentration and focus. With time, it is likely Juhani will be able to use this skill to the extreme and become a very skilled practitioner, should she continue building her focus and inner strength.
Lord Malak, the Star Forge is operating at 200% capacity, far beyond our expectations. I am more interested in the young Jedi Bastila and her battle meditation. Have you learned how she escaped the destruction of Taris? She was aided by Karth Onasi, a decorated war hero of the Republic and a legendary soldier. During the Mandalore Wars, he was honored many times for his bravery. You know this man? Yes, Lord Malak. He served under me when I still followed the Republic. You could say I was his mentor. Interesting. How did you acquire this information, Admiral? An eyewitness, Lord Malak. Kalo Nord, a bounty hunter, was there when Bastila and Karth escaped the planet. Apparently, they left him for dead. A Jedi and a war hero. It's a wonder you survived the encounter. I am hard to kill, Lord Malak. Kalo has agreed to help us capture the young Bastila for a very hefty fee, of course. But I assure you, he is well worth the price. His reputation as a bounty hunter is well earned. Her companions are nothing to me, Kalo. But I desire the young Jedi taken alive, if at all possible. Lord Malak, forgive me, there is something else. May we have a private audience away from the ears of the common soldiers? I trust you are not wasting my time, Admiral Carath. I promise you will be very interested in what Kalo has to tell you about Bastila's other companions, Lord Malak. The outpost where the Ebon Hawk lands is Anchorhead, one of the oldest settlements on Tatooine. Originally a mining outpost, it was abandoned and resettled many times. Currently, the mining operations here are conducted by the Zerka Corporation. The Force has given us a, a vision, like the one we shared on Dantooine. Did you see it? Of course. You must have. The Force is strong with us both. Tatooine is known for little but blowing sand. I find it surprising that there would be a star map somewhere in its desolate wastes. A star map would likely have to be within some kind of shelter to protect it against dust and sandstorms. I suspect there are many such caves and caverns hidden in the sands of the Dune Sea. The creatures of this world probably use them as their lairs. No doubt things will become more clear once we discover the star map's location. No doubt. Before heading out, however, a slight change in appearance is in order. Before the quest for the star map begins, an unexpected matter arises as one of the locals recognizes Bastila and informs her of her mother's condition. My mother's condition? I've not seen my mother since I joined the Order. Part of me would rather not see her at all. But if she is really sick, well, we shall see. It's strange to hear news after all this time. It's quite distracting. It's not that I look forward to seeing her. I just can't help but wonder what she wants. But perhaps we have better things to do. Their quest becomes even more challenging as the Padawan and his companions are ambushed by the Sith. Lord Malak was most displeased when he learned you had escaped Taris alive. He has promised a great reward to whoever destroys you. There will surely be more of these Sith assassins in the future. It is strange that they would attack so openly. Tatooine has not been inhabited long, and has little law. This town of Anchorhead may be its only settlement. I always heard Tatooine was nothing but a rock covered by a bunch of worthless sand. I can't even figure out why Zerka Corp set up their mining operations here. My mother was supposed to be here somewhere. I want to find out what my mother wanted. I doubt she wants to be kept waiting. In order to optimally use the time at their disposal, the Padawan continues searching for clues on the star map's location, while Bastila looks for her mother. Talking to the locals, he quickly learns of the sand people who live in the Dune Sea. Well, the locals he can understand. <laughs> Lord Malak, 
If anyone on this planet knows where the star map is, it's surely the sand people. They are indigenous to Tatooine and spend their lives in the desert, but they are a primitive and violent people. To have any hope of communicating with them, one would need a translator. Greeting! Hello to you, prospective purchaser. I am referred to as HK-47, a fully functional Sizetech Corporation droid skilled in both combat and protocol functions. Query. Would you be so kind as to purchase this model from Yukalaka? It would serve my purposes to be removed from his ownership. HK-47 proves to be a valuable investment, for he can indeed understand and translate the language of the Sand People. Although, while talking to HK-47 about his capabilities, the responses seem to indicate this HK unit may possess some illegal functions. I am a law-abiding droid. Yes, indeed. Law-abiding. That's me. This appears even clearer once he's purchased, and his previous owner expresses his gratitude to have sold such a worn-out model. Worn out? Listen, you talentless organic meatbag. One word from my master and I will pull you apart limb from useless limb. I have always been hostile. Now that I need no longer rely on you and your primitive maintenance skills, I do not need to hide it. Query. Can I kill him now, Master? I would like ever so much to crush his neck. Just a little. It is a long-time fantasy of mine. Perhaps later. For now, there's business to attend to. You hear that, meatbag? I will be back. Before even venturing into the desert, HK's translation abilities are put to the test with the Java language, which is quite unclear. Statement. It is doubtful he can be clearer. Their language is difficult even for droids. He is using a trade language to try and help. Translation. 98% probability that members of the miniature organics tribe are being held by sand people master. Doubtless he wishes assistance. And the 2%? Translation. 2% probability that the miniature organic is simply looking for trouble and needs to be blasted. That may be wishful thinking on my part, Master. Exploring the desert in search of the Sand People proves difficult as they attack on sight. But with a disguise, they manage to breach their sanctuary and enter the Sand People enclave, although their disguises prove less effective at close range. One moment. I believe I understood that, Master. It may not have been his intention, but he did actually communicate something. <laughs> Result. I believe I have succeeded in confusing him, Master. We have shown an interest not common among outsiders. He is expressing disbelief, but his duty requires that he report to his chieftain. Extrapolation. It would seem that we are at least worthy of curiosity for the moment. I would much rather this get bloody, Master, but it is your call. Talking with the leader of the Sand People through HK-47, the Padawan makes a deal and offers technology that would allow the Sand People to produce more water, allowing them to move away from Anchorhead, a benefit to both the Sand People and the locals they had been attacking. In exchange, the leader of the Sand People shares information about the star map. Translation. He says that what you seek is far from here in the Eastern Dune Sea. He will give you a map so you can find your way. Translation. His people found it but didn't scavenge it because a crate dragon took up residence in the excavation. The Padawan also inquires about any captives. Protocol. We should not keep him long. It is an insult to take too much of his time. Unless the plan is to blast him when you are done, of course. <laughs> Translation. He says that the captive Jawas are slaves and that they have lived past their usefulness. You may take them if you wish. The chieftain makes a brief note about a prisoner who fits the description of Mission's brother. Translation. He says that by his very presence, this griff defiles their home and land. He is without any semblance of usefulness to them. Yep, that would be Griff. Extrapolation. I would assume we are free to take him. It is doubtful they will even waste the effort to kill him. Perhaps we could do it, Master. Uh, you there. I'm, uh, I'm a high-ranking executive at the Zerka Corporation. Uh, there's a big reward if you take me back to Anchorhead. Griff, don't you recognize me? It's Mission. Mission? Is it really you? 
I heard Taurus was destroyed. I, I thought you were dead. Oh, joy of joys, my little sister is alive. I have to ask you something, Griff. It's important. I ran into Lena. She, she said it was your idea to leave me on Terrace. He told me you didn't want to leave Terrace. I said we shouldn't even go then, but he said we'd come back and get you after we struck it rich on Tatooine. Just another one of his lies. No, you're the one who's lying. Griff wouldn't... He wouldn't try to leave me behind. It isn't true, is it? Uh, well, there's the truth and then there's the truth, you know. I, I always meant to go back to Taurus's just as soon as I had the credits to pay off my debts. But credits have been hard to come by. You mean it's true? It was your idea to leave me there? I'm your sister. How could you abandon me like that? Come on, sis. You didn't need me to look after you anymore. Y you may have been young, but you knew how to take care of yourself. Besides, you're here now. I mean, everything worked out fine. That's it? That's all you have to say to me after all these years after deserting me on Terrace? Well, that and... Uh... What? Is there something else? Uh, well, I, I wanted to thank you. And, um... You look like you're doing well. Uh, financially, I mean. Say, um, could you spare me a few credits to get back on my feet? You're hitting me up for credits. I don't believe this. Lena was right about you, Griff. We should have just left you to the sand people. Don't talk to me anymore. Goodbye, Mission. Uh, I'm glad you're not dead. Hmm. I know people can change no matter how bad they were, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. None of us is perfect, but I've come to realize that Griff is a little less perfect than most. My brother is what he is, but I've learned to deal with that. I'll never forget that he looked after me when I was just a kid, but I don't feel like I owe him anything anymore. I've made my peace with Griff and what he means to me. If he ever shows up again, I'll deal with him. But I'm not going to dwell on my brother anymore. It's time to move forward. With that, and the information they've obtained, they're ready to seek out the star map. Back at Anchorhead, Bastila too makes progress in her quest. Yes? I'm sorry, do I know you? I'm here, Mother. But don't you recognize me? What do you expect when I haven't so much as had a picture of you since you left? Do you know how long I've been trying to find you? You knew, as well as I, communication would be impossible once I joined the Order. Now what is this about? Where is Father? Then you haven't heard. I should have known. Has something happened to him? Are you going to tell me or not? Your father is dead, Bastila. That is part of the reason why I was looking for you. Dead? What happened? What did you do to him? I hadn't realized Jedi was so spiteful. You want me to tell you I brought your father here for an expedition, do you? You want to blame me for his death? You never accepted that your father loved going on his treasure hunts, leaving you alone with me. I was always to blame for everything. What else is new? So yes, fine. I brought your father here to look for crate dragon pearls. He took an expedition into the Tatooine desert, and he died. How can you be sure of that? Father is an experienced... Do you think I would look for you if I wasn't sure? They were attacked by a crate dragon, and one of the guides fled the battle. He saw your father killed. I see. So what do you want from me? Credits? Oh, don't be insulting. I want you to use those senses of yours. I want you to find him. I want you to bring back his holocron. Why? So you can sell it. Is it too much to ask that I have something to remember your father by? Of course it is, isn't it? You couldn't be bothered. Are you actually sick, Mother? What difference does it make to you? None, I'm sure. Just find your father's holocron, and you won't have to worry about me again either way. That's the kind of response I would expect. Very well. We'll look for the holocron if we have time. I can't promise any more than that. I believe your father was headed north towards the Sand People Enclave. I would check along that route, dear. Do please hurry. I seem to find it difficult to remain objective when it comes to her. I find that disturbing. We have more important things to do. Still, my father is dead. Just because we find the holocron doesn't mean I have to give it to her. Father recorded all his personal thoughts in that holocron, even when I knew him. Having it would be like having him with you. I don't see why she deserves it, however. She drove him to his death. I loved him, and I didn't even have a chance to say goodbye. Part of me would keep it just so she didn't get it. I don't like that part of me. She's a selfish woman who pushed my father into doing what she wished. Quite a bit of bitterness there. Yes, I thought I'd let go of that anger. All my training and it comes back so quickly. I would have thought my Jedi training would have put me past this kind of pettiness. I wish it... I really don't want to think about this. There will be time to think about it later. 
For now, they must focus on the star map. The holocron of Bastila's father and the star map will likely be in the lair of the Crate Dragon. I'm tired of waiting, Comad. How big can this dragon of yours be? I'm going in. Great dragons are a species native to Tatooine, growing continuously throughout their lives to an average length of 40 to 50 meters and a weight of 2 metric tons. These great beasts could live hundreds of years and did not particularly weaken as they grew older. Killing such a beast is no small matter. For the sand people, it is an honor to hunt them, and their greatness is evident. But as the growing population of Tatooine is herding the banthas it would use for food, the dragon has little to eat and is moving closer to Anchorhead, closer to civilization. Therefore, as unorthodox as it is, the dragon must be stopped. With a helping hand from the hunt in the area, explosives and the appropriate bait, this problem too would find its grim solution. With the great dragon out of the way, its lair is now accessible, and indeed, deep within its heart lies the star map. Statement. I believe there can be little doubt that we have found the star map you were seeking. I am surprised it is still working after all this time. I do not think it is mere chance that we have found the star map here, in the lair of a crate dragon. The star map is an artifact of the dark side. The crate dragon may have been drawn here by its dark power, only to be enslaved by it. The Tatooine star map provides more information, but further star maps are needed to establish the location of the Starforge. The final matter left on Tatooine is the holocron that once belonged to Bastila's father, and indeed, it awaits among the many remains found in the dragon's lair. The question now is if Bastila will truly keep it for herself. Do you think I should? I would like to keep something to remember father as much as she would. I'll think about it. I should try and remember my training. I should be able to let go of this, but I can't. Such a choice would conflict with the Jedi way, as Jedi are meant to have no attachments. However, the Jedi ways don't always feel like the right path. I find myself agreeing with you, but I don't like how that feels. Come, we should leave this place. There's nothing else for us here. I have to give you credit. You've led me on quite a chase, but nobody gets away from Callow Nord in the end. You got lucky on Terrace. The Sith attack saved you from a quick and gruesome death. But I promise you, the Sith won't be getting in my way this time. I'm not in this for the credits. You're the only ones who've ever gotten away from me. I've got a rep to protect. Let's go, boys. Showtime. you how much I enjoy killing for you, Master. At least someone enjoyed the surprise. Observation. Even a droid has to be allowed a little fun once in a while, Master. Please, let's just keep going. Back already? Have you even looked for the holocron yet? I have the holocron, Mother. I'm just not sure I want to give it to you. And why not? Would you deny me even that? I've never denied you anything, Mother. 
You may think I don't remember what it was like before I left for the Order, but I do. You were the one who pushed Father to go on one treasure hunt after the other. You loved living in wealth. You think I don't remember the fights. You were eager to send me to the Jedi, even though I didn't want to go. You took Father away from me, and now this holocron is all I have of him. Fool girl. You have a strange way of remembering things. That wasn't- No. I don't wish to argue with you any more, Mother. It's time we parted ways now, for both our benefit. Is it too difficult to believe that I am a dying woman who simply wishes to see her husband one last time? I find it difficult to believe anything you say, Mother. It doesn't take a Jedi to sense that Bastila is being spiteful. The Padawan advises that she not be so impulsive in making her choice. <sighs> You're right. It shames me, but I just I find it difficult to let go of the past. I, I'm sorry, Mother. I was hard on you, dear. I wasn't a very good mother to you. I know that. Your father loved you so. He wanted you to be just like him. He wanted to take you on his hunts, but I said they were too dangerous. I always tried to keep him from the dangerous ones, but he would have none of it. It was a reckless life we led. Always moving. I didn't want that for you. So that's why you gave me to the Order? What do your father and I have to show for all those years of hunting? Nothing. That was no life for anyone. Especially not someone as gifted as you, your father. He spent all his last years trying to pay for my treatments. That's why he went for the pearls. I begged him not to, but... Your treatments? I'm dying, Bastila. I did not lie about that. It's been a long time in the coming, and there's really nothing that can be done anymore. I told your father to let me go. But you know how he was. Stubborn, like you. I'm so sorry, Mother. I don't know what to say. Keep the holocron, Bastila. It would do me good to know you have it. This talking to you. This is what I really needed before I... I know. Thank you. I'm glad we talked too. Well, now. You said you had important business. And you were never one to mince words. You there. You take care of my daughter, you hear me? I'll feel a lot better knowing there's someone to watch her. Where are you going to go? It doesn't matter, dear. Don't you worry about me. Here, take these 500 credits. It's all I have. Go to Coruscant and find a doctor. I'll meet you there after... after what I have to do. But I already told you there's nothing that... Please, take it. I want to see you again, when we can talk. <sighs> all right, I will. You do what you have to, Bastila. You go make your father and I proud. I'll try. Farewell, Mother. Bastila has accomplished much by not giving in to her impulsiveness, which almost robbed her of peace. Yes, that brought me a lot of peace. More than I thought it would have. Thank you for urging me toward it. After all my training, I would have thought it would have been easier. Apparently, I still have much to learn. When it comes down to it, the two seem to work quite well together. The events on Taurus prove that the Force wanted to bring us together for this mission. And there is little left to chance when the Force is involved. And it would appear the Force is bringing them closer in more ways than one. I doubt the Council would approve if they knew we were busy discussing our mutual attraction when we should be saving the galaxy from Malak. So mutual attraction does exist. Mutual attraction? I never said... It's just an expression. Whatever our feelings... I mean, whatever your feelings, you have to try to ignore them. On a serious note, the Padawan expresses uncertainty about the mission and the reasoning of the Council for sending so few on such an important task. There were times when I wondered if this was also a way for the Council to test my own abilities. And then I realized how foolish such thoughts were. You must learn to trust in the wisdom of the Council. Your destiny will come when it's appointed time. You mustn't be so impatient. That's a bit hypocritical. Must you be so frustrating? I admit, I had a moment of foolish pride, but I'm over it. Now I am focused on my true responsibilities. But Bastila was the one who questioned the Council first. I started it. You were the one who brought up the issue of the Council. You were the one who questioned our mission. You were the one who mocked me for thinking I was being tested. The mission is important and serious, but it's good to know Bastila is open to having some fun along the way. Fun? Fun? Driving me insane is your idea of a good time? You, you are a very odd man. Do you know that? All I want to do is help you, but you seem determined to drive me mad. I don't know if I should be outraged that you keep joking about serious matters or if I should be grateful that you can always lighten the mood. Come on, come, let's move on. There's much to be done.
Kashik is the next planet to visit. As the Ebon Hawk enters hyperspace once more, the long flight presents the perfect opportunity to learn more about the newest crew member. Statement. HK-47 is ready to serve, Master. Whoever programmed this droid likely thought quite highly of themselves. I was under the assumption that organic meat bags such as yourself enjoyed such forms of address. Meat? Bags? Retraction. Did I say that out loud? I apologize, Master. While you are a meat bag, I suppose I should not call you such. Explanation. It's just that you have all these squishy parts, Master. And all that water. How the constant sloshing doesn't drive you mad, I have no idea. An odd, albeit accurate assessment. Statement. Now do you understand the travails of my existence, Master? Surely it does not compare to your existence, but still. Commentary. It is our lot in life, I suppose, Master. Shall we find something to kill to cheer ourselves up? Indeed. Killing is one of HK's capabilities. One he is quite fond of. Observation. My physical abilities are well above those of your average meat bag, as are my sensor functions. An assassin, if you would. Such a function in a droid is highly illegal. While a highly skilled assassination droid, HK shares that he does not seem to possess memories of his past, who created him, and he also cannot fully access his assassination protocols. The cause for this loss is unknown. There may be hidden programming that awaits certain conditions to reactivate my memory core, Master. But there is no way to know. It is quite possible that tampering has simply erased my core permanently. If that is so, a meat bag will surely pay. All memories may return if HK is exposed to a specific unknown stimulus. But there is no way of knowing what the stimulus is. Some memories can, however, be restored manually. If you believe your skills are up to the task, Master, then I can certainly guide you through the process. Request. I only ask that you be oh so very careful, Master. I am too valuable and well-crafted to perish at the hands of ineptitude. You are not a droid, and therefore your skills are limited by the physical capabilities of your meatbag extremities, or some such. The Padawan might not be a droid, but he's certainly capable enough to- Appeasement. Yes, Master. Of course, Master. Could we begin? The first stage is the simple one, and that is accessing my central control cluster. This may take a while. First, you will need to open three panels. And now rewire the last three relays. Yes, good. Well done, Master. I believe your operation was a success. Accessing new memory. Access complete. I have restored a great deal of information about my previous owner, Master. Recitation. The earliest memory of my last owner specifies that he was human, a low-ranking commercial officer for SizeTech Corporation. The human was terminated by this HK-47 unit prior to system shutdown. So HK killed his former master? Affirmative, master. Though I had not been programmed to do so, the human's termination was accidental. Explanation. My former master had owned me for a duration of two standard months before discovering my assassination protocol. He was pleased by the discovery. The human informed me that a competitor corporation was preparing to market a product that would ruin him personally. He was most agitated. He activated my assassination protocol and instructed me to kill all those responsible for the competing product. I proceeded to carry out my order. My former master was unaware of this, but the competitor was in fact an arm of SizeTech Corporation, my master's own employer. It did not take long for my master to realize his mistake. By then, I had already terminated 104 corporate officers. So he sent an assassination droid on his own co-workers. Observation. While it may have been unintentional, my master's wording of his orders left little room for me. SizeTech was responsible for the product, after all. I do not know why my master was so upset, really. He was an officer of SizeTech and a potential target, but I cannot terminate my own master. I would assume that being the sole officer remaining, he would surely be promoted. Instead, however, the human chose to go insane with rage and attack me. And at that moment, HK turned on him. Objection. Naturally not, master. As I said, I am incapable of purposefully terminating my owner. That would not be allowed. My master was not a smart man, however. While he was screaming and stabbing me with a writing utensil, he managed to pierce one of my actuators. The resulting shock terminated him and sadly destroyed my assassination protocol. Pure luck on his part, I suspect. That's a matter of perspective. Query. 
Do you know what the chances are of puncturing that sole actuator? I would have congratulated my master were he not sizzling and incoherent at the time. I shut down immediately whenever my master dies. I can only assume that while I was shut down, Size Tech was dismantled and I was auctioned off as former corporate property. Observation. No doubt my sale price was quite cheap, leading to Yukalaka's purchase. How very demeaning. And no one suspected the assassin droid had killed more than a hundred people? Statement. How could they? The vast majority of the officers had already been terminated. They likely assumed I was mere chattel. I have recovered knowledge of some other actuators which will enhance my performance, Master. I will activate them now. But as for my own history, it will require further effort on your part to restore them, if you wish. Though certain stimuli could always restore my core still, as I explained. For now, please excuse me, Master. I wish to meditate upon the face of my former meatbag master as he was electrocuted. I find it most soothing. While HK meditates, three planets remain to visit, with Kashuk as the next in line. A lush, tree-filled homeworld of the Wookiees. Kashyyyk is a lush but simple and undeveloped world. I would not have expected to find the alien technology of a star map here. In the vision, the star map appears to be on the forest floor. The Wookiees of Kashyyyk make their home high among the Rosha branches. Only their bravest warriors dare to descend into the forbidding depths of the forest. If the star map is located far beneath us on the planet's surface, as our vision seems to suggest, it's unlikely the Wookiees even know of its existence. Upon taking the first steps on the planet, the presence of the Zerka Corporation does not go unnoticed. Talking to Zalbar, the situation becomes clearer. He shares that he was exiled by his brother, Shundar, who is the current Wookiee chieftain. The reason for his exile is that Zalbar, upon learning that his brother was selling Wookiees as slaves to the Zerka Corporation, attacked his brother, using his claws as weapons. Such an act is no small matter, as Wookiees are taught to treat their claws as tools, not weapons. Because of the savage outburst, Zalbar was branded a Mad Claw, and he was exiled from the village. No one believed his accusations that his brother had betrayed them all. And with Zalbar out of the way, Chundar turned on his father, spreading rumors of his madness, and eventually exiled his father as well, and took his place. A vile situation, but finding the star map takes precedence. So they won't do anything that may get them in trouble, at least before the star map is obtained. But just a few steps into Kashyyyk's forests, the group is intercepted by yet another Sith ambush. Lord Malak was most displeased when he learned you had escaped Terrace alive. He has promised a great reward. <gasps> It is likely Malak will begin sending stronger enemies, for the two Jedi appear to be growing beyond the power of these lesser assassins. This is also a sign that their mission is catching the attention of the Sith. There may be greater threats looming on the horizon. Upon reaching Zalbar's village, Zalbar is immediately detained for not honoring his exile and returning to Kashyyyk. In exchange for his freedom, Chundar tasks Zalbar's companions to go into the Shadow Forest and kill a rampaging Wookiee that has been harassing his slaver allies. An irrelevant task for the group, but as the Wookiees control the path to the Shadow Forest, where the star map may be, they accept. The Shadow Forest, also known as the Shadowlands, is crawling with predators. They must be on their guard, 
but in the lowest layer of Kashik, they find something quite unexpected. Ah, <sighs> oh, the damnable racket of battle. Watch yourself. Even more of these crawling beasts are hiding in the underbrush. I'm Jolie. Jolie Bindo. Follow me to my camp and we'll talk a bit. A lightsaber. Ah, don't start fawning just yet. I'm too old for it. Uh, I, I know a few things, but we can talk about it at my camp. Keep close. It's nearby, under a log. Yeah, I live like some burrowing rodent. I fought the Sith. Now look at me. <laughs> well, welcome to my home, such as it is. Pull up a stump and be comfortable. We should discuss a few things. Surviving in the Shadowlands must be quite a struggle, but Jolie appears to manage it quite well. Don't coddle me, child. I'm neither a Jedi nor your master. I'm just an old man that's been lost in the woods for far too long. My days of glory are behind me, but perhaps there is something I can do for you. You must have questions. If he indeed resides in the area, surely he has some information about the star map. Now why would you be asking about that, hmm? Don't answer. I knew that had to be why you were here. The problems of a few Wookiees don't amount to anything before the concerns of the Jedi. No. You are here for the map. Kashyyyk is an interesting place, more so than anyone suspects. If Zerka Corporation knew, <laughs> the planet would be a strip mine. The Wookiees have their legends that they were not always here. But it is more than that. The trees themselves are strangers. What I'm saying is that there are literally walls in your way, and you won't find what you need without my help. Past the cryptic speeches, what he's referring to is the Force Field, which was placed by the Zerka Corporation to control movements in the Shadowlands. With Jolie's help, the Force Field is quickly out of the way, and the star map is located. But there's another obstacle in the way, and it will require some very specific thinking. Life forms detected. Determining parameters. Initiating neural recognition. Yes, there's the thing. Obstinate machine. I've no doubt it holds what you seek. Good luck getting it operational. Primary neural recognition complete. Preliminary match found. Match found? What the... It always muttered something about rejected patterns for me. Begin socialized interface. Awaiting instruction. Greetings. This terminal has not been accessed for quite some time. The star map appears to be sealed. The access to it is likely obtained through this interface. Error. Subject displays unfamiliarity to environment. Behavioral reconfiguration will be needed before access. I am sorry. I did not mean to confuse you. I will answer questions to the best of my programming limitations. Accessing? Yes, I have found a star map in original system memory. Access is restricted. Perhaps the builders set up this installation to limit access to the star maps. They did create them after all. Data regarding author of the star map is corrupted. The Padawan seeks to access the star map. But... Your request requires additional security access. You must be made to match the parameters I have been supplied. And these parameters are... Information unavailable. If you have further questions, ask them now. Access will terminate with success or failure of evaluation. It is difficult to match any parameters when it is unclear what these parameters are. In hopes of obtaining them, the Padawan inquires about the purpose of this installation around the star map. Error. Corruption. Extrapolating. This utility was built to monitor planet-wide agricultural reformation. It has since malfunctioned. It can be theorized that the supergrowth of Kashyyyk's forests is a direct result. Well, that is surprising. I doubt any Wookiee would support such a claim. The forest is millennia old. Malfunction occurred 241 years after last builder communication. Last builder communication 29,642 years before current Republic standard. Just like the droid on Dantooine, this interface confirms that there's been no contact with the builders for thousands of years. This installation was set up to monitor agricultural information of Kashyyyk. But why was agricultural analysis even needed in the first place? Agricultural record indicates this planet was incapable of sustaining sufficient levels of production. Error. Specific conditions corrupted. It can be theorized that produce was being exported to support a larger demand. The builders attempted to accelerate agricultural development of Kashyyyk. 
for the purposes of export. However, this installation malfunctioned and no one came to repair it. This accelerated evolution, which then resulted in the massive trees Kashyyyk is so known for. It is fascinating that the creatures adapted to this growth so quickly from an evolutionary perspective. Error. Records corrupted. It can be theorized that bioseeding allowed the ecology to remain balanced. It could be expected that the same energy feeding the trees of Kashyyyk also accelerated the evolution of various species. No further information is available. There is too much corrupted data. This holographic interface appears quite similar to other holographic interfaces of the current time. It does not appear to be as ancient as the star map. This interface was installed to better access the ancient data stored within the pre-existing system. The exact date is unavailable. Programming keys indicate no earlier than five years before current Republic standard. Hmm, five years ago. I didn't notice it. This must have been installed in strictest secrecy. Couldn't have been Circa. No other information on time of installation or identity of user available. Likelihood of removal by user, 100%. The creator of this holographic interface covered their tracks. Perhaps there are ways to discover this information through access records? Sorting by identity. Three attempts by the Wookiee Freyer, all denied. 152 attempts by human Jolie Bindo, all denied. <laughs> Call me stubborn, I guess. There wasn't much else to do around here. Error. List of access attempts prior to these is corrupted. Likelihood of removal by user, 100%. Surely Revan accessed the star map at one point. There must be records of him. Error. Data regarding subject Revan corrupted. He needed to in order to find the Star Forge at one point in the past. He must be in the record somewhere. Error. Data on Revan unavailable. This installation was set around five years ago, according to recent data. What is its current purpose? The current purpose of this installation is... Defense. Defense of... Error. That information is not available. This leaves sufficient data to form a hypothesis. Given that the star map is locked, it is most likely that this installation is protecting it, or preventing access. Only specific individual matching set parameters can access it. It would make sense for that person to be Revan. He passed here roughly under five years ago, around the time the holographic interface was installed. Fortunately, it appears the device isn't functioning optimally. The evaluation must be made to believe it is being accessed by Revan. And if the evaluation doesn't confirm this... Then you are not worthy of further access. You will be rejected as unsuitable. Access will terminate with success or failure of evaluation. Evaluation commencing. Result will be compared against the pattern in memory. Just act like you should. You travel with a Wookiee and have encountered complications. Hypothetical. You and this Zalbar are captured and separated. If you both remain silent, one year in prison for each of you. However, call Zalbar a traitor, and he will serve five years, while you serve none. He is offered the same deal. But if you both accuse the other, you both serve two years. What do you do? What do you trust him to do? Peculiar that this installation is familiar with Zalbar. I hear what happens on Kashyyyk, and a good deal beyond. Answer the question I have posed. It is important to answer the way Revan would. Revan was a master strategist, so he would answer such a question with a solution that is most optimal for the final result. Thus, the best individual outcome for Revan would be to betray his companion and lower the risk factor. The temperament of a companion is unreliable at best. You wisely trade the threat of one year or five for none or two. This machine certainly seems to want a very specific type of response. I judge the answer correct. You display the proper behavior to match the pattern in memory. Evaluation will continue. Hypothetical. You are at war. Deciphering an intercepted code, you learn two things about your enemy. A single spot in their defense will be at its weakest in ten days, and they will attack one of your cities in five days. What do you do with this information? What is the most efficient course of action? Evacuation will save more lives. There's enough time to escape danger and get the people to safety. But Revan wouldn't think that way. Evacuation would only delay a conflict, and a potential advantage over the enemy would be lost. Revan would weather the storm and let thousands die in order to exploit the weakness of the enemy and achieve victory. Very good. If you had moved to evacuate the city, 
you would have alerted the enemy to their lost codes. Ultimate victory required the deaths of the people in that city. You wisely ignored sentiment in your decision. The Padawan shares this logic, claiming that short-term sacrifices had to be made to end the war and save as many people as possible in the long term. You achieved the proper result with logic that does not match the pattern in memory. I shall adjust my evaluation. Hypothetical. Remove the ongoing war from the previous example. Consider enemy states to be weak and remote. With no external threat, your empire stagnates. Your people become complacent and begin to question you. Same scenario as before. You discover an impending attack, but also a weakness that will come after. How do you react? Logic dictates the answer will be different this time, since the question is identical as before, but there is no threat. One must identify that factor, the hidden threat. If the enemy is weak, the enemy is not the threat. So where is it? In a state with no external threats, whose people are coddled and do not trust its authority, the only enemy left would be the people who do not trust the ruler's authority. So if this ruler were Darth Revan, how would he ensure that his people obey and rally under his command? He applies pressure. He lets the weakling enemy invade. Of course you do. It makes the most strategic sense. Your people will rally beneath you against the common foe. As their eyes turn outward, your rule will strengthen. The trappings of war grant many opportunities. You have matched the pattern in memory. I recognize you and will fulfill my designated function. Soon you will recognize the proper course to follow. The star map is yours. This unit has now completed its primary duty and has finished with the subject. Executing final action. Activation of star map commencing. Parameters reset. Stasis initiated. End communication. Well, well, a star map. An ancient artifact of dark side power. I wonder if the star map has had an effect on the evolution of the creatures here in the Shadowlands. It might explain why it's so dangerous down here. An interesting theory, but I suppose we don't have time to test it now, do we? Now that we've got what you came for, we should be heading back up to the treetops. Padawan is thrilled that another piece of the puzzle has been uncovered, but his choices in these scenarios, Darth Revan's choices, seem to have gotten Bastila's mind thinking, as she's fascinated how easily the Padawan keeps his emotions in check, and lands at what is right and wrong so easily. If only the right path was always clear. I have never found the Jedi training easy to master. I've always struggled for control over my passions. I've always been too quick to anger, too quick to get involved. My instructors constantly berated me for it. I've often dreamed that I might be able to confront Darth Malak myself. I dream I can use all this power I have to kill him and stop all the death and destruction. I just think about all the evil that the Sith have caused and I, I get so furious. Yet we are told that these feelings are the path to the dark side. Would the power I use to kill Darth Malak be too tempting to keep using? Would I become the kind of evil I want to destroy? But what comes next? After using all that power, would you decide to impose your own view on the universe? The dark side corrupts your very thoughts. Part of me thinks that it would be worth anything to vanquish evil, even if it meant giving in to my base emotions. The very thought that I could become as evil as Malak, I just can't fathom it. It just doesn't seem possible. I mean, how could I... No. Wait, I'm sorry. I shouldn't even be asking you this. The Jedi teachings are clear. Who am I to question them? And even worse, who am I to try and make you question them? These are dangerous thoughts. The indulgence of a vain mind. Please, forget I ever mentioned this. Let's just return to our mission. Bastler's opinions are warranted, and they are similar to those of some of the greatest individuals in history. But she is uncertain. Her beliefs are not yet solid enough to give her ground for adequate reflection. Perhaps in time, this will change. In the meantime, with the star map collected, the three continue, with Jolie deciding to accompany them on their journey. Before leaving the Shadowlands, they run into the crazed Wookiee Chunda had tasked them to kill, only to learn it is in fact Freya, Zalbar's exiled father, with his new ally's help, 
Freya returns from the Shadowlands, and along with Zalbar, they rise up against Chunda and the Zerka. They bring the rest of the Wookiees to their side, but Chunda does not stand down. He falls in the battle that ensues. Although Freya now allows the Padawan and his companions to come and go as they please, they won't allow any other offworlders to land for some time, as they lead a revolt against the Zerka. There's nothing else left for them on Kashyyyk, and the crew carries on with the mission. With another star map obtained, and Jolie Bindo added to the Ebon Hawk's crew, two more star maps remain to be found. The next destination is Manan, leaving Korriban for last. On the journey there, the Padawan learns more about Juhani's past, and that she grew up on Taras. It was a horrible place to have to live, at least in the lower cities where the non-humans tended to get relegated. Living for years in a place with no sun, living off the trash dropped from the upper levels, and the meager pay doing back-breaking labor. Every once in a while, a rich human would come down through the lower levels with his droid entourage just to see how the wildlife lived and laughed at the mockeries that were our successes. But I have come to meet many decent humans in my travels since those days. Indeed, some of the greatest people I have ever met are human. The Jedi who encouraged me to join the Order. The one who was with the group going to fight the Mandalorians. She was human, but the Jedi soon left to fight their war. And I was left with a dream. As soon as I had enough money to do it, I bought passage on a freighter headed for Dantooine. And we both know what has happened since then. I am grateful to you for having given me the opportunity to fulfill my dream, rather than become what I hated. Someday, I may make it up to you. But for now, let us keep on the task at hand. As the journey continues, the Padawan recalls that Jolie never answered why he came along. Hopefully he will not remain elusive for too long. Elusive? Me elusive? <laughs> I'd seen everything I wanted to on Kashyyyk. Time to go. Time to move on. I'll admit, for all its flaws, Kashyyyk was home enough. But when you came along and I saw the destiny you had before you, I couldn't help but be intrigued. So Jolie can see his destiny. Of course not. I can see that you have a destiny before you, but the details are far from clear. In fact, everything about you that I can see is odd. Slightly off, as if my eyes are trying to trick me. Something... something is very dark about you. But... Ah, I'm sure you don't need to hear my ruminations. You've probably got enough nosy Jedi offering you one opinion after another to make you sick. One thing I will say is that this little escapade does remind me a bit of my adventuring days before the war. Ah, those were exciting times. Or at least it would remind me of those times if we didn't stand around. What's keeping you? You're too young to be so talkative. Shoo! Shoo! The trip also leaves just enough time to attempt to restore one of HK-47's most recent memories. And now rewire the last three relays. Yes, good. Well done, Master. I believe your operation was a success. Accessing new memory. Access complete. I have recovered information on my owner previous to the commercial officer, Master. Intriguing. Statement. It appears that my previous owner was a human senator on the planet Coruscant. A man of importance who obviously appreciated quality craftsmanship. Obviously. Did he obtain this unit for assassination purposes? Answer. It does not seem so, Master. No. He required a protocol droid only and wanted one as cheaply as possible. One of his assistants discovered my assassination functions later through questioning. The assistant was quite alarmed and told the Senator I should be scrapped quickly to avoid a scandal. Naturally, the Senator had me eliminate the fool. Naturally. So we're not dealing with a very nice Senator here. Observation. Senators are not nice, Master. They are either on top of the game or yesterday's news. My master told me that frequently, you see. I was most proud to have partaken in the political system of the galaxy. During the time my owner possessed me, he gained significant rank. Given time, I believe he could have become chancellor. I even eliminated a few key opponents that he did not ask for. 
freebies, if you will. Freebie assassinations? Answer. Certainly. Why not? I am an intelligent droid, you know. I see an opportunity, and I take it. And my master was most pleased with my work. Observation. I think he would have done far better had he not allowed his use of me to become personal. He set me on his wife. She must have done something wrong. Answer. I am unsure. The human was most agitated and angry. I believe his wife had done something that had displeased him greatly. I was to go to their summer estate and terminate his wife, along with whatever male companion I discovered there. So she was cheating? Statement. I have no idea, Master. Cheating seems to be a relevant term only when one is caught in the act. Otherwise, it is viewed as intelligence. No? I journeyed to the southern continent, but it appeared my master was not far behind me. Apparently, he regretted his activation of the protocol. When I found the wife and her companion, I proceeded to launch my attack. But my master interposed his own body and was destroyed. It was rather a strange meatbag thing to do, do you not agree? Naturally, I shut myself down, my master being terminated. So that's two masters that died at the hands of HK-47? Observation. Only so far, master. There are still more memories not recovered, remember? I believe the senator's wife was unsure what I was or what to do with me. It was she who sold me to the corporate officer, an acquaintance. There is still nothing from previous memories uncovered. You will have to operate again if you desire to find them. With luck. I will discover the stimulus to unlock my core, and all this will be unnecessary. I do thank you for the attempt, however, Master. That will have to wait for the time being. As you desire, Master. Signing off. Kalonord is dead, Lord Malik. He has failed in his mission. Forgive me. The penalty for failure is death, Admiral Carath. But the failure was Kalos, not yours. You may rise. Shall I hire another bounty hunter, Lord Malik? No mere bounty hunter can stand against a Jedi. I shall not make the same mistake again. My apprentice, Darth Bandon, shall take care of our young Jedi friend. As you command, Master. Manan is a world covered in water and the home of the Selkath species. The only above surface settlement on Manan is the floating auto city built above Krakat Rift. The Krakat Rift is an abundant source of the healing liquid known as Qualto. Manan allows the presence of both the Sith and the Republic on its territory, and the tension is felt immediately as the Padawan and his crew venture into the Auto City. I'm warning you. Don't push me or you'll get just what you're asking for. Try it. Just try it. I'd love to see you throw the first punch. And with all the cameras around, the Selkath would be all over you inside of 30 seconds. You break their laws. You pay the price, Republic scum. <sighs> Manan's an unusual place. Not for its water, mind you. It's the Kalto, healing juice. Only place where it occurs in the galaxy. Manan is a water world inhabited by an aquatic race known as the Selkath. Their only surface city and spaceport is called Otto. It is unique in that the Selkath are firm in their neutrality. They are neither part of the Republic nor controlled by the Sith, and they wish to keep it that way. Both sides tolerate each other for the sake of the Kalto. It is the main export of the Selkath, and it keeps them neutral in the war. The three proceed to the Republic Embassy to learn more about the star map's location, and once the pleasantries are over, they learn some intriguing information. We are not supposed to speak of this, but since you are a Jedi and we have exhausted all the other options, 
I think I can entrust you with this. The Selkath conservatives, with their neutrality treaties, seek to treat the Sith and the Republic equally. This includes Kolto exports. But a few more far-sighted Selkath see that if the Sith are ever allowed to win, the galaxy will be plunged into darkness, and there would be nothing to stop them from taking Manan anyway. So we made a deal. The Republic had violated the neutrality treaty and began building a secret station underwater. Shh, not so loud. This station is to collect the Kolto in secret. Yes, it is a technical violation of the treaty, but it is sanctioned by elements of the Selkath government. We need only to keep it hidden from the Sith. The amount we take would hardly be noticed, since most is lost naturally before it reaches the surface anyway. We were nearing completion of the base when the digging teams reported some sort of obstruction, uh, an ancient building or artifact, possibly your star map. Transmissions from the base were cut off abruptly after that, and we haven't heard from the station since. When we lost contact with the station in the Rackard Rift, we sent our contingent of Republic soldiers down to investigate. None returned. We've tried hiring mercenaries and sending them down as well, but none of those expeditions have returned either. The Padawan decides to descend to the ocean floor and investigate, using one of the Republic submarines. I would send soldiers to assist you, but we've lost many of ours, and nearly exhausted the mercenary population of this planet. The soldiers we have are barely enough to keep this base secure. The Sith have also noted our interest and begun to bribe mercenaries away from us. Please, find out what happened to the facility. There may be some survivors left down there. There's an unease in this place. If not for the splashing water of the pool, there would only be silence. The corpse on the ground, its wounds, and the sealed door tell a vague story of what happened here. This whole place feels wrong somehow. Caution would be wise. How? How did you get in? Did they send another submersible? Quick, we have to get out of here. We have to get away. We have to leave now. I managed to close the door after they killed everyone else, but I don't know how long it will hold. The cell calf, they went crazy. They started killing anything that moved. Someone must have triggered the defense systems too, because all the droids activated as well. I was one of the mercs the Republic sent down here to find out what happened. We came down and secured the first couple of rooms. There were bodies everywhere. And the cell calf came out, screaming and croaking their fishy little war cries. They swarmed out and over us. There was no way we could stop them. So we ran. But hardly any of us made it. I, I locked the door behind us, but, but the others had already left in the submersible. The sharks, the Feroxa out there, and worse. I heard an explosion shortly after the submersible left. They didn't make it. Just food for the sharks and the Selkath. Like us. In that case, they are fortunate to have even reached the station. It will be unwise to attempt to leave. More exploration is needed, too. No! I locked the door so the cell calf won't get in. If you open it, we're all done for. If you go in there, you're dead. You're all dead. If you want to die, then go. You won't hear me mourning for you. It is difficult to believe all of the cell calf have gone insane. It is more likely they had a different reason for killing the mercenaries and Republic soldiers. There must be an explanation as to what happened here. The star map remains the priority. But even obtaining it will be meaningless if they cannot depart safely. Exploring deeper into the station reveals signs of battle, corpses, and... The Selkath appears to have used poison as a weapon. A bad sign. The Selkath have retractable venom-tipped claws. But, as in the Wookiee culture, using these claws is a sign of not only dishonor, but madness. It would appear there's no strategic reason these Selkath are killing. It is unlikely they're sabotaging the work of the Republic Station with intent. The Selkath have truly gone insane. The station interior is damaged, and considering the signs of battle, there is an increased risk of breaches. It is possible some have already occurred, 
The station's cameras show a large number of Selkath, crazed and aggressive, muttering to themselves, if not turning on each other. The star map is somewhere on the ocean floor. Perhaps venturing outside of the station will provide more answers. If nothing else, there might be survivors that hid, for it appears there's no one else left inside the station, apart from the crazed Selkath. In order to get to the ocean floor, they need to reach the room with the environmental suits. The suits themselves can be found throughout the station, but more important are the sonic emitters, which will disperse the wandering Faraxa sharks in the water. Somebody out there? Fishy, fishy, fishy. <laughs> Come and eat me too. <laughs> you can't get me, little fishy. Nothing here. I'm safe behind my walls. One could argue that a locker might not be the ideal hiding place, given the present situation. You're just like the others. Father for the Selkath. Walking fish next. Chomp, chomp, chomp. If you can run, you might be fast food. When the Selkath went insane and started killing everybody, I locked myself in here. I'm safe in here. Nothing can hurt me in here. No fishy food for me. Perhaps this individual knows what happened to the Selkath. Don't know. Go ask them. <laughs> when the demon screamed, it shook every mind in the station. We fell to the ground but survived. Fishy fishies, though, they just got hungry. There must be a way to figure out what happened. No, 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 no. That's what the others said. Mercenaries like you. But they're dead. The Selkath ate them. Lunchy munchy. Only the ones left in the south part of the base might still be alive. But where the cult are is. Few fishies there. But many, many, many fishies in between the water. Then that is where they must go and sadly leave this survivor here on his own, as he refuses to leave the safety of his locker. Bye-bye. Go look for fishy people. They'll chomp and bite and chomp and bite. Food for fishy. That's you. It is unclear what the source of this demon scream would have been, but whatever it was, it caused all the Selkaths to go insane at once. They can venture to the ocean floor at the nearest hatch, making sure to keep their distance from the Selkaths lest they be overrun, for they cannot slay them all quickly enough. They begin the underwater exploration and quickly learn they were not the first ones to come up with the idea. Who's there? You're not Selkath, I can see that much. I'm a merc the Republic hired a couple days ago to investigate. But all we found was a bunch of insane Selkath killing everything that moves. All my companions are dead. The Selkath swarmed over us. There were dozens of them. And they, they looked wrong somehow. Like something had changed inside them. Insane or something! The hatch where they entered is overrun. In the worst case scenario, once the star map is obtained, they'll need to find a way to access the docking bay and attempt to escape, no matter the risk. I discovered a way to get to the bay and seal off the rest of the base. I just have to find the Colto Harvester they built on the edge of the Hrackert Rift. It's got an emergency override to open the doors to the submarine docking bay. And I could get in from the outside. I figured my only chance was to slap on an environment suit, head out onto the ocean floor, and check that harvester out for myself. Besides, it's got to be safer out on the ocean floor than back in there with all those crazed cell-calf mutants running around looking for dinner. I'm not spending another minute in this facility. Not with those psychotic fish people all over the place. I'm heading out to the ocean floor right now. It leads to another complex of buildings. Going through them is the only way to reach the Colto Harvester. We should probably stick together, but I won't wait around in here with the cell calf. You can catch up with me if you want, down the hall and through the doors on the right. I'll be waiting on the ocean floor where it's safe. Come on, hurry up. Don't just stand there, we have to keep moving. The water is filled with... The ocean floor is a dangerous place with Varaxan sharks densely present around the station. 
It is believed that the Pharaxa and the Selkath are distant cousins, both descending from the progenitor. This is why some believe the Pharaxan sharks will not attack the Selkath in water, despite their predatory instincts towards other species. The progenitor is a massive female Pharaxan shark, which is believed to somehow be responsible for producing Kolto. It was the center of intense spiritualism by the Selkath, as they believed the progenitor was the ancestor of this species. The Pharaxan sharks are known to attack, which is why scientists operating outside use sonic emitters to stave off any Pharaxan sharks that might come too close. These Pharaxa, however, appear a lot more aggressive than is to be expected. Relying on the sonic emitters to keep them safe, the Padawan and his companions reach the next facility. No, no, y you can't come in here. You'll let the Pharaxa and the Selkath in. No, stay out, stay out. I won't let you open the door for those monsters to get in. I'll stop you. I'll suck all the pressure out of the chamber. That'll stop you. Kill them, kill them now. <laughs> No, no, the Pharaxa will get us. No, the Selkath are coming. No, I, I'm sorry for what I did. I don't know what came over me. I, I, I just panicked when I heard someone outside the door. <sighs> Please forgive me. We're both just scared. When the Selkath went crazy, I thought everyone else except me and Sammy went mad. We had a few people outside the station when it happened. The frags and sharks just tore them apart. It was it was like they were frenzied. The next thing we knew, our Selkath researchers started screaming and, 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 and clawing at everything around them. My team, my team was torn apart and eaten before my eyes. I'm Kono Nolan, and this is Sammy. We were scientists working here on the Harakard Rift project. With so much research and time spent on the ocean floor, they must know something about the location of the star map. There were some ruins that were excavated when we were digging the foundations for the last section of the Kulto harvesting machine. Maybe... maybe that's why it all happened in the first place. This... this monster rose up from the rift. It was a Pharaxa shark, I think. Bigger than anything I'd ever seen before. Bigger than our submersibles. It was like it was screaming inside my head. Then, all the Selkaths started screaming too, and they turned on us. Maybe it was protecting the ruins by the rift. It could have been. It might have a lair in the Harakard Rift near the Kolto vent. Hmm. That might explain a few things too. Why it reacted so violently when our construction efforts got closer to the vent. And also, why it's so large. It must be feeding off the Kolto. Would have to be ancient indeed for it to reach that size. With Kolto as a food source. And all those other Pharaxan sharks? Those might be its offspring. Which would be why they all swarmed when it called out to them. Children coming to protect their mother. The scientists proposed using a specific chemical to poison the water and kill the shark in hopes of eliminating the threat. Which is exactly what we need in this situation. Something to kill that monster shark that destroyed our station. But we don't know how else the chemical reacts. We only tried it in a controlled environment. In the open ocean, who knows what it could do? It could even affect the Kolto. We know exactly what it'll do. It'll kill the shark. That's what we designed it to do. But surely killing such an ancient creature is not the only option. Well, the monster seems to have been driven out by the machinery we installed at the edge of the rift. We've seen it out there on the cameras, bashing itself against the machines. I think if you could destroy the machinery we installed, the shark would calm down and retreat back into its lair inside the rift. But... but we'll lose everything we've built here. All those years of work! It's better than whatever your chemical will do to the water. Destroying the machinery will be better in the long run. We can't risk damaging the environment or the Kolto. Once the machinery is gone, the shark should leave. That won't work and you know it. We have to vent the toxin from the harvesting machine. Once the shark is dead, we can get back to mining the Kolto. You know what you have to do. I just hope you make the right choice. The star map is found. The data within it cannot be reached before this matter is resolved. The great Varaxan shark seems to be blocking the path. The choice is hardly a difficult one.
With the harvesting station no longer interfering with the natural cycle of the Colto, the great Faraxan shark, presumably the progenitor, seems to have calmed down. It evidently understands the Padawan's actions, and that he intends no harm, for it cleared the path to the star map. The Faraxan sharks in the water appear calmer and more distant. Likely, and hopefully, the Selkath were influenced in a similar way. The Manan star map provides more data to begin detailed triangulation. But the fragmented data from the maps collected so far is still insufficient to specify the accurate location of the Starforge. The final star map, which is located on Korriban, the Sith world, will undoubtedly reveal its precise location. What's quite intriguing is that these star maps, while fragmented, appear to be in a relatively similar state of decay. Regardless if they're in a forest, the sea, or the desert, they endure natural conditions easily, so it is unlikely the data within them deteriorated as a result of time, rather that it was manually removed, if not sabotaged. More will hopefully be revealed soon. With the influence of the progenitor removed, the Selkath insanity hopefully stopped, and they have returned to the surface, or into the water. Wherever they went, the path to the surface is clear. Except, the door to the underwater tunnel was not sealed before. At last, my search is over. I was beginning to fear someone else had killed you and deprived me of the pleasure. You may have defeated the pathetic bounty hunter my master sent after you, but you are no match for me. I have studied at the foot of the Dark Lord himself. Impressive. An unexpected sight to find a Sith at this depth. Do you think those Republic subs are the only way to reach the ocean floor? Malak and Revan found a way down here long before the Rackard Station was built. I acquired a ship and followed the same route Revan and my master used on their own journey. Then it was simply a matter of waiting for you to return for the star map. Indeed. Ambushes seem to be the preferred method of the Sith. Your words mean nothing to me unless you wish to beg for your life. No, then I shall try to make this both quick and painful. The Manan star map is found. Only Korriban remains, as the Padawan's journey nears its end. Jolie, may I have a moment? There's something I wish to speak to you about. Yep, I figured it was only a matter of time until we had the whole come back to the order discussion. Well, I guess there's no avoiding it now, so let's get it over with. I know you have issues with the order, but you are a Jedi, Jolie. You command the Force. Without the guidance of the Council, how can you avoid falling to the dark side? Well, I've managed to avoid it the last 20 years or so. Besides, light side, dark side, they don't mean the same to me as they do to you. I don't see in absolutes. I want to stop Malak as much as anyone. But I don't have to join the Order to do it. Look at Karth, or Kandorus. They're with us in this quest, 
but they aren't Jedi. The capacity for good or evil, like the Force itself, is in all living creatures. And belonging to the Jedi Order, or the Sith, or any group, won't change what you are at your core. I see you were quite adamant. No doubt you've had ample time to think on this during your long seclusion. I guess it was foolish of me to think I could sway your position so easily. Yeah, I'm old and stubborn. But I appreciate the effort. But from now on, you can just think of me as any other non-Jedi in our little group. With a lightsaber. And force powers. This discussion doesn't make things easier for Bastila. Not with the previous discussion in which she questioned the path of the Jedi. Yes, I did end that quite abruptly, didn't I? Perhaps a master could have addressed my questions with the proper wisdom. But I never should have brought it up here. Not with you. Part of my purpose on this mission was to guide you in the way of the light. To help you avoid the temptations of the dark side. But I fear I've failed in that task. I don't think I'm the proper Jedi to guide you. The fact of the matter is, I have never possessed much skill at controlling myself. With the bond that joins us, it seems I have even less. You have maintained the path of the light side. But it has been in spite of my influence, not because of it. It's increasingly obvious I am unable to guide you properly. Even if Bastila is unsure of her beliefs, she is a valuable mentor. After all, pondering and questioning everything is the path to growth. That's a kinder response than I deserve, and I can see there is wisdom in your words. You... you continue to be there for me, don't you? Even after I keep pushing you away, you're still around when I need you most. You're like no man I've known before, and you're nothing like what I expected you to be after... after the Council sent us on this mission together. I've been trying to come up with the best way to say this for some time, but... I suppose I should just come out and say it. The truth is, I have come to depend on you. Not just for the sake of the mission, but for my own sake as well. I am... I'm glad you're with us. I know my manner can be a bit taciturn. I know you must be getting sick of my lectures about the dark side and... and everything else. I spent all my years being hounded by my instructors, being told so often how gifted and important I was until I was sick of it. I remember when I was younger, I used to swear that I would never become as self-absorbed and stodgy as the Jedi Masters. <laughs> it's ironic, really. Indeed. Bastila has grown to be very similar to that which she once despised. Yes, well, there's no need for you to agree so wholeheartedly. Being controlled has kept everyone around me at an arm's length. Even those like yourself who are most in need of my understanding and compassion. Maybe it's time to change that. You deserve to know how much I respect and admire you. I had to tell you how much I care for you. As a friend, of course. But there seems to be more than friendship between the two. Please, it's, it's not allowed. I have to remain true to the Jedi ideal. If this is going to cause a problem, maybe I... maybe I shouldn't have said anything. It takes very little for Bastila to reveal her true feelings. With all my training, I should be able to control myself better than this. But you're not like anything I expected. You're not like any man I've ever met before. I find myself watching you when I don't mean to. I'm thinking about you when I don't want to. It isn't supposed to be like this. It shouldn't be so hard not to think of you. It should be easy not to think of you. I should have discipline. Jedi discipline. Maybe it's the bond we share. It gives us a certain... intimacy. If I could, I would return to Dantooine. I need to be away from this bond of ours. I need to weaken it. I need to be anywhere but near you. I am needed here, just as you are. There is nothing that is more important than what we are doing, which is why we need to resolve this. I think... I think we should have some privacy for this. Come with me. You're stronger than I am, and there's no point in telling me otherwise. You will be a great Jedi, I think. I hope. In some ways, you make me feel weak, like I'm caught up in the wake of our destiny. But at the same time, you make me feel stronger, more alive. I realize now these feelings are part of the bond we share. The Jedi Council surely realized this. They knew my loyalty to the doctrines of our order would be tested on this mission. I'm sorry if this is not what you wanted to hear, but I felt that it was important you know our infatuation was nothing more than a result of our powerful bond. Bastila may be able to fool someone else, but he can easily see she is rationalizing the issue and is afraid to face the truth. You're the one who can't face the truth. Malak has to be stopped. How can I do that if I let myself be blinded by my feelings for you? While her emotions run wild, his do not, and he is certain what he feels towards her. You... you mean it, don't you? But how can I be sure you're not making a mistake? I... I have to resist. I have to be strong for both of us. Love does not necessarily lead to the dark side. It can be a valuable source of strength for both sides, but only if one is grounded, strong enough to hold on to it. Okay, you've made your point. 
Now shut up and kiss me, you fool. But Bastila might not be. No. I know we both wanted it, but we shouldn't have given in to our desire. We're Jedi. We can't act like this. Not now. Not while we still have to deal with Malak. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't blame you, but it was a mistake. I have to get out of here before somebody sees us together. Korriban awaits. What happened? What's going on? Sith interdictor ship. They must have been waiting for us on the hyperspace route. We're caught in their tractor beam. Do you recognize the ship? It's the Leviathan. Saul Karath's vessel. My old mentor. Bastila, Karth, and the crew have been taken prisoner as you ordered, Commander. Excellent. Have you searched the ship thoroughly? Admiral Karath warned me to be on alert for any kind of treachery. We found an old man in the back. I, I think we should keep him separate from the others for questioning. A strange request. And why do you think this old man should be segregated? I, I'm not sure, Commander. After speaking with him, I just, I, I just think we should question him away from the others. I, I agree, Commander. After speaking with the old man, I think we should question him away from the others. Very well. The Admiral is probably too busy to bother with this old man anyway. Take him to solitary confinement for interrogation. Report back to me if you learn anything. We searched the ship from top to bottom. Somebody would have had to be invisible for us not to find them in there. Well done. Return to your post and I'll tell the Admiral of this. Karth, it has been far too long since we last spoke. I see the recent months have not been kind in your case. I barely recognized you. But I recognize you, Saul. I see your face every night, even as I promise myself I will kill you for what you did to my homeworld. Did you learn nothing in your time under me? As a soldier, you should understand that casualties were unavoidable. This was an act of war. It was a cowardly act of betrayal. Your fleet bombed a civilian target into oblivion without warning or provocation, and the blood of those innocent people is on your hands. In war, even the innocent must die. The Sith would not accept me until I proved I had truly turned my back on the Republic by bombing the planet. My wife died in that attack, Saul. And for that, I swear I'll kill you. You're an insignificant part of these events anyway. Lord Malak is far more interested in your Jedi companions. He has great plans for them. We will never serve Malak or the Dark Side. The Dark Lord will no doubt torture you for information and for his own twisted pleasure. Eventually, you will tell him everything. The Sith can be very persuasive. However, Lord Malak is in another sector. It may be some time before he arrives, so I suppose I will have to fill in for him until then. Activate the torture fields. <laughs> Enough. I don't want them to pass out before I question them. Don't waste your breath, Saul. We won't answer any of your questions. On what planet is the Jedi Academy at which you were trained? Even though slightly the Admiral knows the truth, the Padawan still refuses to answer. This is the price of your resistance. <coughs> Enough! You see what happens when you try to defy me. This first question was a test. Obviously, Malak knew the Academy was on Dantooine, and it has since been destroyed by our fleet. Dantuin is an empty graveyard now. Nothing is there but a smoking ruin and the charred remains of your former masters. Now, tell me your mission. How were the Jedi planning to stop Lord Malak and our Sith Armada? My pain is meaningless. Tell him nothing. No! <laughs> the torture continues until Bastil loses consciousness. I'm surprised she did not pass out sooner. Rarely have I seen someone withstand such punishment and remain conscious. I see I am wasting my time here. When Malak arrives, you will learn my interrogation techniques are considered merciful among the Sith. I will leave you here in your cell with a small taste of the horrors you will suffer when Lord Malak arrives. Guard! 
I need to speak with you. What do you want, old man? You better not be trying to cause any trouble or you'll be sorry. The cell is too drafty. My old bones could catch a chill in here. We don't want that. You better let me out. Ah, uh, yes, it's too drafty in there. Your old bones might catch a chill. We don't want that. Get out of there. You shouldn't have let me out, Sonny. That was wrong. Admiral Carith won't be too happy with you disobeying his orders. Yes, what I did was wrong. Very wrong. You deserve to be locked up in the cell for disobeying orders. Yes, I deserve to be locked up for disobeying orders. <sighs> what, what just happened? What am I doing in here? Damn you, old man. I'll kill you if I ever get out of here. Then I'll be sure to never let you out. Goodbye, Sonny. Don't try to move too quickly. You might not be fully recovered yet. Admiral Carath had his guards continue to torture you even after you passed out. Taking a moment to come to his senses, the Padawan recalls the Admiral mentioning that Antoine Academy had been destroyed by Malak's fleet. Perhaps he was lying. I'd like to believe that Saul was lying to us. But even as he said the words, I knew they were true. The Academy is gone. We should have felt a disturbance in the Force when the attack came. The fact that we did not is a bad sign. I fear the dark side is growing stronger, casting shadows our vision cannot pierce. I can only hope that some of the Jedi escaped. Rook, Endar, Saar. I cannot imagine all of them being gone. In any case, we've lost our one place of refuge in the galaxy. I have to confess something. There was a moment, just a moment, when part of me was hoping you would tell him what he wanted to know, just to make the horrible pain stop. The interrogation was a sham. Saul was toying with us. He didn't care what we told him. I think it was just an excuse to torture us before Malak arrived. Did you feel that? A disturbance in the Force? The Admiral has sent his message. The Dark Lord knows we are here now. Malak is coming. Why, thank you. We are in a Sith interdictor loaded with troops and Sith Jedi. I am not favoring of our chances. I wouldn't worry about it too much if I were you. We should be moving along, don't you think? If you sat around this long in the Shadowlands, attack would eat you. We are not as unalike as I had previously thought. Huh. Perhaps later we will talk again. I knew we could count on you. A Jedi never fails to get the task done. Now if I remember the layout of the ship, our equipment should be in a storage chamber just through the north doors. After we grab our stuff, we need to get to the main bridge controls. The bridge is the only place that we can open the docking gates of the hangar where they've got the Ebon Hawk. We have to open those gates before we can fly out of here. We better get moving. I can feel the darkness of Malak's presence approaching. And I don't want to be here when he arrives. None of us is a match for the Sith Lord. A small group might have a better chance of sneaking onto the bridge undetected while the others make their way down to the Ebon Hawk. The three of us will get our equipment and make our way to the bridge. The rest of you head down to the docking hangar where they've got the Ebon Hawk. You'll have to find a way to deal with the guards. Don't you worry about that. I know how to deal with the guards. They won't know what hit them. We'll meet you there as soon as we get those docking bay doors open. Just make sure the Hawk is ready to fly when we get there. And may the Force be with you. With the equipment obtained, the three proceed to the bridge to open the hangar bay doors. This is Candorus. We're at the Ebon Hawk. Like we figured, it's under heavy guard. But don't worry, we'll figure out a plan to take care of them. Very resourceful. I assume you had some part in this. You learned your lessons well from me. The only thing you taught me was betrayal and death, Saul. Don't be a fool. I'm giving you and your companions a chance to surrender, a chance to live. 
Darth Malak himself is on his way. He'll be arriving any moment. He speaks the truth, Karth. I can feel the Dark Lord's presence approaching. Malak will destroy you. But if you throw down your weapons now, I will ask my master to be merciful. I've seen enough of Sith mercy. You always did like to do things the hard way. Lord Malak would have preferred live prisoners, but corpses will have to do. Karth. The Admiral, he's still alive. It's time to finish this. Killing him won't ease the pain, Karth. Do not become what you despise. Karth. <laughs> Must tell you. <laughs> Must tell you something. You didn't know, did you? Whenever you look at those you thought were your friends. <laughs> it can't be true, can it? No, 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 it, it can't. Damn you, Saul. Damn you. Basil, it is true, isn't it? And, and you knew. You and the whole damn Jedi Council, you knew the whole time. Karth is not what you think. We had no other choice. Please, you don't understand. So make me understand. Not here, Karth. Please, there's no time. Malak is coming. This isn't the place. I'm asking you to trust me for just a little while longer. Look, okay, I'll trust you, Bastila, but as soon as we're off this ship, I expect some answers. With the hangar doors opened through the bridge controls, the Ebon Hawk is cleared for takeoff. Iskanderus, we took care of the guards. We're inside the Ebon Hawk and all systems are go. As soon as you guys join us, we can get out of here. All that remains is to board the Ebon Hawk and escape the Leviathan before Darth Malak arrives. Darth Malak. Down you go! <laughs> I hope you weren't thinking of leaving so soon, Bastila. I've spent far too much energy hunting down you and your companions to let you get away from me now. Besides, I had to see for myself if it was true. Even now, I can hardly believe my eyes. Tell me, why did the Jedi spare you? Is it vengeance you seek at this reunion? Reunion? What? <laughs> you mean you don't know? <laughs> All this time and you still haven't figured it out. <laughs> I wonder how long you would have stayed blind to the truth. Surely some of what you once were must have surfaced by now. Even the combined power of the Jedi Council couldn't keep your true identity buried forever. Could it? The Jedi do not believe in killing their prisoners. No one deserves execution, no matter what their crimes. The Council would not normally accept an adult for training, but this is a special case. They say the Force can do terrible things to a mind. It can wipe away your memories and destroy your very identity. Tatooine. Kashyyyk. Manan. Korriban. Revan visited each of these worlds searching for clues to reveal the hidden location of the Starforge. The lure of the dark side is difficult to resist. I fear this quest to find the Starforge could lead you down an all too familiar path. What greater weapon is there than to turn an enemy to your cause? To use their own knowledge against them? Someone who is willing to wage war to save the others. you once were, Revan. Recognize that you were once the Dark Lord, and know that I have taken your place. 
the Jedi sent a trap. They lured us into battle against a small Republic fleet. During the attack, a team of Jedi Knights boarded your ship. The Jedi strike team captured you, and the Council used the Force to reprogram your mind. They wiped away your identity and turned you against your own followers. It is difficult to believe the Jedi Order would spare someone as dangerous as Darth Revan. The Jedi are fools. They do not believe in executing prisoners. Originally, I assumed you had died in the battle. Imagine my surprise when I found out you were still alive, Revan. You must have seen flashes of your old life in your dreams, Revan. Memories bubbling up to the surface. Surely you must remember the battle in which you were captured. So this truly is the reunion between Master and Apprentice. Once I served you, Revan. But I always knew that one day the title of Dark Lord would be mine. When that Jedi strike team boarded your vessel, I saw my day had come. I ordered my own ships to fire on your bridge. I thought I could destroy all my enemies with a single glorious victory. I never dreamed that Jedi would take you alive from the wreckage. Why would Malak betray his master in such a way? You mean why did I betray you, Revan? You are the one who taught me the ways of the Sith. The strongest must rule if we are to survive. You knew I would one day challenge you for supremacy, but you underestimated me. I acted sooner than you expected and seized the Sith throne with a single brilliant stroke. How you survived the final battle is a mystery to me. Perhaps you should ask Bastila. After all, she was part of the Jedi strike team that captured you. It's true. I was part of the team sent to capture Revan, to capture you. When Malak fired on the ship, you were badly injured. We thought you were dead. Your mind was destroyed, but I used the Force to preserve the flicker of life in your body. I brought you to the Jedi Council. They were the ones who healed your damaged mind. The Jedi Council didn't restore your wounded mind, Revan. They merely programmed it with a new identity, one loyal to the Republic. They tried to make you their slave. This means that all this time, Bastila knew who he was even when they first met in the Lower City. I wanted to tell you, but the Council forbid it. They were afraid you might return to the dark side if you discovered your real identity. But now you know the truth, Revan. The Council has failed in their attempt to make you their pawn. The will of a Sith Lord is not so easily manipulated. The Jedi hold all life sacred, even that of a Sith Lord. I could not just let you die, Revan, not if it was possible to save you. Bastila hides the truth behind noble words, Revan. The Jedi needed the memories buried deep in your wounded mind. There was no other way to bring them out. They had to keep you alive. We couldn't simply restore your true identity. Revan was too dangerous. But locked inside your mind was information the Republic needed. The secrets of the Starforge. The Council created an identity for you. A soldier under my command. Your subconscious memories were supposed to lead me to the Starforge. There was no other way to get the information. They made you their puppet, Revan. And Bastila was the handler pulling your strings. When I used my Force powers to keep you alive on that bridge, it created our bond. I convinced the Council that I could use that bond to draw out your memories and lead us to the Starforge. Tell the truth, Bastila. You wanted to taste the dark side for yourself. You knew the only way the Council would permit you to explore the Sith's power was through Revan's lost memories. No. I wanted to help you, Revan. I thought this mission would redeem you, that it would atone for your past crimes. How else could you be saved? You had to be healed so I could try and draw out the secrets of the Starforge. It was our only hope of stopping the Sith. It was a risk the Council chose to take. With his identity revealed, Darth Revan may now emerge once more. It is to be expected that he would... But no individual present is aware what transpired within his mind, Revan included. When the Jedi Council wiped Revan's mind, they also inadvertently wiped away the Emperor's orders, those hidden deep within his mind that he had once forgotten, leaving only fragments. But the core identity, the true Revan, remained. The Revan who emerges now is not the Sith Lord driven by the dark side and the perverted commands of the Emperor hiding in the unknown regions. No, the Revan that emerges now is the one who fought in the Mandalorian Wars.
Revan now responds to the situation in the truest way he could. He was, and is, an objective strategist, and indeed, tactically, it is a brilliant move to take one's enemy and use their strength and knowledge against them. But while it is clear Malak is the enemy, Revan senses there's some truth in his words. Regardless, given the circumstances, not much has changed. Only where the Padawan once stood, now stands Revan. Forgiveness, Revan. You are weak. I was right to betray you. You are not fit to rule the Sith. A small part of me has always regretted betraying you from afar. I always knew there were some who would think I acted out of fear, that I did not want to face you. But now fate has given me a second chance to prove myself. Once I defeat you in combat, no one will question my claim to the Sith throne. My triumph will be complete. The Jedi Council were foolish to let you live. I won't make the same mistake. We shall finish this alone in the ancient Sith tradition. Master versus Apprentice, as it was meant to be. Even though his former identity was that of a powerful Sith Lord, Revan is aware that he may not be a match for Darth Malak. And yet that fact is irrelevant, for there is no other option left but to try. This isn't over, Malak. Your friends do not give up easily, Revan. You always could inspire loyalty. But even the three of you together cannot stand against my power. For the Jedi! <laughs> I'll hold Malak off. You two get out of here. Find the Starforge. No, Bastila, he's too strong. No! The door's sealed. We can't get past. Come on, we have to get to the Ebon Hawk. Bastila doesn't stand a chance against Malak, but we can't help her. Not here. Can't let her sacrifice be in vain. Come on! Where is Bastila? What happened on the ship? We ran into Malak. He would have killed us, but Bastila sacrificed herself so we could get away. You mean she's... she's dead? Bah, Malak won't kill her. Don't be foolish. He'll want to use her battle meditation against the Republic. Turn her to the dark side and the Sith will always be victorious. Only one star map remains to find the Starforge, and with it, a hope for rescuing Bastila. Not so fast. We've got a bigger issue to deal with here. They deserve to know the truth about you. Do you want to tell them what Malak said, or should I? It is difficult to anticipate how each member of the crew will respond upon learning that they've been traveling with Darth Revan all this time. Revan is prepared to continue on his own, if he must. Revan? What, what are you talking about? Is this some kind of a joke? No, it's no joke. The Jedi Council captured Revan and erased the Dark Lord's mind, programming in a new identity. Saul Karath told me on the Leviathan, and Bastila confirmed it. You're Darth Revan? This is... this is big! Despite being told who he was, not much has changed. Revan hasn't recalled anything specific from his past life, merely flashes in his dreams, mainly about the star maps. Just a few flashes. That's it. Nothing more? Then I don't think there's a problem. It seems to me that if you don't really remember anything about being Revan, then it doesn't really matter anymore. You are who you are now. Right? Of course it still matters. 
How do we know more memories won't come flooding back? How do we know Revan won't suddenly turn on us? I don't see the Sith Lord standing here. I see a friend who's been with us through thick and thin. Remember, Malik's the one who tried to destroy Terrace. Big Z and I will stick by you. We owe you our lives. We won't desert you now. How can you say that, Mission? The Sith bombed my homeworld, Revan took away my family, and destroyed my life. It was Sol Kareth who commanded the fleet that attacked your people, Karth. And it was Malak who gave the order. You know this. I have felt the presence of the dark side in you, Revan. I can tell there is conflict between light and darkness within you. I do not know which way the struggle will turn, but I will not abandon you in this difficult time, as you did not abandon me. I already knew who you were. Though it wasn't my place to tell you. Better off that you know, if you ask me. Does it change anything? I'm not here to judge you. You'll do what you have to do, and I'll help if I can. You defeated the Mandalore clans in the war, Revan. You were the only one in the galaxy who could best us. We had never met one like you before, and never since. How can you even ask if I'll follow you? Whatever you're fighting, it will be worthy of my skill. I'm your man until the end, Revan. No matter how this plays out. I knew the little guy would come through for you. Droids don't hold grudges. The discovery of Revan's identity also had an unexpected secondary effect. Commentary. I am experiencing something unusual, Master. My programming is activating my deleted memory core. I believe I have a, a homing system that is restoring it, Master. Explanation. I was unaware of my homing system until it had been activated. It seems that the homing system deliberately restores my deleted memory core upon... upon returning to my original master. Affirmation. Sith protocols maintain that all droid knowledge be deleted before assassination missions and restored upon return. I have returned to you and my full functionality is now under your personal command. It is a distinct pleasure to see you again, Master. Wow, what are the chances of that happening? Think you'd never heard of the Force before. Seems obvious enough to me it was meant to be. Remember, we're talking about the Force here. At this point, Malak himself could drop out of the sky and I wouldn't bat an eyelash. Good point. Well, the others seem to trust you, and I don't see any other way that we can stop the Sith. And I suppose that Malak is the real enemy here. I really don't have any other choice, do I? You've proven yourself time and time again during our mission, but this is a little much for me to wrap my mind around. As long as this mission stays on course, I'll stick with you. But I won't let you betray the Republic under any circumstances. So I guess that's it then. We keep going. We've still got one more star map to uncover if we're going to find that Star Forge and save Basila. So let's do it before it's too late. As the ship approaches Korriban, Revan once again gets a glimpse into the star map's location. The Ebon Hawk lands at the settlement of Dresde. Situated near the Sith Academy, this settlement acts as a place for trading, transport, docking, and holds the local cantina, among other things. Hopefuls looking to become members of the Sith Academy spend much time here, as well as those who have already been admitted. Just a few steps into the settlement, the presence of the Sith becomes difficult to miss. No, that is the wrong answer. Again, you pathetic hopefuls can't possibly all be this stupid, can you? You, Jedi, you're looking to get in the Academy, are you not? Well, of course you are. Why else would you be here? Let me pose a question to you. These hopefuls will never survive in the Academy. A lesson must be taught here, but I am at a loss as to what form it should take. Well, if you can't think of anything cruel, you really shouldn't be out here, young man, should you? I wasn't talking to you. We didn't do anything. Please, help us. Silence. It's not what they did so much as what they didn't do, which is prove themselves worthy. I'm exhausted from dealing with their mewlings, so please decide for me, will you? Revan begins to wonder if his past life bore any similarities to this individual, for this display of aggression doesn't seem to have any concrete purpose. Regardless, this is a waste of time, so Revan persuades this young man that he wants to let his victims go. I want to let them go. Yes, that's that's right. They're, they're not worth my time. I'm on my head. What, what was that, I feel like? 
Just get out of here, all of you. I don't have time for this. This is not a rare sight on Korriban. Many of the young Sith seem to share a similar attitude. The Sith thrive on conflict, and seeking out confrontation and threatening these Sith may very well be the best way to blend in on this world. Revan has come a long way since Dantooine. By this point, it would not require too much effort to kill a Sith or two. The Sith Academy entrance is located just outside of the Dresde settlement. It may provide more answers, and entrance is only permitted to students. Please, don't hurt me. I am too weak with hunger. These young hopefuls seem to be simply standing here until they collapse from exhaustion. You must be very sharp to possess such an astute sense of perception. Those fools actually think that if they stand there long enough, I'll let them become a Sith. Idiots. A Sith is not a bantha, all endurance and no brains. A Sith would fight for his life no matter the odds. If these rot grubs are as stupid as they seem, then they deserve their fate. You should not toy with people's lives. Why not just shoot them where they stand? It would at least be more direct. Hmm. It is a bit boring standing out here all day, however. I think I'll go for some dinner. It will be fun to think of them while I gorge myself. They'll still be here in an hour or two, surely. I suggest you run along before I decide to make you part of the fun. Sadly, it appears these hopefuls will only find a pointless death. Oh, no. All this for nothing. Leave me be. I won't listen to your manipulations. I I will make it into the Academy. Just, Just a few hours longer. Just a few hours, sure. It seems Korriban already teaches a lesson. The ignorant cannot be helped. You are neither a Sith, nor do you bear the medallion of a student of this facility. You must be admitted to the Academy. That decision must be made by a Sith who has already been accepted here. The final decision, however, remains with Master Yuthura. I believe she is currently at the cantina if you wish to seek her out. Yuthura Ban. Is there something you need, Jedi? Make it good for I have little patience. Very quick to identify a Jedi. You think me a fool? You think I do not recognize a lightsaber when I see it? You are far from the first Jedi who has come here after all, willing to abandon that decrepit order of yours. Very few, if any, here are fond of the Jedi, it seems. Hide-bound relics who burden themselves with tradition and with the protection of the weak and ungrateful. They are pitiful and misguided. Why would you take a gift as glorious as the Force and squander it? Weaken yourself deliberately and shackle yourself to outdated mores. Our gift has made us superior. It is our rightful place to rule. How can any deny that? Yet the Jedi do so, and call us evil because we do not. But killing and punishing those who are weaker for the sake of dominance is evil. Is the Sarkath beast who dominates his jungle evil? The Tukata who leaps on the Squellbug for the kill? These are things of nature, of the universe. We are no different from this. The Force is part of the universe, part of the same laws. We were gifted to set us above the rest. To deny nature is foolish. Revan recollects the sights he has seen here, the hopefuls expecting to find greatness, and instead finding only meaningless deaths. They could have been simply rejected, sent away, not driven to death. We make no apologies for the weak. If you cannot clench your fist and know when the moment comes to strike, there is no place for you amongst us. Of those who come to train, those who are weak return home. If they are both weak and foolish, they die. But it was their choice to come. But the dark side corrupts individuals, mentally and physically. A force such as that surely has ties to evil. Corruption is a word the pitiful use to describe the natural longing for power that they deny. Evil is a word trumpeted by the weak to ease their heart. It is true that the Force exacts a physical toll on some, but not a single one of them has ever regretted it. Anything else you hear is propaganda. So in this grand scheme of things, Darth Malak sits at the top. Malak is the strongest of us, and the strongest always rules. At least until one who is stronger can take it from him. That is our way. Survival of the fittest. You are always on guard, always lean for the kill. We promote it, for through this, the Sith are stronger. The Sith promote betrayal. If a Sith is proven to be weak, and if the time is right, the Force rewards the cunning and the mighty. Step up to the challenge if you dare, 
or turn tail and run. Intriguing perspectives. They hold much value from a subjective viewpoint, but then again, the same can be said for the Jedi. There's no point in arguing either for too long. You've heard enough, have you? <laughs> so what is it to be? Are you here to be a Sith or not? Yuthura speaks as if she plays a large part in deciding who becomes a Sith. You must not have been in Korriban for very long. Either that or you have been feeling your way about blindly. Luckily for you, I am in a charitable mood. I am Yuthura Ban, second only to Master Uthar of the Sith Academy here in Dresde. I am the one who decides which of the few of the many hopefuls who travel here to train actually become a Sith. Is it your desire to enter the Academy? Is that why you are here? How is Yuthura so sure he is not a Sith? He does have a lightsaber after all. I would consider that an amusing ploy to try and enter the Academy. Why? Who will you claim to be? Darth Malak himself? What about Revan? What about Revan? Revan is dead. You may have a natural gift for the Force, human, but you've no gift for lies. It might be best to keep the truth hidden and take on the mask of a pupil. Ah, so you are just another hopeful after all. Or are you? There is something odd about you that I cannot place. Obviously, you are a Jedi. One who is very strong in the Force, it seems. So were you a part of the Order for very long? Did they train you? What difference does it make? Perhaps none. Perhaps all the difference in the world. Either way, you possess enough raw power to intrigue me greatly. With that kind of power, you could become a great Sith. Perhaps, if I let you. Does that interest you? Revan is interested, but time is short, so he persuades Yuthura to take him to the Academy. <laughs> you must not think much of Sith Masters to try that little trick. I won't hold it against you, however. It shows initiative. But I do desire a real answer to my question. Does it interest you? No shortcuts this time, it seems. Still, it will surely be interesting to revisit the path of the Sith, he finds. Hmm. A strange response indeed. Even stranger, I do not sense any deception within you. You should make for an interesting pupil indeed. I will take you to the Academy, and we shall see if you are ready to join the ranks of the Sith. I have only one other question. These companions of yours... They will not be coming with you, I presume. My hearing's not so good. I'm just pleased my nice master doesn't beat me so much anymore. Yes, sir. There's something odd about this servant of yours. No matter. Make sure they don't disturb your training or cause trouble. You are responsible for them. Now, the master of the academy awaits you. Greetings, prospective students. It appears we have a late entry. Who do you bring before me, Uthura? A young human bristling with the Force? A human that has had some training, it seems, Master Uthar. Very promising, I think. Promising? <laughs> that one's not worthy to lick spit off your shoes, Master. That I'll judge for myself, thank you. You all have the potential to become true Sith. Only one of you, however, will succeed. The one who succeeds will be admitted to the Academy as a full Sith. All others must wait until next year and try again, if you survive. Remember that you are competitors here. Fight for your destiny, or go home. If you wish to gain a lead over your competitors, the first of you to learn the Code of the Sith and tell me of it will be rewarded. The rest is for you to discover. Welcome to the dark side, my children. Your one chance at true greatness lies here. While learning more about the path of the Sith is intriguing, hopefully more information about the star map's location will be revealed. Ah, there you are. My favorite prospect for the year. It would appear Yothora has taken a special interest in Revan. Absolutely. By my estimation, you are far more likely to achieve the prestige necessary to join the Sith than any of the others. As a matter of fact, I am so certain of that that I'm willing to offer you an opportunity of the once-in-a-lifetime variety. As I said, you're no doubt going to be the one whom Uthar chooses to become a Sith. With my help, of course. Once that occurs, he will take you into the Valley of the Dark Lords to the tomb of Nagasado to administer the final test. There you and I will be alone with him. The perfect time to, shall we say, arrange for a change in the Academy's leadership? The tomb is an ancient ruin on the surface that was visited years ago by Darth Revan and Darth Malak. They discovered a star map there of great importance. The star map's location is revealed. 
and to reach it sooner, Revan could simply go to Uthar and gain prestige by informing him of Yothora's treachery. I suppose you could do that. Even the hint of betrayal from his pupil and Uthar would move to eliminate me. But this is a very good opportunity for you. You can start off your Sith career as the right hand of the head of the Academy. Me, Uthar will not offer you that. Tell Master Uthar what you wish. Were I you, I would think first of what the consequences of such an action might be. Upon carefully considering the situation, Revan agrees to Yothora's plan. I'm so glad you see it my way. I will begin to make preparations for your final test. Your only worry now is to get there. Don't disappoint me. But Revan is no fool. He sees through the apparent favoritism of Yothora Ban. He decides to do some plotting of his own to ensure his path to Nagasado's tomb will be clear. First, he tests Uthar's limits. You wish to know more about me, do you? And why would I indulge your idle curiosity? Will we be good friends, you think? I strived many years to hone my power, until I was able to drive out my predecessor and rule the Academy. If you are smart, you will aim to do the same, or better. There is nothing else you need to know. Do not ask again, young one. Uthar is a strong individual, the most powerful on Korriban at the moment. Yothura, Revan considers, is a means to an end, for she is weaker than Uthar. Revan reveals her treachery. It is a bit ironic that Uthura has begun her plotting. I have been aware of her growing ambitions for some time, and had in fact already decided to remove her. A clever ploy, for he gets on Uthar's good side, and he reveals that normally the top two students would battle in the tomb of Nagasato, supervised by Uthar and Uthura. This time it will be Uthura who battles, though she does not yet know it. Perhaps it will be you who combats her. Yes, perhaps so. This is what you can do. Give this pad to Adrenus. He will put some poison in her bath. This will weaken Uthura for that final test, making her an easy target. Rather generous of me, don't you think? Hmm, this should be interesting. The plot thickens. Ah, how very clever of him. Normally you would face some other student in the tomb, preferably one of the failed ones. Obviously Uthar has decided to get rid of me. But why? Did you say something to him? But of course. What? You fool! Oh, while I respect your attempt to play both sides of the fence, you are playing a dangerous game. If you think Uthar will truly be so grateful to you for double-crossing me, think again. Your only chance lies with me. In the end, it works out better that it is only the two of us in the tomb with him, so long as we refuse to fight. Is there anything else I should know? Based on his assessment, it would be best if both Uthura and Revan are at their full strength when the time comes to face Uthar. Thus, Revan does not proceed with the plan to poison Uthura. Let me see that. So it's true. Thank you for bringing this to me. Now I will be far stronger than Uthar expects. Here, this pass card will allow you access to Uthar's quarters. It's at the far end of the passages with the other quarters. Take this device as well and put it inside his cot. No one should see you do it. Then Uthar will be too weak to stand up against us. Don't even think of failing me. You and I are too far into this now to back out. The plan is set in motion. The only remaining task is to impress Master Uthar and gain entry to the tomb of Nagasado. It begins with the Sith Code. I can help you understand it. Would you like to hear it? Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. Simple words. But easily misunderstood. Peace is a lie. There's only passion. The Jedi would have you believe that peace is a desirable goal, that peace of the spirit is the way the Force is mastered, that lack of conflict betters man. We know different. It is our passion, our hate and our desire that fuels the Force. It is conflict that improves the lot of civilization, and single being both. Conflict forces one to better oneself. It forces change, growth, adaption, evolution, or death. These are not our laws, but the universe's. Without conflict, you have only stagnation. Through passion, I gain strength. What fuels your power with the Force but your passion? The stronger, darker emotions. Anger, hatred, fear. 
these passions empower us. Love is more dangerous than all those things. Love leads to anger and hatred more often than not. But it also leads to mercy, which is far worse. That, however, is a lesson for another time. What keeps the most rudimentary creature alive? Fear to run, anger to fight. Without it, a creature would most surely die. We are far more than that, perhaps, but in some ways we are little different. The thinker's creatures beyond the need of simple passions is a delusion. Through strength I gain power. The Force gives us all power, even the Jedi. It is our mastery of our passion that gives us the strength they lack. It is our goal to be stronger, to achieve our potential, and not rest upon our laurels. We are the seekers, not the shepherds. The stronger you become in the Force, the more power will you achieve. But always must you fight for your power. Without strife, your victory has no meaning. Without strife, you do not advance. Without strife, there's only stagnation. Through power, I gain victory. How many sorts of victories can you imagine? Peaceful victory? Victory by sacrifice? A truce? Unless a victory is achieved by demonstrating that your power is superior, it is only an illusion, temporary at best. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. This has been argued over and often. The chains represent our restrictions, both those placed upon us and those we place upon ourselves. Ultimately, the goal of any Sith is to free himself from such restrictions. In a way, it is so we may do whatever we wish, but it is far more than that. One who has freed themselves from all restrictions has reached perfection, perfect strength, perfect power, perfect destiny. Imagine it. That is our ideal, at any rate. Perfection is a goal, goal, I think, rather than a state of being. The Jedi would argue that, no doubt. The Force is our servant and our master, our teacher and our companion, a weapon and a tool. Know it, and you know the universe. Master it, and you master the universe. Strive for perfection, and the Force shall reward you. Revan easily masters the code. I am not surprised. The Force is strong with you. Master it, and it shall serve you well. Before proceeding with his plans, he wants to learn more about Yuthura. About myself? I am originally from Slaheron, if you must know. I was a slave to a cruel master, Omish the Hutt. I'm sure you don't need to know more. He immediately notes Yuthura's resistance. He scratched the surface, at least. Something he failed to do with Utha. He may attempt to probe her for more information, but not at the moment. Revan proceeds with finding ways to impress Master Utha, starting with the Sith Code and sharing his understanding of it. Furthermore, he sets off to explore the Valley of the Dark Lords. This is one of the tasks Revan takes on with great importance. Learning more about Sith history will prove valuable, regardless of how he wishes to use this knowledge. Perhaps we could learn more about the origin of the Force itself. With that knowledge could come great power. But little does he know that his experiences in the valley will go far beyond digging up ancient artifacts. One of the tombs Revan explores in great detail is the tomb of Ajunta Paul, the very first Sith Lord. The tomb, like many others, is overrun with Tukata beasts, but with his companions he manages to reach the innermost chamber and bypass the mechanisms protecting it. The sarcophagus within the tomb contains quite a treasure. Three swords, one of them radiating. Too long, too long in the cold and the dark. I am disturbed again. Oh, a human. Now this you don't see every day. This, this is an old spirit full of the Force. I sense great sadness and regret. Walk carefully. A Jedi here? Why have you come to this dark place, Jedi? Why disturb my sleepless rest? Revan may have visited this tomb before. Could it be that he encountered the spirit before? Is it possible the spirit remembers him? I do, and yet I do not. The force is so strong with you, human. Yet the face, the soul... Oh, it has been so very long. So very long. 
This could be... I had a name once. Ajunta Paul. Yes, that was my name. I was one of many. We were servants of the dark side. Sith Lords, we called ourselves. So proud. In the end, we were not so proud. We hid. Hid from those we had betrayed. We fell. And I knew it would be so. A spirit from a different time. Ajunta Paul lived in the ancient times. Ancient? Has it been so long that you used the word ancient? I have been here so long, so lost. I cannot, cannot remember. We were the first, the first to rebel, to betray, to surrender ourselves to the dark side. So strong, we thought. So wrong. Yet we embraced it in secret, reveled in its power. We were discovered? Or did we act? I, I can no longer remember. But here is where we came to hide, to grow. And here we fell. We hid from the Jedi. But it was not they who destroyed us. Is it not obvious what we did? We destroyed each other. We desire the secrets of each other to increase our power. We battled until finally our fortress rained down on top of us. Hm. The Sith consumed themselves, did they? Hm. I suppose that eventually they'd be all they'd have left to fight. And so, here, our old secret is buried, and none of us hold it anymore. Is that not right? Our power fled. Oh, what became of us? Do, do the Sith still thrive? Did they ever return? The Sith did return, and they are thriving, but they endanger the galaxy. So much, so much time has passed, and yet we have learned nothing, nothing. The spirit must be in agony. Why does he remain here, Revan wonders? Remain? Do I remain? I have regretted for so long all that I have done. After all this time, for the first time, Ajunta Paul seems to have encountered an individual who feels sorry for him. Most of my brethren would desire only to take what power I have left, even if it would destroy them. We were not the first to fall to the dark side, but we had more power than those before us. It came from elsewhere. Elsewhere? Where did it come from? Our oldest secret. Only, only we would know, we lords. Only we would know where our power came from. I, I do not remember. A map? Perhaps it is a map. But it has not been buried with me. All I have now is my soul. I filled it with my pride. And it is buried with me now. A corpse. As I am a corpse, I am dead as my faith is dead. And I shall remain here, surrounded by blackness, in death as in life. I wish my sword to be taken away from here. I do not wish it to rot away as I have. I command this of you. If, if you are wise, you will not keep it. In the end, it is what destroyed me. There are three blades within my sarcophagus. Only one is truly my sword. But it has been so long, I do not remember which. Find the sword that is mine and place it on the statue. If it is truly mine, then it is yours. I am that which grips the heart in fright. Harkens night and silences the light. It was written of my sword long, long ago. Go then, find my sword and place it on the statue. Revan quickly identifies the sword. How could he not? Only one of the three is ebony black and notched along its length, an appearance of cruelty, as it would cut into its victims, truly gripping the heart in fright. At a mere glance, shadows dance across its cold surface, Indeed, hearkening night 
and silencing the light. Yes, that is the one. That is the blade that destroyed me. Take it. Take it and the other blades even. Take them and go. My darkness awaits me. Revan still does not understand. Thousands of years have passed. An eternity. No matter which atrocities he committed in life, there is no need for Ajanta Paul's spirit to suffer here still. No need? What choice have I? All these years, returning to the light wasn't even a consideration. Return? But I betrayed my old masters. They would never let me return to the light side. It is too late. Too late. Revan convinces the spirit of Ajanta Paul that it is never too late for redemption. And suffering and punishing himself for so long, any soul can see the regret within his heart. If, if I could return, oh my master, it has been so long, but I regret so much. The three swords from the tomb will surely impress Master Uthar, especially the sword of Ajantapur, which Revan, as advised by its former owner, does not plan to keep for himself. So, the spineless worm actually made it through the tomb. I'm impressed. I've been hoping that someone would do the dirty work in retrieving the sword of Ajunta Paul for some time. It's been quite a wait. <laughs> Typical. Always ready to jump at what they perceive to be the easier path. Now that you have it, I just thought I'd relieve you of it. It must be quite a burden, after all. Hand over the sword, worm. You know I'm the superior here. Naturally, intimidated by his power, Revan hands over a sword. You're obviously more pathetic than I could have even imagined. Thanks for the sword, worm. Ah, what is this you bring me, Shardan? It is none other than the sword of Ajunta Paul, Master. Fool. All the trouble you went through for your deception, and you did not even make an effort to verify the sword's authenticity. Master, what, what do you mean? There is no place for fools amongst the Sith. Be gone. Ah, finally, the genuine sword. I knew that this relic would be unearthed in time. I can feel the power flowing through it. Well done. Alongside the many other tasks Revan completed in the recent days, including battling some of the other students and turning others away from the dark side, without sharing that, of course, Master Uthar is sufficiently impressed. You have but one final test which you must take, and this requires us to travel to the tomb of Nagasado in the Valley of the Dark Lords. I would advise you to be rested and equipped before we leave. Return to your quarters now and seek me out in the morning. When you return, Make sure that you have all you will need, for you will face your test alone. Go, and may the Force serve you well. Within a day's time, the path to the star map will be clear. Until then, however, Revan takes time to prepare and discuss matters with his partner in crime. We destroy Master Uthar together and I take his place. And you take your place at my side. A beautiful plan in its sheer simplicity. A perfect plan. But Revan is well aware that the Sith are not quick to share power. He must be on his guard. Given that Yuthora relies on Revan for her scheme, she will be more open to sharing information at this moment in time than ever. The last time they talked, Yuthora said she was from Slaheron. I did. I also said that you didn't need to know more. Why are you asking? If the two will work together after Uthar is defeated, it wouldn't hurt to get to know one another. I see. Very well. I suppose there's no harm in the tale. As I said, I was originally a slave to one of the Huts. The Huts control everything on Slaheron, and a slave is nothing to them. I was determined not to be nothing. One night when the drunken worm had me alone in his chambers, I stabbed him and escaped the compound. I stole onto a cargo ship and was not discovered by the crew until they reached the next system. They left me for dead on a desolate planetoid, alone. But that was fine by me. I was glad to be anywhere other than Saheran. It was not luck that I was eventually rescued, of course. The Force was strong with me, though I didn't know that at the time. Not until the Jedi told me, that is. So you thought I was a Jedi once? I'd rather not discuss it. Perhaps another time. There is always harm in becoming too vulnerable. I will not be as weak as you desire. Have I asked you about your past? Yuthura once said there are no friendships among the Sith. Revan claims 
he hopes to prove her wrong, if for nothing else but passing the time before the final test. I see. You certainly have odd notions for one hoping to become a Sith. I'll play along, for now. Let's see. After escaping from Slaheron, I was found by the Jedi. They took me in and trained me, even though I was a bit older than most Padawan. So Yuthura was a Jedi Knight once? Not really, no. I never progressed beyond Padawan. I had discipline, but no peace. And after my treatment at the hands of the Huts, there was little room in me for the ways of the Jedi. The absence of peace sounds like a common ailment among the Sith. Yes, well, I imagine I am not unique. Things very easily could have been very different for me. I wanted to use the Force to free the other slaves I knew, to fight for what I knew was right. The Jedi restrained me until I couldn't stand it anymore. They claim the dark side is evil, but that isn't so. Sometimes anger and hatred are so deserved and right. Sometimes things change because of it. But for Yuthura, nothing has changed as a result of her anger. No, not yet. But my anger has not diminished, nor my desire to see change. The more time I spend with the Sith, the more I am certain that one day I will be able to fight as I must. I know this may sound strange, but only my compassion stands in my way now. Once that is gone, let the slavers beware. Odd. The Sith are not meant to possess compassion in any form. I... yes, of course. I, I mean losing my compassion, as in holding back. But enough of that. I have talked about myself too much. Surely you are tired of it. Yuthura is an intriguing individual, and there may yet be a chance to learn more about her. Hopefully, the future will allow for it. Come back soon, my friend. Before the day is done, there is one matter left to attend to. During his time at the Sith Academy, Revan had discovered that Karth's son, Dustal, had joined the Sith, believing they were not evil and held much anger towards his father believing he had abandoned him during the bombardment of Telos. Regardless of any beliefs Revan may have on the Sith, on Karth's request, he helped in convincing Dustal to see the Sith for what they truly are. I have a data pad I want you to look at. You knew someone named Selene? Selene? She's the one who convinced me to come to the Academy with her. Why? Where did you get this? Look at it. It belongs to Master Uthar, doesn't it? Yes, it's his, but he told me he... He said that she'd been lost on a mission in the valley. This... This says that they... Killed her because she was hindering your progress. Superiority at any cost, Dustal. There's your evil. Or can you live with that? No. No, I can't. I... I had no idea. They lied to me. Well, there's the son I remember. Now, will you leave here? I... No. You go do whatever you have to, Father. I have some other friends here. I have to warn them what's going on. I'll go back to Telos when this is over. You can find me there. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, son. Good luck. And so, with Revan's assistance, Karth finally gained some closure. With the dawn of the following day, the time for the final challenge approaches. Revan takes a brief moment to talk to Yuthura, to discuss one peculiar thought. Greetings, my friend. <laughs> I do rather enjoy saying that. And it truly does sound genuine. He has been wondering how much Yuthura knows about Darth Revan. Revan? You mean Darth Malak's former master? Very little. I never met him personally, though I heard he was a very powerful man. Very charismatic. In the end, Revan was outshone by his pupil. Such is the way of the Sith. Why? Is this dead man of importance to you? Dead man? Of course not. Anything is possible. Perhaps Revan is out there, somewhere, waiting to take revenge upon Malak. More likely, what we were told is the truth. Revan is dead. Malak would be foolish to leave his old master alive, considering all the knowledge Revan held. At the very least, it is clear Yuthura would not be able to recognize Revan if she were to see him face to face. Is there any reason I should? Beside the fact I did not know Revan in life, Revan was known for wearing a full helmet and cape. Perhaps Revan's body had been disfigured by the power of the Force. It is not unheard of. Perhaps. Regardless, I doubt I shall be meeting Revan any time soon. But she shall. The question is if she'll meet him as a friend or foe. As the time for the final test arrives, the plan proceeds as expected. Yuthura, Utha, and Revan enter the tomb of Nagasado. No one is permitted to leave or enter until the final test is concluded. 
Very well. We are now ready for your final test, young Sith. You have earned the right to see if you shall become one of us. Indeed you have. Is that a tone of mischief in your voice, dear Euthura? You should know by now that no scheme is certain. As should you, my master. But I was only agreeing with you. Should we not get on with the test? Yes. Yes, of course. We are in the sacred tomb of Nagasado, young one. The one discovered by Darth Malak and Darth Revan years ago. You are to follow in their footsteps and reach the ancient star map that lies deep within. There you will find a lightsaber, amongst other things. The lightsaber is for you, your initiation present. Return to us once you have it. For you, the test does not end there. Be very cautious here. This tomb is like the others in this valley, and many of its old defenses remain active. Euthura and I will await your return. Go and retrieve the lightsaber. There is nothing we can do for you until then. <clears throat> what the hell is your kind doing here? Bad enough I have to deal with all these other idiots, but now there's a stinking Cathar on this world, too? I have as much right to be here as you do, sir. We should have exterminated all you Cathar when we had the chance. What? What do you know about my world? I know enough that... Hey, wait a minute. You look familiar somehow. What are you talking about? Maybe I was wrong. Still, I think a specimen like you would be a nice addition to my collection. The females make amusing pets, but the males should be put down like the animals they are. I remember one time on Taurus. What? What did you say? What did you do on Taurus, you scum? Put one of you down like the animals you are. So easy. Then I saw one of the females on the auction block. <sighs> But those darn Jedi. It was you. What? Me? Oh, ho, ho. now I recognize where I've seen that face before. You were the little Cathair I was going to purchase. But those Jedi came and stole my pet away from me. You. The homeworld. Get her, men. But remember, don't kill her. It was once said that to enter the tomb of Nagasato is to breathe death itself. The tomb contains many traps and challenges, both mechanical and organic. Revan even encounters Tyrantatic beasts. These creatures are strong with the dark side of the Force and feed on the blood of Force sensitives. They are particularly resistant to Force powers. Instead, one would do better to direct the Force inward and strengthen their capabilities, rather than use the Force to directly attack the beasts. In the end, Revan overcomes the many challenges of the tomb, including a pool of acid that blocks the main path, and gains access to the chamber with the star map and the lightsaber. Combined with all the other pieces of information from the star maps, the Korriban star map reveals the hidden location of the star forge. To the Star Forge is clear. The only obstacle in the way is the final part of the test. So, you return to us with the lightsaber in hand, as I knew you would. The Force has served you well. The last part of your test will now commence. Here, you will learn the lesson of competition. All life must compete in order to flourish. Such is the natural way of the universe. To stand still is to know death. One must always be moving forward. So it is the same amongst the Sith. Compete or die, mercy is irrelevant. So it behooves you in this final test to strike down one you are familiar with, for no other reason than to prove you are superior and without mercy. Normally, this would be against another student. You, however, get a special treat. You will fight Euthura here, my own apprentice. You have become too ambitious, Euthura. 
It is time for you to die. No, it is time for you to die, Master. My pupil stands with me. Sadly, Euthura, it is you who are mistaken. Your pupil is more ambitious than you realize. Isn't that so, young one? Well maneuvered. With both counting on your aid, you can influence the outcome of the situation as you see fit. The stronger of the two must fall first. Revan sides with Euthura. Do you hear that, my master? That is the sound of a new leader rising to replace you. So the time has come, has it? I will... I will... Oh, no, my strength leaves me. You are weak, Uthar. And the Force has abandoned you. We have made sure of it. The only reward you will get is death. Kill him! The bar is finished, and a new order is brought to the Academy. Excellent. While I do like you, truly, I'm afraid I'm not the type to share power with anyone, even you. But of course, for that is the Sith way. Revan anticipated this outcome. Though, all this time, and even now, Yothura does not seem to take pride in her choice, as if unsure of herself. I... Uh, I'm sure. I told you there was no such thing as friends among the Sith, didn't I? Let's get this over with. True Sith has no mercy, yet Euthura begs for mercy from one whom she assumes to be a Sith. I suppose I am. Something tells me that you are not like the other students. I don't know why that is. I was right the first time back at the cantina, wasn't I? There is something different about you, more so than I even suspected. And she finally learns the truth. I didn't think you were here to train, not really. I should have realized that sooner. I should have known, right from the beginning. But you are no longer the Dark Lord you once were, are you? You are, Revan, and yet you are not. What I sense of your destiny is... is still unclear. So what happens now? Will you show me mercy? Will you just let me leave? Why did you Yuthura choose betrayal? It was not for power. Not truly. I had no choice. You reminded me too much of a time before I became a Sith. I didn't want to think about that. If she does not face the truth now, at this moment, she never will. I suppose you could be right. All the things I wanted to do, all the wrongs I wanted to right, I haven't done any of it. They just get farther and farther from my mind. All I've cared about is power and myself. This isn't the person I was. Euthyra's past is heavy, and she needs peace. But the way of the Sith will never be able to provide it. You're right. Maybe what I needed most was peace after all. The Jedi tried to show me that. I don't know if I can ever go back to them, but my place isn't here. Thank you. Thank you for showing me that. Revan senses the change within Yuthura, as if a burden had been dissolved from her shoulders. The next step in his path will take him to Malak. An individual like Yuthura could make for a powerful ally on the journey ahead. That's tempting. But I don't think I could. Your path. It goes somewhere I can't follow. You have a destiny, my friend. And I wish you well on your way to it. May the Force be with you. You there! How is it that you're leaving Nagasadao's tomb by yourself? 
You went in for your final test, didn't you? Where is Master Uthar? As expected, the Sith at the Academy did not take kindly to the results of the final test. Before the entire Sith Academy learns of what had happened, it may be best to leave Korriban. <laughs> you seem to have defeated me, Kev, there, Worm. But I'll have the last laugh in the end. What do you mean? You may have killed me today, but I had the pleasure of killing off your species. You... you animal! You wretch! I killed your people on Cather in their homes. I hunted them down like the animals they were, <laughs> just to see them burn. You... You killed my father. You killed my people. You you treat us like animals. You deserve to die. Revan carefully observes Juhani's response. Her resolve is being tested. You are nothing. I... I... Uh, help me, please. Do not let me give into my anger again. There is no emotion. There is peace. No, I will not do this. He may die. But it will not be out of my vengeance. You coward! You weak! <coughs> that man was a beast! A monster! I am glad that the galaxy is now rid of him so he may not harm others again. I do regret, though, that he did not die by my hand. Perhaps only on the surface, but not truly. I know. But must I always fear the lure of the dark side? It was for the best. I am glad that you stood by my side during this. We should continue our journeys now. No reason for staying here for this. Star map data indicates the Starforge system is located quite a distance away. As the crew prepares for the challenges that await, his experiences on Korriban make Revan ponder on his past and who he was, and how similar or different he may have been in comparison to the Sith he met. He may never know, he thinks, and then remembers that there is still a connection to his past. Observation. You are different in many fundamental ways, Master. You have a concern for life that is unsettling. This cannot solely be caused by memory loss. I do not know how to explain it, Regardless, you do seem to be improved overall from the human I once knew. HK still possesses memories of Darth Revan. Perhaps he also holds memories of the Starforge itself. Answer. No, Master. You never did make me privy to any of the Starforge's secrets. I was sent on an assassination mission into Mandalorian space, but I was damaged and unable to return to you. Exclamation. I find this most distressing. I could certainly have protected you from the Jedi and your pupil's betrayal had I returned. Still, he does provide some insight about the enemy. Commentary. Your former pupil is efficient and brutal, even for an organic. I rather liked him when you first introduced me to him. If I had known what he would do to you, Master, I would have gladly removed his entrails right then. Your pupil once asked me what I thought of him, and I informed him of his meatbag status. He was unimpressed. But you found the reference humorous. You changed my programming so that I would continue to use the term. It drove your pupil to extreme lengths of frustration. So Malak was the original meatbag? Revan finds that quite amusing. Observation. Of course you do, Master. You did then as well. With time left to ponder on the current situation, the circumstances, Revan's mind begins analyzing the path ahead. The choices of Jedi, of Sith, and the choices he will have to make. If it comes down to it, is it worth risking everything for a single individual? Got something on your mind, do you? He turns to the Jedi, who may provide some clarity on the matter. The Jedi, with their damnable sense of over-caution, would tell you love is something to avoid. Thankfully, anyone who's even partially alive knows that's not true. Jolie's beliefs were put in question during the Exar Kun Wars, which took place years before Revan was born. Exar was a Jedi who was corrupted by ghosts of the old Sith, or so they say. He attempted to conquer the Republic and create a new golden age of the Sith. A Sith believes he commands the Force, 
but it is the dark side who commands him. You know this. At the time, the beliefs of many Jedi were put in question, but his were tested when a woman entered his life, whom he met shortly before Exar Kun began his conquest. My wife's name was Nayama. Upon meeting her, I knew right away that she was strong in the Force. Nayama was a marvel of a woman. Fiery, determined, smart. Oh, and that body. Well, yes, that. <clears throat> Needless to say, I eventually won her over. At any rate, I wanted to train her in the Jedi way. The Council refused my request, naturally. I was still a Padawan at the time. The problem with self-righteous folk is they think they're more right than everyone else. Easy to say now. At the time, I just thought I was right. Nayama was intrigued by the idea of becoming a Jedi. She liked the idea of power too much, perhaps, but I certainly didn't see that at the time. I believed in her and trained her in secret. I ignored her willful nature. I loved her too much to see fault in her. And she loved me too. I know she did. At the time, our love was a shared bliss, better than anything I had known before or since. And then something happened that would spark a division between the two. Exar Kun is what happened. Nayama was inspired by Exar's promises of a new golden age. She wanted to join him. She came to me, pleading with me to throw aside what she called the decrepit trappings of the Jedi, to join her in Exar's war. I had trained her myself. I loved her. I pleaded with her to reconsider, to think about what she was doing, to think about what she would become. She would have none of it. Finally, in frustration, she attacked me. She drew her lightsaber and attempted to strike me down. It was a scene being repeated everywhere throughout the galaxy. Pupil against master. In my case, it was a long and terrible battle, but I defeated her. But he did not kill her. No, no. I had her at my mercy, disarmed and defenseless. She looked up at me and she knew. She knew I couldn't do it, but I should have. Sometimes I convince myself otherwise, but it's no use. She had fallen to the dark side when she raised her saber against me. I have played that instant in my head so many times. Sometimes I convince myself that I couldn't have done otherwise. That I couldn't have seen that she had truly fallen to the dark side. But yes, I was a fool. And I let her go. To my shame, she went on to kill many Jedi during the war until she herself was slain in the final battle. I grieved for her death, inevitable as it was, even as the Jedi Council put me on trial for my actions once the war was over. I had trained Nayama against their wishes. I had failed to kill her when I had the chance, and she went on to kill others. It would only make sense that a Padawan in such circumstances would be punished by the Order at the very least exiled, for causing the deaths of other Jedi as a result of his own self-righteousness. Of course I deserve to be punished. They found me innocent, even though I deserved every punishment and more. They let me go. Mitigating circumstances, they said. I deserved compassion, they said. That, that was when the Jedi left me. That was when they failed me. They may have been able to forgive me. I could never forgive myself. In the end, with such terrible consequences in mind, is it still possible to believe that love is worth the risk? I... yes. I do, I suppose. Does that surprise you? Uh, it is all so long ago, lost in the winds, I suppose. Nobody cares what an old man believes anymore, do they? Revan certainly does, and he is glad this old man decided to accompany him on this journey. <laughs> I'm rather glad I came too, really. You're a fine young lad. I hope... I hope things turn out well for you. Now then, I've chatted enough for one lifetime. Let's get this show on the road, shall we? Strong child, but I will break you. I'll never fall to the dark side. <laughs> you think torture will turn me, Malak? You're a fool. Torture? No, dear Bastula. You misunderstand. 
This is but a taste of the dark side to whet your appetite. When you finally swear loyalty to me, it will be willingly. Never. <laughs> Such resolve in your words, but I see the truth in your heart. The dark side calls to you, Bastula. You hunger to taste it. Become my apprentice, and all its power can be yours. Starforge. I've never seen anything like it. I'm transmitting these coordinates to Admiral Dodonna. Maybe a quick strike by the Republic can cripple the Sith fleet. Message is away. Now we can just wait for the Republic to show up. We should be safe here. We're outside their sensor range. Small vanguard of Sith fighters coming in hard. Someone needs to get on those gun turrets. Take those fighters out before they report our position to the main fleet. Oh, uh, we've got problems. We've flown in some kind of disruptor field. All my instruments are jammed. We've got massive overloads in all systems. I'm picking up a single planet in the system. I'll try and put us down there. Hold on. This may be a rough landing. Revan does not recognize this planet, even though his feet will tread upon its soil for a second time. That disruptor field fried our stabilizers. We're lucky we made it down in one piece. But if I can't find the salvage to make repairs, I won't even be able to get the Ebonhawk airborne again. During our rather rapid descent, I noticed the holes of many crashed ships scattered across the landscape. Perhaps the parts you need can be found among the wreckage. The Cathar's right. This planet's a technological graveyard. I saw dozens of downed ships out there. That disruptor field must have wiped them all out. But where could it be coming from? Even if we get the stabilizers fixed, we have to find and disable the source of that disruptor field before we can take off. Otherwise, we'll just end up crashing again. That Sith fleet we saw must have some type of protection against the disruptor field. We have to find a way to disable it, or the Republic will be slaughtered. The Temple of the Ancients, unknown to any of the crew is the key to disabling the disruptor field. Fortunately... T3's picking up massive power fluctuations on the ship's sensors. They seem to be coming from some type of large stone structure to the east. It looks like some kind of ancient temple. Disabling the disruptor field is the key to reaching the Starforge and rescuing Bastila. I only hope we're not too late. Bastila has been Malak's prisoner for a long time. If he can turn her to the dark side... She will join him, and the Sith will be invincible. I fear Bastila will find the lure of the dark side difficult to resist. She is strong in the Force, but she is also impulsive, willful, and proud, as you once were, Revan. Revan believes to be strong enough to set his feelings aside in this matter, in particular after his recent experiences on Korriban, which made him stronger, both in the Force and in mind. If Bastila does truly fall to the dark side, he will have no choice but face her in combat. Let us hope it does not come to that. Well, if Bastil is on the Starforge like you think, Jolie, then we can't rescue her until we disable that disruptor field. The sooner we investigate that temple to the east, the better. We can probably find the wreckage of a downed ship along the way. 
And if we're lucky, we can salvage some stabilizers from it to get off this planet. I hope everything works out as smooth as you make it sound, Karth. Well, so do I, Mission. So do I. Upon further exploration, Revan and his companions discover the temple, which appears to be the source of the disruptor field. The courtyard that once separated this temple from the surrounding jungle doesn't seem to act as a barrier to the wildlife anymore. Carefully evading the beasts, they reach the temple, only to find an impassable force field at the entrance. This is all still unfamiliar to Revan, and as far as he's concerned, he does not sense a personal history with this planet. That is, until their exploration leads them to a rather odd sight. What appears to be a holographic interface questions the three. And to everyone's surprise... You understand these aliens? Of course. You must have come here and learned their language in your search for the secrets of the Starforge. Revan does not recall his confrontation with the Black Rakata, nor the one from whom he ripped the knowledge of this language, which still courses through his synapses. Upon introducing himself to the hologram, the Rakatan recognizes him. Puzzled and invited to speak to the elder Rakata, Revan sets foot into the Rakatan settlement. These elder Rakata share their confusion with Revan. Firstly, they ask how he dares return after his betrayal. But once Revan explains that he does not recall this world, they explain that he had indeed come here before and asked for their aid to enter the Temple of the Ancients in hopes of destroying the Starforge. And when the time came to honor his part of the deal, he broke their trust and took the Starforge for his own. After much persuasion, and the Rakata sensing that something has indeed changed within him, they agree to assist Revan once again. The Rakata will do their best to lower the barrier to the Temple of the Ancients. But this time, he is to keep his promise and enter the Temple alone. <laughs> Many hours into their ritual, it is interrupted. Wait, you can't go in there alone. We have had a, a premonition. The Force has given us a vision. There is great danger within the temple. We cannot let you face it alone. You might be walking into a trap. Maybe Malak himself is waiting inside. Even if he isn't, that temple will be crawling with dark Jedi. You'll need all the help you can get. The Rakatan ritual guide will not allow it, for he has been instructed by the elders to only allow Revan to pass. Your destiny, maybe the fate of the entire galaxy, could be forever changed inside that temple. I'm not about to let you face that alone. Not after my premonition. There's a reason I had that vision. Jolie speaks for both of us. You must enter the temple, but we must go with you. So you just tell that guide of yours to do whatever he has to do to get us all inside the temple. There's too much at stake. The Republic fleet will be slaughtered should Revan be overwhelmed in the temple. He is not prepared to risk so much only to respect Rakatan tradition. He attempts to convince the guide of this, and should he not comply, Revan is prepared to take drastic measures. Fortunately, it does not come to that and the guide complies with the request. Why do I get the feeling this is going to take a while? Still, we better stay ready. As soon as those shields go down, we have to get inside the temple. Lord Malak, the preparations are nearly complete. Every day the Star Forge adds more ships to our fleet. It is operating at nearly 300% of our projections. The fleet is assembling around the Star Forge and awaits your instructions. Patience, Commander. My new apprentice is nearly ready. Once Bastula joins her battle meditation to our enormous fleet, we shall be invincible. Then we shall begin our final conquest of the Core Worlds, and the Republic will be crushed forever. 
as you wish, Lord Malak. This temple was once a symbol of the past. Now its legacy has been devoured by technology, cargo containers and droid parts. The weight of the dark side is easy to detect here. Many Sith meditate amongst the walls of this temple. Who dares intrude on our meditations? You know the penalty for... <gasps> Revan, you are back. Malak told us what happened to you. The Jedi Council has stripped you of your power. You are a shell of what you once were. Darth Malak will reward us greatly for destroying you. It is good that he did not enter alone. These Sith proved to be significantly stronger than the assassins they faced before, and his allies are tremendous help in defeating them. On his search to find a way to disable the disruptor field around the planet, Revan reaches the lowest level of the temple. Here, he finds what appears to be a Rakatan puzzle which blocks the way forward, which he quickly resolves, unlocking the door. Here, he finds one of the main terminals. As Revan accesses the terminal, it is intriguing to consider the fact that just a few steps away, hidden within the wall, lies the holocron Darth Revan left behind on his last visit to this place. What contrast the two are, the redeemed Revan and Revan the Sith Lord. It is fascinating to consider how different a person can be when a single aspect of their being, their motivation, is altered. Any person may take on the role of both a villain and a savior. The holocron will remain hidden here for some time, waiting in the dark. Darth Revan's teachings will cast their echoes into the future, but that is a story for another time. In the present moment, Revan addresses the Rakatan Terminal, which answers all of his questions. He learns that the Starforge is a colossal space station that draws on the power of the Force to produce anything in a very short amount of time, making it capable of producing an endless supply of vessels, weapons, or whatever else is desired. He also learns that, in a way, the Starforge is a living thing, for it draws on the Force, and is indeed an entity of the Dark Side. The Terminal informs him that few can exploit the power of the Starforge without being affected, and that it takes a powerful mind to resist its influence. The Rakata were not able to do so. Revan learns of the Rakatan history, that the Rakata were a violent, arrogant, and savage species by nature, and that the Starforge enhanced these characteristics. At its peak, their infinite empire was a home to ten billion Rakata and a trillion slaves spread across their space, across more than five hundred worlds. Revan learns of the civil war that raged among the Rakata, the rebellion of the slaves who saw their chance therein, and the plague that cut the Rakata off from the Force, leading to their fall. His suspicions about the star maps are also confirmed. The star maps were built as monuments to the glory of the Infinite Empire, marking the borders of their space. The Rakata, in the wake of their demise, and unable to use the Starforge due to the loss of their Force sensitivity, attempted to sabotage the star maps to prevent the slave races from finding the Starforge. What's most surprising is that they succeeded. However, the star maps were constructed using the technology of the Starforge, and they have been slowly reconstructing themselves to patch up the damage caused by the Rakata. This resulted in the fragmented maps which Revan found. Each map was useless on its own, but collectively their fragments could be used to triangulate the location of the Starforge. Much valuable information is extracted from the terminal about the Starforge, perhaps one of the greatest sources of dark side power known. While Revan doesn't doubt his ability to resist the dark side there, he does worry what this could mean for Bastila. No doubt, Malak will attempt to use that dark side influence in hopes of breaking her, and Revan can only hope Bastila is resisting its pull. Still, 
And there's another concern. To even attempt to destroy the Starforge, Revan will need the help of his allies. He wonders if they will be able to withstand its influence, especially Juhani. I know how hard it was for me to resist the call of the dark side. It is hard for me with my Cathar blood to resist sometimes. I do resist. I look to you and I see that we are in this together, and that you are resisting as well. And that gives me strength. Juhani speaks the truth. Her resolve was tested many times on their journey. Taris. It was Taris that the Sith destroyed to try to kill you and your precious Bastilla. Taris, my homeworld. You killed my father. You killed my people. You, you treat us like animals. You deserve to die. In the end, she would always find strength. If not within herself, then in Revan's example. Thank you for accepting me. You are the one who drew me back from the dark side. It is to you that I feel a debt, and I shall make it up to you. This terminal cannot disable the disruptor field around the planet. To do so, Revan must access the terminal on the temple summit. The path to it had been cut off, for the temple's defenses did not recognize him as Revan, who visited this temple before. With this terminal, the temple's database has been updated, and the path to the top floor of the temple has been unsealed. But, as the three approach the temple summit, they sense a powerful source of the dark side that awaits there. Revan, I knew you'd come for me. Malak thought you might be afraid to enter the temple again, but he doesn't know you like I do. Not anymore. Not since you've changed. Quickly, Bestilla, come with us. We have to escape before Malak arrives. Escape? You don't understand. I've sworn allegiance to Lord Malak and the Sith. I'm no longer a pawn of the Jedi Council. Surely you know what I mean, Revan. Look at what the Council did to you. They turned you into their puppet. The same thing they do to all who are truly strong in the Force. They speak of the dark side as if it is something to be feared. But in reality, their only goal is to manipulate those who are strong in the Force. The fear of the dark side is a tool to maintain control. Why do you think the Jedi forbid you and Malak from joining the Mandalorian Wars? They knew you would realize your true potential and break free of their domination. Malak has shown me how the Jedi Council have been using me the same way they once tried to use you. They've been holding me back because they knew one day I would surpass them all. After all those talks on the dark side... I resisted it first. I endured the Sith torments with the passionless serenity of a true Jedi, emptying my mind. But after a week of endless tortures, I finally saw the truth. Malak forced me to acknowledge my anger and pain. He showed me the liberating power of these emotions. Then he made me see how the Jedi Council has denied me what is mine by right. The Jedi Council gladly used my battle meditation in their wars, but they still treated me like a child, like an inferior. They were jealous of my power, of what I could become. They wanted me to bow and call them master and follow their code and obey their every order. But all the while, they were exploiting my battle meditation for their own use. And upon realizing this, Bastila thought the best choice would be to abandon everything she believed in based on nothing but arrogance and Sith lies. Lies? You were the one living a lie, Revan. The Jedi Council made you into something you are not. They programmed you to be their slave, like I was, until Malak freed me from their shackles. A pity the power you once had is so diluted in you. You could have been as strong as I am now. Stronger even, but that will never happen now. With the power of the Starforge, Malak will destroy the Republic and conquer the galaxy. And I will be the apprentice at his side, after I prove my worth by killing you. Bastila is as impulsive in the dark as she was in the light. Revan quickly finds that Bastila is stronger than she was. But she is driven by impulse more than ever, and regardless of her newfound strength, she is no match for him. You were stronger than I would have thought possible after what the Jedi Council did to you. Seems that Malak was wrong. The power of the dark side is not lost to you after all, Revan. You deserve to be the true master of the Sith, not Malak. I see this now. Together we can destroy your old apprentice. Join with me and reclaim your lost identity. Her mind is clouded. That much is clear. For in such a short amount of time, she decided to betray Malak. Even if Revan were to agree, she would likely be willing to betray him just as quickly. It is your power that will keep me as your loyal apprentice, Revan. I swore allegiance to Malak only because I thought you'd lost the power you once wielded. But you have proven yourself in our battle. 
I see you possess the strength to destroy Malak and reclaim the mantle of Dark Lord. Now I see you will make a worthy Sith Master. Power. The experience as Revan obtained since the beginning of this journey, since the Endar Spire, since Taris, put this situation in a clear perspective. While the Jedi have been indeed blinded by their teachings, the Sith on Korriban were no better, for they were blinded by power. Power was the cause for the losses over the centuries, for the Jedi schisms, the Mandalorian Wars, even the bombardment of Telos. Ages ago, once the ancient Sith had their way and made their home on Korriban, they still fell because of their hunger to have more, to wield more. And they destroyed each other, destroyed everything they had built. So much time has passed, and yet we have learned nothing, nothing. Ajunta Paul understood the fault of the Sith, but only once it was too late, and once the dark side's embrace faded, he could see the truth only when there was nothing left, as did so many others. But not all who were touched by the dark side were so consumed that they could not understand its nature. Euthuraban would have fallen had she not heeded Revan's words and faced the truth she was running from. All the things I wanted to do, all the wrongs I wanted to right, I haven't done any of it. They just get farther and farther from my mind. All I've cared about is power and myself. This isn't the person I was. The dark side is a burden. It takes a strong being to tap into it without their mind being consumed by its tendrils. Very few Sith in times future and times past could do this. The dark side clouded Euthura's mind, but one Euthura ban embraced the dark side not for selfish hunger or greed, but a hope to change things for the better. Sometimes anger and hatred are so deserved and right. Sometimes things change because of it. Juhani is also prone to the dark side's influence, but her fall was also not caused by hunger for power, but the anger she could not control. And the Jedi path, although flawed, is the only thing that can keep that anger in check. Others, like Revan, have the strength to veer from the path of the light or the dark without being affected by either. Knowing all these things, it is clear that Bastila stands apart from all of them. She embraced the dark side for no other reason but the very hunger that always existed within her, but was tamed by the Jedi teachings. Malak simply broke the constraints that held her back. That hunger is a part of her being. Bastila had scratched the surface of the truth of the Force, but only for a brief moment she began questioning the Jedi teachings, but her uncertainty in her beliefs made her slip too far from that understanding. She simply shifted from one end of the spectrum to the other, instead of finding the balance in between the two extremes and remaining there as Revan did. Bastila, it is not too late for you to be saved. The teachings of the Jedi can lead you from the dark side. Shut up, Juhani. You know nothing of the dark side's true potential. When you felt the power of the dark side, you fled to a cave like some cowering animal. You know nothing of the force or its true potential. But you, Revan, the power of the dark side is yours to command. You can use it to destroy Malak. With my help, you could rule over the entire galaxy. This being that now stands before him is not Bastila. Not the one Revan knew and had begun falling in love with. Without anything left to hold her back, Revan begins to fear Bastila is too consumed by her hunger to be reasoned with. You were a pathetic fool, Revan. Together we could have defeated Malak and ruled over an empire. But now, I will be at Lord Malak's side instead. You will be crushed with the Republic and all the fools who bow down to the Jedi Council. No one can stand against the power of the Star Forge and the Sith fleet. The planet's disruptor field is shut down, and the Ebon Hawk, repaired by its crew, sets off to the final destination on their journey.
The Republic fleet must have gotten the message I sent as we were crashing into that planet. I'm picking up a transmission from them now. This is Admiral Thorne Dodonna to the Avon Hawk. Do you read us? Admiral Dodonna, this is Carthanassi. We're receiving your transmission. Karth, I'm glad to see you're still alive. We've begun our assault on the Star Forge, but we're taking heavy losses. How did the Sith ever manage to build something of this scope? The Star Forge wasn't constructed by the Sith, Admiral. We don't have time for me to fully explain it, but that space station is far older than you can imagine. Maybe we should pull the fleet back and retreat. I don't know if we have the firepower to go up against this alien technology. You can't do that, Admiral. The Star Forge is a factory of immense power. It's been churning out the capital ships, snub fighters, and assault droids that have powered the Sith war effort. You have to destroy the Star Forge now, or you'll be fighting an unending wave of reinforcements. Then I guess we have no choice. But it isn't going to be easy. I can't even get our capital ships into position to start bombarding the Star Forge. The Sith fleet is too well organized. It's like they can guess our every move and count our every strategy. It's because of Bastila, Admiral. She turned to the dark side and became Malak's apprentice. We suspect she's somewhere on that space station right now, using her battle meditation against you and your fleet. This is Master Vandor. A number of Jedi Knights have joined our fleet under his command. If Bastila is using her power to augment the Sith, then Malak's fleet is invincible. Our only hope is to somehow stop Bastila from using her battle meditation. How can we do that if she's on the space station? I will send a squadron of Jedi Knights to the Star Forge to find Bastila. Their small ships will be able to fly through the Sith blockade and dock on the space station. If they can find Bastila, they may be able to distract her attention from the battle overhead. That should allow you to move your capital ships into position for a final assault on the Star Forge itself. I hate to ask this after all you've done, Karth, but the Jedi may need all the help they can get. Don't worry, Admiral. The Evan Hawk and her crew are gonna see this through to the end. And may the Force be with you. You made it. Several Jedi have already gone ahead into the Star Forge. We have to strike while we still have the element of surprise. Come on, before they... Damn! So much for catching them unprepared. We'll deal with these Sith. You get into the Star Forge and find Bastila. Hurry! Lord Malak, a team of Jedi have penetrated our defenses. Their fighters have landed on the Star Forge. This is not unexpected. The Jedi are formidable opponents. Send the Starforge's battle droids to deal with them. Lord Malak, forgive me, but how can mere droids be a match for the Jedi? You underestimate the power of the Starforge's droid army. Dispatch the droids. Of course, Lord Malak. I can feel the power of the dark side here. It almost feels like... like it's alive. It is... unnerving. The deeper they go, the dark side of the Force grows stronger amongst the walls of this place. 
Bastila's battle meditation permeates from within the colossal starforge structure, but Revan's team is not deterred. They stand together and use one another for support. Why have you disturbed me? I have news, Lord Malak, about the Jedi. Ah, the Jedi. Did my droids pass their test? Did they destroy our enemies? N no, Lord Malak. The droids could not stop them. Strange. I did not think there were any among the Order who could survive an attack by an army of the Starforge's battle droids. It... it was Revan, Lord Malak. Your old master is with the Jedi here on the Starforge. Yes, that would explain why the droids failed. Revan was always strong in the Force. Very well. Send out all available troops, the apprentices as well. Do you... do you think they can stop Revan, Lord Malak? Of course not. But they will slow Revan down. That will give me the time I need to fully prepare the Starforge's defenses. I am curious to see the true extent of this space station's capabilities. One as powerful as my old master will make an interesting test subject. The Dark Jedi, drawing on the dark side of the Starforge, are a threat not to be taken lightly. The Jedi who went ahead put up a valiant fight, but they proved to be no match for the Dark Jedi, invigorated by the Starforge. Ah, more victims for us to slaughter. Both of Revan's companions remain focused. All three collectively draw on the Force to stand against the enemy. <laughs> The Jedi in Revan's crew are not the only ones doing their part, as the rest of the crew infiltrates the Starforge and attempts to aid their allies in whatever way they can. Revan's team may be able to overpower each enemy they face, but there is only so many they can battle at a time. It is imperative they find Bastila as quickly as possible, before they are driven to exhaustion by the countless stream of threats sent their way. Master, why have you summoned me? Without my battle meditation, there is a chance the Republic capital ships could break through and attack the Starforge itself. This will not take long, Bastula. You will be able to resume your battle meditation soon enough. I only wanted you to know that Revan is here on the Starforge. Revan? But... The Force is bringing us towards a confrontation with my old master. The Starforge has drawn our enemies together. So they may all die in a single glorious day. You must kill Revan to prove yourself worthy of being my apprentice, Bastila. You must finish what began in the Rakatan Temple. Yes, Lord Malak. I sense your fear, Bastila, but it is unfounded. The power of the Starforge will feed the dark side within you. 
It will give you the strength you need to defeat my old master. Stay here in the command center while you use your battle meditation against the Republic fleet. Revan will find you here in due time. It is inevitable. Of course, master. I will not fail you again. Perhaps you will triumph, Bastula. But even if you fail, it will give me the time I need to complete my preparations of the station's defenses. And then we shall see if Revan can stand against the full fury of the Star Forge. <laughs> Slaying enemy after enemy, pausing only to recuperate and heal any wounds they sustained, Revan's team finally reaches the destination. Revan, I knew you'd come for me. Revan will attempt one last time to rescue Bastila from the dark side. You're wasting your time. I've seen the Jedi for what they are, weak and afraid. The Sith are the true masters of the Force. You've forgotten that lesson, Revan. Now you must pay the price. Here on the Star Forge, the power of the dark side is at its strongest. This time, you will not defeat me. you. Even though you're only a shell of your former self, you're still a formidable opponent. I can't even imagine the power you must have wielded when you were the Dark Lord. You were a fool to give it all up and follow the light side. Bastila's words remain empty and blinded to the truth that she will never be a match for Revan. The dark side has made me stronger than I ever was before. I have a greater command of the Force than all but the most powerful Jedi Masters. As Malak teaches me the greatest secrets of the Sith, I will unlock more of my potential. Eventually, there'll be no limit to what I can accomplish with the Force. Perhaps, but seeking power solely for power's sake is a path to no other outcome but death and destruction. Jedi propaganda. The dark side is only a tool and Malak will train me in its use. Eventually, I will surpass my master and challenge him. If I am worthy, he will die by my hand. Then I will take on my own apprentice, and the cycle will begin again. This is the way of the Sith. It is how we assure our leaders are always the strongest and most worthy. Malak betrayed Revan from a distance, an act of cowardice. He will never allow Bastila to surpass him, and she is doomed to fall under his rule. No, Revan. It is you who are doomed. The Star Forge channels the dark side through Bastila as a conduit, and her wounds are healed, her body empowered once more. In the face of this impossible advantage, Revan still manages to overpower her, albeit barely. You're growing weary. I can sense it. Your strength falters. The light side is failing you while the power of the Star Forge re-energizes me. Soon this will all be over. More delusions. The dark side will always triumph over the light. Malak has assured me of victory. You can't defeat me here on the Star Forge. You can't. Time and time again, Revan strikes her down. But the power of the Star Forge breathes life into her. <laughs> This is 
is not possible. You have rejected the dark side. You are a weak and pathetic servant of the light. How can you still stand against me? Why can't I defeat you? Once, it may have been uncertain. Twice, perhaps unlikely. But the third time Bastila is beaten, she realizes she is only kept alive because Revan wishes it to be so. And he could strike her down before her wounds even have a chance to heal. Yes, I see you speak the truth. I am no match for you. Please, for the sake of what we once shared, do not make me suffer. End my life quickly. Revan refuses. What other choice do you have? I have fallen to the dark side. I am the apprentice to the Dark Lord himself. You cannot let me live. Darth Revan was redeemed. Why can't Bastila be? You were a special case. The Council had no other choice. They needed you alive so they could discover the location of the Star Forge. It was an act of desperation. It was my responsibility to watch over you. I was supposed to protect you from the dark side. In protecting you, I fell to the dark side myself. No one can be protected from the dark side. No matter the teachings, guidance, or examples. The choice is on the individual. I suppose you are right. If the path I have chosen is that of the dark side, I don't see any way I could atone for what I've done. I deserve to die. Words no Sith would ever dare to speak. In the aftermath of which, Revan tells her the truth. The reason he is sparing her. You love me. There was a time I yearned for and yet dreaded to hear those words. I loved you too, but I could never face who you were. Malak knew how I felt. Any part of the light that was within me would be extinguished when I killed you. But what good is love? It cannot save me from the sea of blackness I am drowning in. I have betrayed everything I ever believed in. How can I atone for that? Before passing judgment, perhaps Bastila should consider what she can do at this moment in time, other than pointlessly punish herself for her mistakes. I could join you in your battle against the Dark Lord. That alone would not make up for all I have done. Yet it would be a step in the right direction. But how would you be able to trust me? How do you know I wouldn't turn on you when you face Darth Malak? How do you know the dark side wouldn't make me betray you again? Because it is evident Bastila's hunger has waned, and her mind is not as clouded as it was. You play a dangerous game. Are you certain you wish to take this risk? I could end your life and gain Malak's favor with a single stroke of my lightsaber. The dark side, despite its influence, has not entirely consumed Bastila, at least not in Revan's presence. Still, distrust is an effective shield and should be carried always. You are brave, and some would say foolish. But you are also right. The dark side has not wholly consumed me. I cannot raise my blade against you. You will go on to defeat Malak. Of this I have little doubt. He will have gone from being the Sith Lord himself to the savior of our galaxy. And you said you loved me. This may not be the best time to say it, but I love you too, with all my heart. So, there is no more fear of love. After this? No. Nothing could make me feel safer than to be loved by you. You should go. Malak awaits. This isn't over yet. For any of us. I should stay here, though. If we face Malak, I am afraid his dark presence will overwhelm me. It would not be wise to expose myself to such temptation. Bastila is aware of her weakness which is already making her stronger in resisting the pull of the dark side. At the very least, she is aware her exposure to it should be lessened. It is best that she keeps her distance. Instead, she may use her abilities to affect the outcome of the battle raging in space. Yes, that would be for the best. You don't need me to defeat Malak anyway. Now I understand that a true Jedi is a match for any Sith even the Dark Lord himself. I will stay here in this chamber and use my battle meditation to aid the Republic fleet. I am their only hope of destroying the Star Forge and ending the Sith menace. You must go and face Malak, but you have to hurry. Once I turn the battle in the Republic's favor, we won't have much time to escape the Star Forge before it's destroyed. Good luck, my love, and may the Force be with you. The path to Malak leads Revan through an area that appears as a factory of sorts, and unlike any other room he had passed through on his way, this one is devoid of all life. 
There are no apprentices, guards, or battle droids. Revan suspects this is because they are not needed here. You are no match for me here, and this time you will not escape. I have surpassed you in every way and accomplished what you never could. I have unleashed the full potential of this Rakatan factory. You had no idea of the power within this place. Its very walls are alive with dark side energies. And now, my old master. I will let the Star Forge itself destroy you. Revan is strong enough to handle any droid sent his way, so long as he has the strength to hold his blade. But with an unending stream of droids produced by the Star Forge, all it takes is a single slip-up to be overwhelmed. He is unsure if it is his strength that is faltering, or if the droids are adapting and becoming stronger with each subsequent replication. The Dark Lord awaits. Well done, Revan. I was certain the defenses of the Star Forge would destroy you. But I see there is more of your old self in you than I expected. You are stronger than I thought. Stronger than you ever were during your reign as the Dark Lord. I did not think that was possible. I am tempted to try and capture you alive, Revan. Then I could break your will and bind you to me as my apprentice, as I did Bastila. You would be a far greater asset to me than even Bastila and her battle meditation, if I could control you. But is it worth the risk? Perhaps you are too powerful to be my apprentice. I betrayed you when I realized my own strength was greater than yours. In time, you might try to do the same to me. I cannot deny your resilience. You survived my first betrayal thanks to Bastula's interference. You escaped the destruction of Taris, and you escaped me on the Leviathan. You even survived my attempt to destroy you with the Starforge itself. Fate and destiny have conspired to keep you alive despite all my efforts. We have been inexorably pushed to this final confrontation, Revan. I see now that this can only be settled when one of us destroys the other. Once again, we shall face each other in single combat, and the victor will decide the fate of the galaxy. to amaze me, Revan. If only you had been the one to uncover the true power of the Starforge, you might have become truly invincible. But you were a fool. All you saw was an enormous factory. All you ever imagined was an infinite fleet rolling forth to crush the Republic. You are blind, Revan. 
blind and stupid. The Starforge is more than just a space station. In some ways, it is like a living creature. It hungers, and it can feed on the dark side that is within all of us. Look around you, Revan. See the bodies? You should recognize them from the Academy. These are Jedi who fell when I attacked Dantooine. For all intents and purposes, dead. Except for one difference. I have not let them become one with the Force. Instead, I have brought them here. The Starforge corrupts what remains of their power and transfers the Dark Taint to me. You cannot beat me, Revan. Not here on the Starforge. Not when I can draw upon the power of all these Jedi. And once you are beaten, I will do the same to you. You will be trapped in a terrible existence between life and death. Your power feeding me as I conquer the galaxy. <laughs> This path would always have led Malak to destruction. If not by Revan, then by someone else. Still... <coughs> Still spouting the wisdom of the Jedi, I see. Maybe there is more truth in their code than I ever believed. I... I cannot help but wonder, Revan. 
What would have happened had our positions been reversed? What if fate had decreed I would be captured by the Jedi? Could I return to the light as you did? <coughs> if you had not led me down the dark path in the first place, what destiny would I have found? It was Revan who led them down that path, beginning on Dantooine in the ruins of the ancient temple. A part of Revan regrets doing it, leading his closest friend down the path of the dark side. But the choice was Malak's to make. I suppose, I suppose you speak the truth. I alone must accept responsibility for my fate. I wanted to be master of the Sith and ruler of the galaxy. But that destiny was not mine, Revan. <coughs> it might have been yours, perhaps, but never mine. Perhaps things could have been different if their roles were reversed. For better or for worse, the dark side's tendrils retreat. And Revan senses Malak harbors no hatred or malice towards his old master. Instead, his heart is filled with regret and sorrow. All the good deeds of a young man named Alec, a courageous and determined Jedi Knight, will forever be eclipsed by Darth Malak's choices. And in the end, as the darkness takes me, I am nothing. orbital stabilizers everyone pull back I don't want to lose any ships when that space station goes down we did it Vandar the Sith are routed and the Star Forge destroyed but at what cost Admiral where is the Ebon Hawk and her crew the victory party without us, Admiral. I'm sending an honor guard to escort you in. You'll be getting a hero's welcome when we all get home. You have defeated Malik, destroyed the Starforge, and broken the spirit of the Sith. For this, I am proud to present you each with the Cross of Glory, the highest honor the Republic can bestow. From Coruscant to the farthest reaches of the Outer Rims, you will be known as the Saviors of the Republic. On behalf of the Jedi Council, defenders of the galaxy, and sworn protectors of the Republic, I, too, would like to honor you for your actions. We Jedi now have another tale to weave into the grand history of our eternal order. The redemption of Revan, the prodigal knight. 
Wherever you go, you will be recognized as the saviors of the galaxy, the heroes of our age. But you must remain ever vigilant, for one day you may be called upon yet again to defend the glory of the Republic against the tyranny of the dark side. For this is the destiny of the Jedi. After the events on the Starforge, their lives flowed as naturally as they could, pursuing new goals and seeking a new purpose. Revan and Bastila would marry and begin to nurture the bond between them. Revan believed that positive emotions, such as love, helped strengthen the connection to the Force and with other Jedi. He shared his beliefs with the Order. Not surprisingly, the Council harshly rejected his beliefs, with some even vouching for his banishment. This outraged Bastila after all that had happened, but Revan, telling her that arguing with the Council was a battle not worth fighting, convinced her to let the matter go. Thereafter, the two would distance themselves from the Order and settle into an apartment on Coruscant. They would live a happy life, but only for a time. Two years after Malak's defeat, Revan began having nightmares. The same storm in his mind awoke him for a third night in a row. He knew the storm had a meaning. A warning, a vision of the future, a long-forgotten memory. He did not know. Something had happened to him and Malak beyond the outer rim. He could not remember what it was, but he feared it on a deep, primal level. And he knew his nightmares stemmed from there from something far more terrible than the Mandalorians or even the Starforge, and he was convinced it was still out there. The nightmares continued. He could see a storm-covered world he never saw before. The next morning, intent on getting answers, Revan met with Candrus Ordo. He wanted to retrace his steps after the fall of Mandalore the Ultimate. He wanted to know more about his decision to invade the Republic. So he asked Candorus to pull some strings and find out as much as he could about him. Despite Ordo's reluctance, he agreed, and the two parted ways. As he awaited news from Candorus, Revan wanted to find his most trusted ally, Mitra Surik. He reached out through the Force, hoping to sense her, but he was shocked to learn he could not feel her presence at all. He headed to the Jedi Temple, wearing his hooded robes to avoid any unwanted attention, and dug through the Jedi archives, searching for information on Surik. Entering her name into the archive search, he began reading an official report, written anonymously on the Battle of Malachor V. As he read the report, he could see it was far from objective. Its author claimed that Revan and Surik both knew what would happen, and declared them murderers and war criminals. As he read on and learned that Surik returned of her own free will to the Council and was exiled, a voice came from behind, interrupting his search. He could think of few he wanted to encounter less, but there she stood, in her pearl-white robes, as Atris began to mock him for attempting to recapture his lost memories. Revan commented on the poorly written article he had just read, knowing no one other than Atris could have written it, The two entered into a heated discussion about the past. Atris told him how Surik cut herself off from the Force, and was banished for her choices at Malakor V, and that she received just punishment. Atris did not care where Surik was now, and hoped to never see her again. She then told Revan that he was not welcome here, and to go back home to his wife, speaking the word with such venom she nearly choked. Revan merely reminded her of the first line of the Jedi Code, for Atris was never good at hiding her emotions. With a curled lip, Atris spun on her heel and stormed out of the room. He waited until she was out of sight, then sat back down into the chair, letting his true emotions to the surface. 
Sirik had once been one of his closest friends. Revan felt guilty for what happened to her, and a feeling of numbing sorrow engulfed him, as he feared he may never see her again. Cantorus provided valuable information about Mandalore the Ultimate. He noted that some of the Mandalorian clans were gathering on Rekyard, searching for Mandalore's mask. As Revan heard the planet's name, for a brief moment he could see himself and Malak standing on top of a glacier. Revan was also worried about the Mandalorians and their task. Without Mandalore's mask, they could not unite. He had hoped it would take them generations to find it, but as they were already on an organized hunt, he worried they may find it sooner than expected, and if they would once more turn on the Republic once they found it. Candorus told him that that depended on the person who found it first. Rakyad was where they had to go. Revan didn't ask any of his former crew to join him, for their lives finally had some stability and purpose, and he did not want to take that from them. Revan went home late that night, ready to ask Bastila to join him on the journey. But before he could tell her the news, she was confident she had bigger news to share. The moment she said the words, he knew they were true, and how blinded he was by the hunt for his memories, that he could not feel the life growing inside of her. It was too early to tell if it was a boy or a girl, but it did not matter, for it was the happiest day of his life. He told her about his meeting with Candorus. Quickly into their discussion, he could feel Bastila's anger growing. Revan had saved the Republic from the Mandalorians. He saved it from Malak. As far as she was concerned, he had done enough for a lifetime. And even if this evil was growing in the unknown regions, it might not show itself for decades. Bastila told him that by then, they could both be old and grey, and would have lived out a life of happiness, a life they deserved to live. It was tempting to give in, to let it all go and stay, but he couldn't, and he told her he was not doing it for the Republic, not for himself, not for her. They might not live to face this threat, but their children would, and they had to risk their chance at happiness, so their children, their grandchildren, may never have to face the horrors that are to come. With a heavy heart, she agreed with him. Bastila asked when they were leaving, but Revan could not bring her with him. The journey ahead may last for months, longer even. It would mean risking the life of their child, to perhaps be born on some unknown world on the edge of the galaxy. Despite her eagerness to be by his side, Bastila didn't even attempt to argue, for she knew he was right. That was their last night together, and they knew better than to waste it arguing. The next day, Revan, T3, and Candorus traveled to Rekyard, where they succeeded in retracing Revan's footsteps and finding the tomb of Lord Dramath II. Within it, they found Mandalore's mask, as well as the Datacron that reaffirmed the story of how Mandalore the Ultimate was manipulated by a red-skinned Sith. Revan also found the coordinates to a planet named Nathema. He held no memories of it, but he knew it was not the storm-covered world he saw in his dreams. Still, he knew that Nathema was the next step. He gave Candorus Mandalore's mask and tasked him to reunite the Mandalorians and prepare them for whatever threat was coming. If these ancient Sith are indeed planning an invasion of the galaxy, they will first need to pass through Mandalorian space. They had either wanted to get rid of the Mandalorians, or twist their culture and beliefs in hopes of turning them against the Republic. Candorus slowly raised the mask and placed it over his head. Before the two parted ways, Candorus declared himself Mandalore. The Preserver, and began the first steps on his path to restore the honor and glory of his people. There they parted ways. Revan and T3 continued alone to Nathema. The instant the Ebon Hawk dropped out of hyperspace, Revan's mind was overwhelmed with images. He cried out and clutched his head in his hands. One by one, 
the memories put themselves in place. He remembered searching the buildings on Nathema with Malak, looking through the archives, and finding the astrogation charts that took them to the storm-covered world from his nightmares, Drummond Cass. Most importantly, he remembered the horror that was the vicinity of Nathema, the dead planet entirely stripped of the Force. He was brought to his senses as he heard T3 beeping with concern. The Hawk's sensors had picked up another vessel in the system. This vessel had already fired an ion blast towards the ship, shorting out its circuits and engines. Without control, the Ebon Hawk could not resist the gravitational pull of the planet below. As Revan and T3 struggled to get the ship operational again, it entered the planet's atmosphere and slammed into the edge of one of the massive skyscrapers on the Thema, crashing on the empty street below. Scourge was a pure-blood Sith, born in the territory of the reconstituted Sith Empire, hiding in the unknown regions. As a child, he was often threatened with fearsome legends of Jedi, and he grew up believing the Jedi Order would exterminate the Sith if given the chance again. He spent eight years at the Sith Academy, learning the ways of the Force, and was praised both for his strength in the Force and his devotion to Sith philosophy. By the end of his time at the Academy, he was considered to be a master in the art of interrogation. Eventually, he was granted the title of Sith Lord and was ordered to serve at the personal request of Darth Nyrus, one of the Dark Council's most senior members. The Dark Council was composed of twelve members, with each holding the title of Dark Lord of the Sith, and controlled one of the twelve spheres of influence within the Empire. These twelve Sith Lords were the most powerful individuals within the Empire, under the Emperor himself. Of course, their positions were hotly contested, with some holding their title for just a few months, as betrayal and scheming had become common matters amongst the Sith. It appears the Emperor was no exception to this rule of betrayal, as Darth Nyrus and several other members of the Dark Council had conspired to overthrow the Sith Emperor and prevent him from waging war on the Republic. These Sith Lords had discovered his homeworld of Nathema, even after he worked so hard to hide its existence from the galaxy. Nyrus and her co-conspirators understood that the Emperor was a threat to all life in the galaxy, including the Sith, and that the Emperor would go to war against the Republic only to cause death and destruction. She explained to Scourge that the Emperor himself was not loyal to the Empire and did not care about its survival, merely using it to achieve his goals. She wanted Scourge to join the conspiracy. Scourge was unsure, so Nyrus decided to take him to Nathema. As they boarded a private shuttle and departed Drummond Cars, Nyrus told the story of the Emperor to Scourge. Born in 5113 before the Battle of Yavin, he was named Tenebrae on the planet Mandrius. He was the illegitimate son of Mandrius's ruler, Lord Dramoth, and a poor farm woman. Tenebrae's eyes were said to be as black as the void of space, and as an infant, he never cried nor showed emotion. With time, he began to manifest signs of force sensitivity, which raised suspicions in his stepfather that indeed the boy was not his. As he confronted his wife in front of a six-year-old Tenebrae, attacking her in anger after she admitted to her affair with Lord Dramoth, the young Tenebrae merely observed, feeding on his stepfather's anger. He then used his newfound powers to break his stepfather's neck with the sheer force of will. Matters only became worse from that point on, as he tortured his mother for months through the Force, ultimately killing her for betraying their family. By the age of ten, Tenebrae carved a path of destruction across Madrias, his powers continually growing. Hearing about this, Lord Dramoth eventually decided to investigate the matter and see if the boy should be simply killed or turned into one of his many servants. As Lord Dramoth faced his son, 
Tenebrae stripped him of his power, used the Force to drive him insane, and then trapped his Force essence into a holocron to torture him further. Over the years, Tenebrae would take the name and title of Lord Vitiate and become the ruler of Madrias, changing its name to Nathema. Darth Nyrus then told of the ritual that had taken place a century later. Vitiate convinced thousands of Sith Lords to join him in a ritual of Sith magic on Nathema, which resulted in the death of every living thing on the planet, granting him immortality. As they entered the Nathema system, Scourge was immersed in the unfamiliar sensation of the absence of the Force, which only grew stronger as they approached the planet. As they landed on the planet's surface, he became aware of just how strange this world was. The air tasted stale in his mouth. The temperature was neither hot nor cold, but he could feel himself shiver. As Darth Nyrus spoke, her voice was hollow and washed out. She explained that the Force is energy, giving heat to emotions and minds. Here, it was absent. As Scourge glanced up, he noticed something else. The star of the system, the sun, had appeared bright orange as they approached the planet. Now it was pale brown. The Emperor had consumed everything. Life, sound, color. Nothing remained. This was not an act of conquest. There was no domination, honor, or victory in it. It was a blight of the natural order. A vacuum of existence. Scourge had seen enough, and he understood why they wanted to betray the Emperor. As they distanced themselves from the planet, their connection to the Force returned to full strength, and both Scourge and Nyrus could sense a powerful presence nearby. Their senses picked up another ship approaching Nathema. Scourge understood the Force too well to believe in coincidence. There had to be some connection between them and this visitor. Based on their readings, they knew the vessel hadn't spotted them, and they had two choices, to try to make a quick escape or to attack. He awoke in a prison cell, propped up in a cold metal chair. Darth Nidris recognized Revan, and she needed to know how he broke free of the Emperor's control, and what he was doing on Nathema. He'd endure constant torture and interrogation at the hands of Lord Scourge. Revan agreed with Scourge that he'll eventually tell them everything, but he'd make them work for it. Even when drugged, he still drew on the Force to endure the torment. Scourge quickly understood that pushing the boundaries of torture would achieve little and likely only result in death. Using other methods of persuasion, discussion, and an exchange of information, Scourge made progress, albeit slowly. It would take him three years to slowly extract everything Revan knew. Nyrus had quickly lost interest in the prisoner, but Scourge became obsessed with him, with his strength, his connection to the Force. Over the span of three years, the two got to know each other quite well. The two gradually traded information to obtain the other's secrets. Eventually, Scourge shared his frustrations about Darth Nyrus not taking any action against the Emperor. Three years ago, he agreed to take part in the conspiracy, but nothing changed since then. Revan stated that it is the nature of the dark side that prevents them from acting. To take down the Emperor, many Sith would need to be sacrificed for the greater good. Scourge could never imagine that happening. To see Sith such as Darth Nyrus sacrificing their own lives for the sake of others, for the sake of change. An individual like Revan was different. Before, Scourge would have laughed at Revan's foolishness to risk his own well-being in venturing to Nathema for the sake of protecting his beloved Republic. Revan had no clue what was waiting in the dark, and now he became a prisoner as a result. But at least he acted he made the effort to change the future, to take a risk. Darth Nyrus and the others, on the other hand, still did nothing. And there, Revan saw an opportunity to manipulate his captor 
Revan lied to Scourge that he had a vision of his future, of freedom. Scourge did not believe him, but he was mostly unsure, for he had no experience or knowledge about Force visions. Sith, like Scourge, used the Force as a weapon and would never let themselves become open to its guidance and direction. Brevin refused to tell Scourge the details. This way, Scourge would be thinking about his vision, about Revan, and hopefully he'd mistake a thought, a dream, for a vision of his own, telling him to side with his prisoner. Frustrated, Scourge left him in the isolation of his cell as punishment. For most prisoners, isolation would have been effective torture, but for Revan, it gave him time to attempt to reach out to Bastila, to at least let her know that he was still alive. He let the force flow through him, focusing on the face of the woman he loved. But suddenly, Bastila's face faded from his mind and was replaced with another, one whom Revan believed to be beyond reach. It only lasted for a second, but the meaning of this vision was abundantly clear. She was coming to save him. After the Ebon Hawk crashed on Athema, T3 checked on Revan and ensured he was still alive. As he detected strangers approaching, T3 had no option left but to hide. Whether through circumstance or through their inability to sense fluctuations in the Force, they neglected to notice T3M4. As these two strangers took Revan and departed, T3 followed his hidden programming Bastila had implanted, directing him to return to her should he and Revan be separated, and to not tell anyone what happened until he found her. T3 spent the next four months scouring the deserted city on the Thema, gathering scrap, salvage, and other necessary parts. In this time, his scanners picked up no refugees, looters, animals, insects, or even plants. A year later, T3 managed to make the Ebon Hawk airborne again, even though the parts only made the hyperdrive functional at minimal efficiency. But it was enough for the Hawk to begin its slow journey back to Republic Space, which would take years. Once he reached Republic Space, T3 would learn that since the time they left the known galaxy, Yet another war was started by the remnants of the Sith left after Malak's defeat. Not knowing what had happened, T3 was unable to find Bastila. He didn't know if she was even alive, so he was unable to complete his mission. Instead, his journey would intertwine with the path of another very unique individual. Kreia was Revan's former master, the Jedi Council had blamed her for Revan's fall to the dark side, along with the fact that her teachings only bred failures. As a result, she was cast out of the Order, and she followed her own destiny. With time, she would learn that Revan had gone into the Unknown Regions, and she feared for her former pupil that he had indeed fallen to the dark side and lost his way. Deciding to retrace his steps, hoping to find him, Kreia finds the Treus Academy and the teachings of the ancient Sith. As she studied the scriptures through the Force, the writings would tell her that a sane mind could never grasp the truth of the universe, hidden in plain sight, that the Force manipulates all life it touches, and that one's destiny is never truly theirs, in their own hands. Instead, this destiny is dictated by the Force, and any being connected to it is enslaved by it, as the Force always seeks balance, regardless of the consequences needed to achieve it, whether it be life and growth, or death and destruction. The Force, it seemed, was a relentless master who enslaved all beings it touched. Kreia vowed to free the universe of its shackles by destroying the Force. Malachor V was proof that it could be done. It was a wound in the Force, and if something can be wounded, it can be killed. Taking on the mantle of Darth Treya, she united the scattered remnants of the Sith left after Darth Malak's defeat, forming the Sith Triumvirate with Darth Sion and Darth Nihilus. 
United, the Sith would take revenge on the Jedi, who had condemned Kreia and her teachings, while she looked for ways to set her main goal of killing the Force in motion. It appears Darth Revan's teachings were correct after all, in saying that any Sith Master who takes on more than a single apprentice is a fool. There are dark places in the galaxy where few tread, ancient centers of learning, of knowledge, but I did not walk alone. To be united by hatred is a fragile alliance at best. My will was not law. There were disagreements, ambition, and hunger for power. There are techniques within the Force against which there is no defense. Now exiled by the Sith, as she had been by the Jedi, Darth Treya becomes Kreia once more. After yet another betrayal, she was more determined than ever to take revenge on all who had wronged her, and to destroy the Force. Her journey would lead her to find T3 and the Ebon Hawk. Around this time, the Sith would start their hunt for Surik, for killing her would mark their victory. As Surik returned to the known galaxy, she was unaware of what had happened, and she would be captured, but Kreia would succeed in rescuing her from the Sith. For Surik was an instrumental tool through which Kreia's plans could be achieved, not for her ties to Revan, but the wound in the Force she carried, a wound which was formed through her own instinctive choice. Kreia hoped to use this wound to achieve her own goals. Find what you're looking for amongst the dead. So she inserted herself as her teacher, hoping to train her in the way she believed was best. T3 traveled with them, but he still would not tell anyone of what happened to Revan, as per Bastila's instructions, until he found her. Instead, he stood by Surik's side, aiding her in the battle against the Sith remnants, which sought to purge the galaxy of Jedi. Kreia would aid and manipulate Serik to achieve many of her plans. Her final goal was to kill the Force, and to achieve it, she had to bring Serik to Malachor V, in hopes that if she fell there, the Force wound surrounding her would resonate off the wound of Malachor, and build an endless echo that would spread continuously, ripping the fabric of the Force open, until it destroyed the Force everywhere in the universe. At that moment, before their final confrontation, Kreia answered all of Surik's questions and revealed the truth. It is said that the Force has a will. It has a destiny for us all. I wield it, but it uses us all, and that is abhorrent to me, because I hate the Force. I hate that it seems to have a will, that it would control us to achieve some measure of balance when countless lives are lost. But in you, I see the potential to see the Force die, to turn away from its will, and that is what pleases me. You are beautiful to me, Exile. A dead spot in the Force, an emptiness in which its will might be denied. From the moment you awoke, I have used you. I have used you so that you might become strong, stronger than I. I used your death to deceive the Sith, to make them believe they had won, so they would turn on each other. I used you to keep the lords of the Sith from condemning the galaxy to death with their power unchecked. 
I used you to lure them to Telos, where they could be at last fought and killed. I used you to reveal Atrus's corruption so that her teaching could be ended before it began. I used you to gather the Jedi so they could be destroyed, and I used you to make those who wounded me reveal themselves so they could be killed by the Republic. But even though Serik was a tool to achieve her plans, Kreia did not treat her only as a means to an end. She treated her as a student, sharing her wisdom wherever she could, making her stronger. Kreia used the Force to intimidate and dominate the minds of Surik's allies, ensuring they would not get in the way. One of these allies included Mandalore the Preserver, who could not be intimidated. But she would find a way to manipulate even him. What do you want? Is all in readiness? <laughs> it is. Like I promised. Why? You want to back out now? My only concerns are for the one you escort to Onderon, Mandalorian. Would you do any less for one of your clan? Don't pretend to understand us. We Mandalorians are a breed apart. If by apart you mean scattered, broken, and lost, then yes, you are correct. Not for long. Soon the Mandalorians will be strong again, united as one clan under one banner. Mine. Ah, yes. The Great Crusade. After the first one was ended by Revan and the Jedi, such a defeat was merciful, an echo of the end, when your ships were in flames, crushed in the grip of Malachor V. But I do not need to remind you of such things. The future is always in motion. It is a difficult thing to see. Perhaps there will be no New Age Mandalore, no great Mandalorian crusade. Perhaps your people fought their last battle at Malachor V, and you have been dying ever since, a quiet death that will last centuries. And perhaps all that remains will be what I see before me. A man wounded by a Jedi, encased in a Mandalorian shell, hunted by the thought of being the last of the Mandalorians. You've got some guts talking to me like that. You think your age or your Jedi whelp are going to keep you safe from me? No, Mandalore. You are wrong. I hope that it is you who will keep the one I travel with safe. You are loyal, and you have served many masters, even when they abandoned you. Do you wonder where he wanders now, Mandalore? Why he gave you your orders, then abandoned you at the edge of the galaxy? How do you know that? I know many things, and I can answer the question that burns within your shell, Mandalore. But there is a price. You must keep the one I travel with safe. She is important to me, more important than anything. Show the same loyalty you have shown in the past, Mandalore. If there is a Mandalorian crusade, let it be for something that will carry your people's memory into the future. So when the time comes when there are no more Mandalorians, then at least their honor will remain. The one I travel with has walked your same path. And I ask that when the end comes, that you remember that kinship, even if it seems there is nothing else left. Forget the Jedi. Keep your eyes on her. Despite her manipulations of Surik's allies, Kreia never once swayed her from her instinctive choices, from who she was meant to be. She taught Surik much about the brutal reality of the world, about consequences that reverberate through the Force, in an attempt to make her as powerful as she could be. Manipulation is done through propelling events or selected ones into motion. It is done through teaching, through example, and through conviction. And the greatest of victories are not manipulations at all, but simply awakening others to the truth of what you believe, of hearing it echoed around you in life. But let us be silent. Words and thoughts are distractions. Feel this moment for as long as it will last. Feel life as it is, with the crude matter stripped away. She did so because, in the end, it matters not what the final outcome would be. Either way, Kreia would win. If Surik fell here, at Malachor V, the Force would be destroyed. And if she survived and killed Kreia, she would prove that she was prepared for the next step in her journey. She knew that she trained Surik well the moment the final blow was struck. For Surik did what needed to be done, even if it meant killing a master whom she respected and cared for and whom she did not want to kill, to save the galaxy. 
Her training was complete. It is done. At last, it is done. You are greater than any I have ever trained. By killing me here, you have rewarded me more than you can possibly know. Many things do I see as I gaze here from the heart of Malachor. This place channels such energies. If it matters to you at this last moment, I shall look into the future and tell you of what I see. It is my last gift to you, from one exile to another. With the Jedi Order destroyed, it appeared there was no future for the Jedi. Yet those who followed Surik would be those who would build it. They were the lost Jedi, you know. The true Jedi upon which the future will be built. They simply needed a leader and a teacher. The blinded seer whom she redeemed from darkness. The Jedi whom she inspired to change the Republic. The Huntress who cast aside her past to step into the future. The Fool. Even Candorous, Mandalore the Preserver, who aided Surik. A Mandalorian who helped save the Republic once again. Many battles does that one have left in him, as Revan intended. A general needs an army as he needs those he trusts. And Candorus is a loyal beast, no matter how much he is broken upon Revan's will. But you know this. Kreia told Surik of each of their futures, of their lives and deaths. This was her last gift, to see the lives of those she held close, to know how they would live, grow, and how they would die, for she would not be there to see it. Greya shared with Surik what she discovered here in the depths of the Treus Academy, of the empire that lurks in the dark. It paved the way to Korriban, you know, the remnants here. And because Malachor, like Korriban, is on the fringes of the ancient Sith Empire, where the Sith wait for us in the dark, the Sith is a belief. And its empire, the true Sith Empire, rules elsewhere. And Revan knew that the true war is not against the Republic. It waits for us beyond the Outer Rim, and he has gone to fight it in his own way. And like you, he knew he must leave all loves behind as well, no matter how deeply one cares for them. Because such attachments are not the way of the Jedi, and they would only bring doom to them both in the dark places where he now walks. It would have helped had he made her understand, but she was always strong-willed, that one, and did not understand war as Revan did. But he will need warriors, Sith and Jedi, any who can be sent after him into the depths of space, for any who know the way. Perhaps you shall go there with him and do battle at the end of all things. Instead, I remained here and now show others the way. The small one, who waits for you outside this place? I sense it has one last journey for you. You must go where Revan did, into the unknown regions, where the Sith, the true Sith, wait in the dark for the great war that comes. Kreia never told Sirik of her future. From the heart of Malachor, she could see the future of everything, of the Jedi, the Sith, the Mandalorians, and even the Republic. Perhaps the wound that Surik carried still concealed her future from Kreia's eyes. But perhaps it's possible she could see Revan and his future, where he walked now, where he was imprisoned, waiting for the exile to come. If she did, she would know better than to reveal it. Perhaps, if Surik saw the future, she may try to resist, to change what is to come. With the Republic saved once more and the Sith remnants defeated, Surik and T3 set off to find Bastila. Bastila would have gladly stood up against the Sith Triumvirate if Revan were at her side, but she placed her son as her priority, protecting him from yet another war that engulfed the galaxy, so she went into hiding. When Surik and T3 found her, Bastila was eager to learn of any trace of Revan. T3 told of what happened on Nathema, how he spent months repairing the ship, and how it took him years to reach Republic space. 
D3 shared none of this with Surik before this very moment, keeping his silence as Bastila instructed. But Bastila was surprised to hear that T3 chose to stay with Surik rather than continue his search. It seems T3 had put the exile's mission above his loyalty to Revan and chose the safety of the galaxy over that of his master. Despite his current predicament, Bastila believed Revan would have been proud of T3's choice. T3 finished his tale, and Surik knew Nathema was the next destination. Bastila stood up and insisted that she go with Surik, but Surik reminded her that nothing has changed since Revan left. Their son still needed her. Surik asked Bastila if she was prepared to leave him behind. Of course not, she spat, almost adding, I'll bring him with me. But as quickly as the thought formed in her mind, she realized how reckless that would be. If she followed in Revan's footsteps, it would be a betrayal of the very principles that had sent him on his journey in the first place. She missed him, and she felt helpless, useless, forced to do nothing but wait. And with each day, the burden grew heavier. Surik told her that they all have their burdens to carry on the path ahead, and that was hers. Surik promised to do everything in her power to find Revan and to bring him back. Before they departed, Bastila stopped them to give Surik two items. The first was a hollow recording she had made of their son's last birthday celebration. The second was a heavy object wrapped in black cloth. With Bastila's permission, Surik unwrapped it and stood wide-eyed as she observed Revan's mask, thinking it was lost when he was captured by the Jedi strike team. Bastila confessed that she took it before she brought him to the Order. She did not know why she felt the urge to do it. Perhaps even then she sensed their fates were intertwined. She kept the mask hidden from both him and the Jedi Order. It symbolized a relic of his dark past, and Bastila feared it might trigger something inside him, rekindle some spark of the dark side. But now she understood that she was wrong. She was selfish, and his dark past was a part of him. Bastila hoped the mask might reawaken crucial memories that will bring him to safety. But what if it does more than that? Surik added. What if it awakens the dark side within him? Bastila responded defiantly that she did not care, not if that power helped to bring him home. Blasphemous words for Jedi. She expected Surik to throw the mask to the ground in disgust. Instead, without a word, Surik simply rewrapped it in the cloth and tucked it away beneath her robes. Surik didn't know what to expect when the Ebon Hawk dropped out of hyperspace and began its approach to Nathema. T3 informed her of the status on the planet, but he was a droid and he could not sense the Force. This also meant he could not notice its absence. As the ship drew closer, she was reminded of Malachor V and the instantaneous and colossal loss of life she had witnessed there. At first, she assumed a similar tragedy happened here, but as they went to explore the empty buildings in search of answers, this didn't appear to be the case. She felt something was wrong with this world, but she could not quite understand it. She still carried the wound in the Force with her, a wound that would never heal. But here, the Force was simply gone. It could be that her wound protected her somewhat from the effects of this place, but with time, the sense of unease kept growing. They set out to find archives or records that would provide more information. With each step, the unease grew, as if a nameless, faceless, invisible creature was stalking them. Once they found the archives, Surik instructed T3 to collect as much relevant data from it as possible, so they may leave this place at once. Up until that moment, she was in motion, distracted by her search, ignoring the signs that something was obviously wrong, ignoring the scattered clothing, the silence, ignoring the emptiness of her voice as she spoke to T3. But now, as she waited for him to finish his task... She began feeling the full weight of this wretched place. 
nature abhors a vacuum. The emptiness around her was pulling at her very existence, desperate to fill itself with something. And right now the only thing it could draw on was her presence, her energy. It wants to devour me, mind and spirit, annihilate every trace of my existence. She could feel the void pressing in on her from all sides. For a moment, she felt as if she would become undone, her entire body unraveling, ripping into subatomic particles and scattering across the entire surface of Nathema. She screamed at the void in her mind, resisting. She was more than just a collection of random matter and particles. She was a living being who would not allow herself to be taken. The affirmation pushed the void back for a moment, but it still clung to her, its tendrils pulling in closer. It was only a matter of time before she lost her sanity. Fortunately, T3 beeped triumphantly and retreated from the archives. Surik had no time to listen to what he discovered. She would examine the data later. She rushed back to the ship. Unaware, she must have started running at some point. The instant T3 caught up and boarded the Hawk, the ship took off. Surik kept the ship at full speed until they reached the edge of the solar system. Only once there were millions of kilometers between her and Nathema was she comfortable enough to slow down. With T3's help to decrypt the data, Surik spent several days analyzing the information, stopping neither to sleep or eat. Instead, she drew on the force to replenish her as she pushed on. With T3's exceptional slicing skills, she poured through encrypted and confidential information from Nathema. She learned everything about who Vishiat was and what he did. She also isolated the planet to which he took his followers, Dromund Kaas. He blamed the destruction of Nathema on the Jedi, the Republic, and took the younger generations to Drummond Kaas to build his new empire. Relying on her skill and intellect, with T3 as backup, Surik infiltrated the society that lived on Drummond Kaas. T3 had recorded Scourge's face as he was taking Revan away. It was a simple matter to get his attention once she started asking around. As Scourge observed her battle his troops, he understood that Revan was not lying about his vision. He had not believed it at first, but he knew there was no other reason a Jedi would come to Drummond Kaas. He was intrigued by her. Unlike any Force user he saw, he watched Surik draw on the Force, and yet not use her emotions as fuel, or take pleasure or strength in the deaths of her enemies. Engaging in combat with her would be a true test of his skill, but he did no such thing, for he saw in Surik more than a simple Jedi, but a tool through which the Emperor could be stopped. Revan was telling the truth, and rescue had come to grant him his freedom. Revan had shared other visions with Scourge, one of them marking the Emperor's fall. Scourge wondered if that vision too would become reality. He agreed to help Surik free Revan to unite against a common foe. He told her everything about the Emperor's plans. He was a threat to every living thing in the galaxy. Deep inside, Scourge approved of her distrust. If she trusted an enemy she just met so easily, he would have questioned her judgment. He provided physical proof, data of Darth Nyris and members of the Dark Council plotting to overthrow the Emperor. And even without proof, Surik saw Nathema and the destruction the Emperor caused there. It was not difficult to believe that Scourge, knowing the same thing, would want to eliminate him. Revan was held deep in Darth Nyrus' stronghold. Even with combined efforts, Scourge and Surik could not break him out. They needed distraction. For this, Scourge was bold enough to approach the Emperor. He would betray Darth Nyrus and reveal her conspiracy. As he stepped inside the throne room, the throne turned to face Scourge. He laid eyes on the Emperor for the first time in his life. Scourge carefully thought of each step he took as he walked forward, the most important steps of his life, and potentially his last, kneeling before the Emperor until he was given permission to rise. The stories were true, and the Emperor's eyes were as black as the void itself. 
with a dry mouth and words barely leaving his lips. Scourge began speaking about how he discovered the information of Darth Nyrus's betrayal. With each reply from the Emperor, Scourge began to notice something strange about his voice. A grim theory passed through his mind. Was it possible that all the life he had consumed on Nathema still existed in some form within him? When he spoke, it sounded as if other, more distant voices spoke with his. Could it be he imprisoned their spirits within his physical form, slowly feeding on them over a thousand years, millions still living within him? This was not the time to ponder such thoughts. Scourge pushed them away. He needed focus. One wrong word, and the Emperor may see through his scheme. Once he finished explaining Nyrus's betrayal, the Emperor stated that these were serious accusations, given her position as a member of the Dark Council, even with evidence. Scourge added that he would be willing to stake his life on them. The Emperor simply confirmed that he already has. Scourge felt a shiver go down his spine. The Emperor told Scourge that he will be rewarded for his actions, if he is right. If not, he will suffer a fate more terrible than anything he can imagine. As he spoke, the dark circles of his eyes swelled into a swirling red mist, Scourge cried out in anguish as the Emperor's mind brushed against his. He collapsed to the floor, shaking like a child. As the Imperial Guard purged Nyrus' stronghold, killing anyone connected to her, Scourge and Surik managed to reach Revan. The moment she saw him, her face broke into a wide grin. She rushed to embrace him after such a long time they spent apart. And after a moment, she broke her brace, as Revan noticed her nose had crinkled up. A really long time apart, Revan added. Surik quickly explained that she worked with Scourge to break him out. She handed Revan the items Bastila had sent, still wrapped in cloth. Disregarding the items, his heart rushed at the mention of his family. They were both well and safe. He then unwrapped the cloth to reveal the mask he had worn during the Mandalorian Wars. The moment his eyes locked on it, countless images flooded his mind. Years of forgotten people, places, and events. It was too much for his mind to bear as it went into sensory overload. His body went limp. Surik checked his pulse. He was still alive as his eyelids fluttered madly. Nyris made her way towards the cell block. Slowly, now aware of Scourge's betrayal, the Imperial Guard would make sure she never leaves the stronghold alive. But she would at least be satisfied once she ensured Scourge and his allies shared her fate. An old and withered Sith in appearance, Nyrus was as swift and powerful as a true Sith warrior in their prime. Scourge and Surik struggled against her assault through lightsaber combat, and once she used the force against them, they would find themselves dazed on the ground. The air around Nyrus began to crackle as she gathered power to deliver the killing blow to all her enemies. Still dazed from her attack, Scourge could sense the energy building within her, and he knew there was nothing he could do to stop it. She was too powerful, her command of the dark side too strong. She declared herself as Darth Nyrus, Lord of the Sith, and the bringer of their doom. The lightning leapt from her fingertips, but it would find a home in the hands of another. As Revan stepped out from the cell, his face hidden behind the mask, the hood of his robe covering his head. With both hands held in front of him, his thumbs touching, Revan drew the bolts of lightning into his waiting grasp absorbing their power, he responded to her triumphant claim. I am Revan Reborn, and before me, you are nothing. Nyrus's eyes went wide as Revan unleashed her own attack against her. She tried to block it with a force barrier, but it was a futile attempt as the barrier dissolved instantly and her body was engulfed in lightning 
intense heat rising, consuming her and leaving only a pile of charred ash. Scourge slowly climbed to his feet. As he came to his senses, he knew he made the right choice. If anyone had the strength to stop the Emperor, it was Revan. They escaped Nyrus' stronghold, hiding in a cave away from Cast City. Scourge left to learn precisely what happened as a result of the attack, and Surik took the chance to instruct T3 to play the Holovid Bastila had sent. She was somewhat worried that Revan still hadn't taken off his mask, but the moment he saw Bastila and his son in the Holovid, the mask was placed on the ground, as good as forgotten. They hadn't discussed names before he left, Bastila said, but she named their son Vayna. Revan smiled, realizing it was an anagram of his own name. She wanted Vayna to know who his father was, and to understand that Revan was a part of him. A tear rolled down his face as he watched, and Surik quietly retreated to the back of the cave to give him some privacy. Surik was not jealous of Bastila. She loved Revan too, but in a different way, and regarded him with admiration and devotion. She was aware that he and Bastila shared a deeper connection, but she couldn't help but feel that her reunion with Revan had been preempted by a hollow it. As it ended, Revan joined her in the back of the cave and thanked her for everything. Atris had told him she was cut off from the Force, but now he sensed much of its power within her. He found Surik's path to be one he would not dare to tread, and that he owed her everything. She replied that without his teaching, she would not have become who she is now, and in the end, the two settled to call it even. Revan invited her to watch the holobit of Bastila and his son, as it would mean more to watch it with a friend. Revan probably continued re-watching the holobit a hundred times, as it still played when Scourge returned. When Revan refused to share the Holovid's details with Scourge, Scourge took it as a reminder that they were allies, not friends. Scourge preferred it that way. Friends were a liability for a Sith Lord. Scourge shared his findings. The proof Scourge delivered to the Emperor pointed only at five members of the Dark Council. But the Emperor purged the entire Dark Council. He eliminated twelve of the strongest individuals in the Empire. News of the massacre spread quickly, resulting in chaos, thousands fleeing for their lives, fearing that the Sith were on the brink of a civil war. To control the chaos, the Emperor placed the entire planet under quarantine. Many of his memories returned, and Revan knew the Emperor, and believed he would likely use the deaths of the Council as an excuse to rally the will of his people. He could simply claim these Dark Council members were spies of the Republic. He could claim the Sith Empire has been rediscovered, and that the only hope of survival was to strike first. But the Emperor would only do this once order was restored. It would take a few days, which meant their window of opportunity was closing. With the city still on high alert, they would wait for the morning to act. Though, as expected, none of the three got any sleep that night. Scourge attempted to get some rest, to put his mind at ease. But this was not the way of the dark side. It was all about activity, action, not calm contemplation. His attempt at meditation would calm his thoughts, and eventually grant him a dream of horror, of failure their bodies broken and scattered on the floor of the Citadel's throne room. As his mind snapped to full alert, Scourge glanced around the cave. Surik sat in a cross-legged pose, meditating, while Revan hunched forward, watching the holovid. He asked to speak to Revan. Revan allowed it, and Scourge took a seat beside him, and inquired more about Force visions. They were complicated, Revan said. Visions could mean anything, and they show only one of many possible outcomes. Then what is their purpose? Scourge asked. If they are so imprecise, Revan explained that they give focus, guidance, something to strive for, or something to prevent. 
Worried his vision might come to fruition, Scourge asked Revan what will happen if they fail. That is a possibility, Revan admitted, but even if they fail, they will buy time for others. The Emperor will wonder how Revan freed himself. He will fear he is not yet strong enough. It might buy a few years, decades, enough time for someone else to stop him. Revan told him that the Force always strives for balance. The Emperor is an agent of darkness and destruction. It is inevitable that an agent of light will one day rise to oppose him. It may be Revan, it may be that Revan's role in this is to succeed or to fail. Whatever the outcome, he embraces that fate. Scourge, shaking his head, claimed that Revan might be as mad as the Emperor, and that he has no intention of dying tomorrow. Although not Force users, the Emperor's guards were connected to their ruler, allowing them to draw on the dark side for strength. They were not easily defeated, but in the end, the Four pushed through to the Emperor's throne room, with T3 sealing the door, locking them in with their target and a handful of guards. While Surik and Scourge handled them, Revan engaged the Emperor, sensing a familiar attack, the one used on him and Malak, an attempt to dominate his mind. Revan knew he couldn't reach the Emperor in time. Instead, he allowed both sides of the Force, light and dark, to flow through him, unleashing the Force in its purest form. Likely for the first time in a thousand years, the Emperor was brought to one knee. He let out a primal hiss of hate, sending shivers down Revan's spine and preparing for another attack. Sensing a build-up of energy around the Emperor, Revan prepared to block it, but as the air between them crackled, he would quickly learn that he didn't stand a chance against it. He attempted to absorb the energy, as he had Nyrus's lightning, but it was too much to take, and his body was engulfed in agony as electricity coursed through him. His skin began to boil and blister, the flesh of his face melting and beginning to stick to the superheated metal of his mask, as the Emperor poured more power into him. Through this haze of agony, from the corner of his eye, Revan could see T3M4 rushing to his aid, letting loose his built-in flamethrower, bathing the Emperor in flames. Revan collapsed to the ground, burned but still alive, the hilt of his extinguished blade lying on the floor. Barely able to raise his head, Revan looked at the Emperor, only to see him turn on the brave Astromech. A tremor rippled through the air as the Emperor unleashed the full power of the Force. Revan screamed as circuits and parts of his companion scattered into tiny fragments. The Emperor once more regained his composure and took calm, purposeful steps towards his victim. He bent down, picking up the Jedi's fallen weapon and ignited the blade. Revan attempted to heal his wounds through the Force, but the process was slow. He was powerless. As his own blade descended, another materialized in front of it, blocking the attack and knocking the blade out of its grasp. The Emperor was taken aback for a moment, surprised to see Surik charge at him, her blade returning to her. Scourge rushed after her, and he knew she made a critical mistake. The Emperor's attention was focused entirely on Revan. Had she directed her blade at his body, she could have killed him. Instead, her instinct to protect her friend overrode the desire to kill their enemy. A mistake that weighed a galaxy. As Scourge reached them, Surik stood between the Emperor and Revan, who now managed to stand up again. The Emperor shared his disappointment in Scourge. He had expected better from him. Revan declared that Scourge saw the truth, and the Emperor had no chance against all three. United, they are stronger than even him. Time stops. Scourge observes the universe, frozen in place. Fate and destiny will forever be altered in the seconds ahead. Within this moment, the Force grants Scourge an insight into the future. 
several futures. In some, the Emperor is no more. In others, the entire galaxy has become a wasteland. He observes Revan's triumph and defeat in the throne room, and variations of his own life and death played over and over in every shape and form in a split second. But there's no way to know which one was most likely to come true. What choice can he make to alter the outcome? Revan said visions could guide him, but to Scourge, this moment only brought more confusion. The moment passes. Time continues moving forward, not yet returned to its natural state. Revan and Surik slowly step forward, ready to initiate the final confrontation. There, in a sudden moment of clarity, Scourge sees victory. He sees the Emperor's death at the hands of a powerful Jedi Knight. But this Jedi is neither Surik nor Revan. He knows what he has to do. He would not make the same mistake Surik made. A flicker in the consciousness of the Force as the universe returns to full speed. Scourge's blade ignites between Surik's shoulder blades, killing her before her body even hits the floor. Revan's head snaps to the side, shock and horror emanating even through his mask. This distraction gave the Emperor the opportunity he needed. He unleashes a blast of lightning into Revan's chest, knocking him unconscious to the ground. Explain yourself, the Emperor ordered. Scourge quickly explains that the two Jedi had been working with Nyrus. He pretended to be their ally, to bring them before the Emperor, for he alone had the power to destroy them. The Emperor observed Scourge, his cold expression hiding whatever thoughts roamed through his mind. Scourge must finish what he started, the Emperor said. Without hesitation, Scourge walks over to Revan and rips off his mask to reveal his face. Still unconscious, Revan's body was in shock from the Emperor's attack. The mask had burned deep into his cheeks and forehead. Without medical attention, he would die soon anyway. The Sith Lord raised his lightsaber, intent on delivering the killing blow. But his blade suddenly stopped midair, as if an invisible grip had seized his wrist. Scourge passed the test, and the Emperor commanded him to put away his blade. Revan can still be of use to him, he added. Scourge knew better than to ask how, for any indication of worry for the Jedi may send the wrong message. To sell his lie, he had to make it appear that this was all the result of selfish ambition. He boldly told the Emperor to remember this when he selects the members for his new Dark Council. The Emperor smiled into an eerie grin, adding that he shall receive his just reward. Scourge considered the events that transpired, and felt no guilt or remorse over what he had done. A Jedi could never have chosen this path. He could see that they would have failed, and it would make no sense to throw his life away with theirs. Revan had been right in his assessment of the Emperor. This attack made the Emperor pause his plans to invade the Republic. His attention now turned inward, fearing for his safety and focusing on restoring stability and control over Drummond Kaas and the other worlds he ruled. The Dark Council had to be rebuilt. It would take time, several decades, maybe longer, before the Emperor feels comfortable enough to revisit the idea of invading the Republic. Scourge's reward for his actions was an agonizing ritual that granted him eternal life. Despite the agony he constantly felt as a result of the ritual, Scourge would serve faithfully by the Emperor's side, waiting for an opportunity for the foundations of his vision to emerge from the mists of time. Revan could feel the Emperor feeding on him, drawing on his power to sate his endless hunger. Trapped in a suspended cage of shimmering energy, he now hovers at some point between life and death. His body is in stasis, preserved and protected from even time itself. 
but his consciousness is fully aware. The unmistakable darkness of the Emperor sifts through his mind, digging for answers. How strong was the Republic, the Jedi? How much did they know about the Sith? So many questions. The Emperor wants answers, but Revan will not surrender them easily. The Emperor assigned his fear-wielding Sith Lords, known as the Dread Masters, to torment his mind, hoping to twist him to the dark side and make him serve the Emperor. The only way to escape this endless suffering was to separate himself from the pain, focusing his mind entirely on the Force. Physically, he was shackled, but mentally he remained strong enough to wage war in his mind, guarding his secrets for however long it takes, and he knew something the Emperor did not. This connection flowed both ways. In brief moments when the Emperor was distracted, Revan succeeded in subverting their relationship by planting seeds in his thoughts. He constantly pushed the Emperor's caution and patience, augmenting his irrational fear of death. Whenever possible, he reinforced the thought that war against the Republic was reckless and dangerous for him personally. It's impossible to know what would have happened had Scourge not betrayed them. Revan chose not to dwell on it. Instead, he clung to certainty, the present. However long his body survived in this state, he could fight the Emperor. If he could delay him for fifty years, Bastila could live out her days in peace, a hundred, and his son could live his life through to the end, never knowing the horrors Revan had to face. Whenever his thoughts turned to them, his will grew stronger. He tried to reach out, offering comfort and strength from the other side of the galaxy. He didn't know if they ever felt him, but he liked to imagine that they did. And even if not, they gave him strength. He was fighting for their future. And it was a fight he intended to win. Through the times that lie ahead, Revan's most trusted general and friend never abandoned him. When the Jedi, the exile, Mitra Surik died, she had not become one with the Force. Loyal to the end, her spirit stayed with Revan, an invisible presence looming just outside his cell. She couldn't reach into his mind, couldn't talk to him. Whatever arcane Sith sorcery bound Revan to his cell made it impossible. Revan was not even aware of her presence, but even though she could not communicate with him, she offered aid and support. Her power trickled through the energy barrier that surrounded him. She was a lifeline he could cling to in the dark ocean of his imprisonment. Revan's strength faded as the Emperor fed on him, but Surik allowed Revan to feed on her essence, bolstering his efforts to continue his never-ending battle. With Surik's help, Revan succeeded in delaying the Emperor for many years, Bastila would live to see her hair turn grey, and to hear her grandchildren ask why that is so. Each year, on their anniversary, Bastila's son, Vayner, and his family would visit, for they knew it was a difficult time for her. Both Bastila and Vayner thought of Revan often. Vayner wondered what Revan would say to him, especially since he never joined the Jedi Order. His mother was certain Revan would be proud regardless of that fact. He wondered if Revan was still alive. Bastila was unsure. If he was, he would have come back. And yet there are times when she thinks she can feel his presence, as if he's reaching out from some place far away. She missed him every day of her life, but she never once regretted letting him depart that day. Bastila knew Whatever Revan went to face, whatever he had to do, he succeeded. For the two of them, sitting in her living room, talking, are proof of it. She smiled and placed her wrinkled hands on her son's face. In the past fifty years, they did not face fear or hardships of war. And for that, 
she was grateful. As he headed off into the guest room to check on his wife and children, Bastila told him she'll stay behind and lay down for a bit. She closed her eyes and quickly drifted into sleep. And, as always, she would dream of Revan. Bastila, Vena, his children and his grandchildren would all live their lives in peace, always carrying Revan's legacy into the future. The era of peace would end centuries after Revan's capture, in the time when his descendant, Satil Shan, lived, who would play an instrumental role in picking up the pieces, the legacy, and continuing what Revan started. And only through her hands will Revan's story be completed. Access secondary data cron layer. A new era begins. The Sith Empire would invade the Republic in 3681, beginning the Great Galactic War. Revan succeeded in delaying the Sith Empire's invasion for roughly two and a half centuries. Locked in his timeless prison, he still resisted the Emperor, his mind alert and aware, but his body preserved within his cell. But even he knew his efforts could not be successful forever. With the beginning of the Great Galactic War in 3681, it dragged on for almost three decades, and even within this time, Revan would not give up on his efforts to manipulate the Emperor. With time, the war proved devastating for both sides, and Revan would use his influence to sway the Emperor to seek a peace with the Republic, albeit a false one, bringing the war to a halt in 3653. As the Republic became aware of the Sith Empire, even this slight pause of hostilities provided a time for it to grow stronger and adapt. As long as he could, Revan would buy time to aid the galaxy, but even with his greatest efforts, he could not delay the Emperor's plans forever. He would soon push his plans to begin his dark ritual, intent on eradicating all life in the galaxy. Surik's spirit, still with him, could sense Revan's strength faltering as the Emperor's power grew, and she knew there was no purpose in attempting to delay the inevitable anymore. If left imprisoned, Revan would soon be consumed, along with everything in the galaxy. By this time, the Republic and the Jedi Order had been rebuilt. She is here. A Jedi without physical form. Her body is long dead, but her wisdom, her essence, lives on. She reached out across the stars to the Jedi, warning them that a darkness was coming. A darkness that would devour all life it touches. And that she foresaw nothing but ashes across lifeless worlds. The bond weakens, my friend. I'll take things from here. She's told me many things. Revealed the existence of an Imperial prison in the constantly shifting Maelstrom Nebula, and a way to get there. The only way to navigate the Maelstrom is using a Gree computer hidden at an Imperial fortress. As the Jedi now knew what it held, they were prepared to invest significant resources in finding a way through it. The Republic strike team succeeded in infiltrating the prison and fighting through to Revan's holding cell. The Jedi, who found Revan, 
released his body from the constraints after 300 years of imprisonment. I can feel... No. No! What have you done? There's nothing to restrain him now. Broken from his trance, Revan feared nothing remained to keep the Emperor's will in check. But before he could truly voice his fears, he could finally sense her, after all these years. Sensing a familiar presence offered comfort, but Revan was also deeply saddened that after all this time she had not become one with the Force. But how could she? How could she leave him to the Emperor's will alone? She was a unique being, and perhaps the wound she carried in life aided her in death, allowing her to manipulate the Force in ways no other Jedi could. All her choices, her mistakes, and sacrifices brought her to this point, for without her, Revan would have fallen under the Emperor's will long ago. She was truly loyal until the end, and even beyond it. She had done her part, and her spirit finally allowed itself a brief rest. But the exile's part in this was not yet over. She aided her master, her friend, but one last journey now remained. There she would wait for him, for them all, at the end of all things. For as long as the Emperor lived, she could not truly be one with the Force. After his release from imprisonment, the Republic asked Revan to join them in their efforts against the Empire. But knowing as much as he did about the enemy, he viewed the Emperor's downfall as his responsibility, and his alone. After being imprisoned for so long, destroying the Emperor became his purpose for existing. Nothing else mattered. He may have been able to hide it from his new allies, but he was not the same. We all wage war with the past, and it leaves its scars. He shared all the secrets, tactics, every bit of information he had about the Emperor and his forces with the Jedi Council. He had done his part and brought invaluable information about the enemy to ensure the survival of the Republic. But his will, intent on being the one who will destroy the Emperor, could not stand still. He would now follow a new path without allies. The Republic and its Jedi didn't protest and allowed Revan to do as he wished. There's one secret the Emperor never pried from me. A place called the Foundry. In the wrong hands, it can exterminate civilizations. In my hands, it will save the galaxy. You should return to the fight for as long as it lasts. He planned on using the Foundry as a means to take down the Empire and its ruler, but Revan sorely underestimated the Sith Empire. Just like the Republic, they adapted over the centuries. They had talented individuals leading its expansion, agile Sith Lords and Imperial agents. They easily tracked his whereabouts after his escape. The Emperor's prisoner, the escaped Jedi Master, has unwittingly led us to the Nanthri system. That is the location of the Foundry, an ancient alien space station embedded inside an asteroid built by a species that once ruled the galaxy, whose technologies make our own look primitive. Our Jedi Master knew their secrets well. A strike team of highly skilled Imperial operatives and Force wielders was assigned to infiltrate the Foundry and eliminate Revan. sporting during our hunt. I am HK-47, the Master's most faithful ally, once a mere assassin droid. It is now my burden and joy to command the Foundry's mechanical armies. I didn't think Jedi believed in assassination, or built droids to do their dirty work. 
commentary. I am often pleasantly surprised by my master's moral compass. The extermination droids are my master's crowning achievement. They are equipped with bioscanners capable of detecting Sith genetic material. Any organics with Sith ancestry will be slaughtered. This includes 97.8% of the Imperial population. Too bad my species doesn't have any Sith genetic material. Commentary. Unfortunately for you, the Master still wants you dead. Your bones will make excellent trophies to commemorate my return to assassination. strike team would reach Revan, and he had no choice but to face them. That HK unit you destroyed, he waited loyally for 300 years. I can rebuild him, but it won't be the same. Long ago, he had attempted to take the slow path, the difficult path, to infiltrate the Empire and to deliver the killing blow to its ruler. The slow path resulted in betrayal, in three centuries of imprisonment and torment, never again seeing his family. Now, he would take a different approach, a more brutal and direct one. Any organics with Sith ancestry will be slaughtered. This includes 97.8% of the Imperial population. Such brutality, such tactics worked in the Mandalorian Wars. The Emperor is death. For you, for me, for the galaxy. Listen to yourself. If you use the Foundry to exterminate billions, how are you any better? I'm doing this to save lives, not for glory. I will mourn for the dead and do what I must. But this galaxy is different. This is not the way. The brutal, quick path. The Empire would need to be convinced their leader was not who he appeared to be. Its very culture... Its beliefs needed to be changed if the galaxy was to be saved. The process would take time, certainly more than a single conversation with a strike team sent to eliminate him, but 300 years of imprisonment had taken their toll, and Revan had grown tired of waiting. His eagerness and swift action brought the Sith to the Foundry. He was outnumbered. As the lengthy battle carried on, it became increasingly apparent he would not emerge the victor. Would this truly be the final battle of Revan, the prodigal knight, who saved the Republic and its Jedi more than once, who walked on the invisible line that separates the darkness and light of the Force? No, this was not his final battle for his true final battle had already ended the moment he was freed from his prison. The culmination of all his choices, and it resulted in victory, for he ensured the future existed for Bastila, for Vayner, for the Republic, for the Jedi, and the Sith he now faced. In this battle, he now stands in a familiar place, but on the opposite end. Perhaps he knew that in the end. Perhaps he knew he was not meant to win, to save the galaxy yet again. Perhaps the time has come for the galaxy to learn how to save itself without him. He had done his part. In a mind as complex as Revan's, time, tactics, and strategy must blaze at a speed of light. In the end, they all evaporate. And in the end, as the darkness takes me, I am nothing. Now I know how you felt. 
my friend. The time has come. After three centuries of ceaseless fighting. For rest. Revan's corporeal form, centuries old, is no more. His consciousness begins evaporating into the embrace of the Force. At the brink of consciousness, his spirit fades deeper. And then... It stops. Something is terribly wrong. Scourge's vision would come to pass three centuries after it came to him. Serving loyally under the Emperor, he waited for the right moment to act. And finally, Scourge would come to meet the Jedi from his vision. He cast away his loyalties to the Emperor, and did everything in his power to bring his vision to fruition, to bring the Jedi Knight before the Emperor, even as it meant surrendering himself as a prisoner. Serving loyally under the Jedi and his allies, guided by the Grand Master Satil Shan, all pieces of the puzzle aligned themselves as expected. The Jedi from his vision finally stood before the Emperor. Scourge had dedicated centuries to this cause, to this moment. He worked with the Republic to weaken the Emperor's power and reach, to limit his resources, leaving him vulnerable enough for the Jedi Knight to reach him. The Knight from his vision would even know to face the Emperor alone, so he could not use any of his allies against him. The circle closes. The end begins. Scourge's vision was now arriving into existence. You are a blind insect, contemplating the void of space. My ascendance is inevitable. A day, a year, a millennium, it matters not. I hold the patience of stone and the will of stars. Known as the hero of Tython, the Jedi Knight, had a remarkable connection to the Force. Given his current predicament, the Emperor finally faced his match. My life spans millennia. Legions have risen to test me. Your striving is insignificant. Let your death be the same. The Jedi resisted his attacks through the Force, and the Emperor truly perceived him as a threat only when it was too late. The Jedi proclaimed he will not deliver the killing blow, and instead bring the Emperor to justice. There is no justice. There is only revenge. I will not be your trophy. If I must die, everything dies with me. The temple is coming apart. We have to leave. Get back to your ship. Everything transpired as planned. The Emperor finally fell, but... As his body faded into darkness, Scourge could sense nothing. There was no disturbance, no change that caused the fabric of the Force to stir. They did everything right. His vision came true precisely as it should have, but everything was wrong, as if the Emperor's presence still lingered. As it was, the Jedi and the Republic believed the Emperor was defeated, and they celebrated this victory. As it meant, for the first time since the war's beginning, they had the upper hand over the Empire. But with time, Scourge's suspicions would prove true. Revan so would not allow itself to fade out of existence. There, in the fragments of his being, he could now see it. The darkness he had separated from long ago. That part of him he'd used as a living shield against the Emperor's tortures and his dread masters, as he focused on the Force. After three hundred years of torture, it was given shape, and his fractured mind the part he cut himself from. 
refused to be at peace. A mind forged under torment was no longer subdued. It was free, and it sought revenge. His dark spirit, isolated from the light, could finally draw on the dark side of the Force. It could see nothing but anger and hatred, for it was born in it. In time, this fragment of Revan's soul would grow strong enough, channeling rage and hatred, and forge itself into flesh. His spirit, his light side form, was now anchored, unable to merge fully with the Force, and it could do nothing but observe as his rage took form, embracing the full extent of the dark side. This crazed Dark Revan too would seek to destroy the Emperor, but he was utterly ruthless in his quest. No more waiting, no more delays, he cared nothing about the Empire and the Republic and their war. To him they were nothing but obstacles. He would carve the path to the Emperor, regardless of how many lives needed to be taken. His imprisonment over the centuries had been a secret, but his existence had echoed across the galaxy for ages, and there were fanatics who worshipped his name during his imprisonment, on both sides of the conflict, known as Revanites. While the light side of Revan would have nothing to do with these people, his dark counterpart would use their blind belief to his advantage. However, he makes a critical mistake when he attempts to torture and use his own descendant, Theron Shan. His plan backfires. You're here. Come on, we have to go. Now. Escaped all on your own. I hope that would have more time to make you see. He's got a signal jammer that's blocking all starship communications in the Risi system. The fleets will come out of hyperspace practically on top of each other. No coordination, saboteurs in every crew. It'll be a massacre. And at last, the board will be cleared of distractions. Self-destruct sequence. Come on, we've got to go. This is Satil Shan. There are traitors hiding on every ship in your fleet. The Imperial ships too. They're manipulating the battle from both sides. I'm transmitting the traitors' names now. They're part of a cult. The Order of Revan. Revan? But he was killed. And apparently it didn't take. All ships cease fire. Open a channel to the Imperial Commander. I've been listening. As ruses go, this is quite creative. It's the truth. Round up the people from Theron's list and see for yourself. And if you're correct, what do you propose? A meeting. Face to face on neutral ground. There's a town on the surface. Raiders Cove. We'll send coordinates for the meeting spot. Very well. I hope you know what you're doing. The Revanite ships have all been scattered, captured, or destroyed. Their accomplices aboard our vessels are in chains. You found a threat and given us the means to root it out. Separately, what do we have to discuss? Revan is still alive, my lord, and his plans don't stop here. The Emperor's not dead. Revan thinks he can fix that, but he's wrong, isn't he? No one person, not even Revan can truly destroy the Emperor. If your Emperor cannot be destroyed, why fear Revan? I would welcome the Emperor's destruction. Revan's meddling will bring quite the opposite. The Emperor's current state is nebulous, incorporeal. To strike at him, Revan will first have to return him to a physical form. Which is exactly what the Emperor wants. He will destroy Revan, then move on to the rest of us. In time, he will consume all life in the galaxy. You knew that was his goal, and you still followed him? I only learned of his true plans recently, and I am no more interested in being fuel for his insanity than you are. We have to stop this. Intercept Revan before he can restore the Emperor's form. 
The Emperor's hideaway is a secret, even to the Dark Council. The fourth moon of Yavin. That's where we'll find Revan. He wanted me to join him there. Never said I couldn't bring a few friends. According to our data, he still has extensive forces at his disposal. We would stand a better chance of overcoming them together. No matter what evidence I present, I doubt the Supreme Chancellor will agree to any kind of alliance or truce. Neither will the Dark Council, but my ships and the soldiers aboard them are loyal to me. I can convince my troops to maintain a truce. They've seen Revan's threat firsthand. Then we meet on Yavin 4. Agreed. But they would not be the only ones to follow the trail to Yavin. You sense it too. Not the ancient Sith, or the Emperor. Not Revan. Another presence. Different from the rest. Yes. It is more like you. I sense it too. Is it really possible that a light side presence could exist here? A light can flourish anywhere. Apparently. If Revan's spirit observed them at this moment, he would see, firsthand, how different the galaxy was. He paved the way to ensure there was a future, but it was never his to tread upon. His descendants, Satil Shan and her son Theron, played a key part in bringing two rival armies together to stop the Revanites. Of course, they would do it regardless of their superiors' wishes. I guess ignoring the boss runs in the family. Revan and his followers intended to perform a ritual that would return the Emperor's spirit into a physical form by killing everything on the moon. On the way to reach him, they slew many Revanites, as they knew with each fallen enemy the threat was that much lesser. Little did they know that in doing so, they were achieving the opposite. Through their united efforts, the Republic Imperial Alliance succeeded in tracking down Revan. Against a common foe, even enemies may stand side by side. Jedi, Sith, even Mandalorian. Shay Vizsla? Wouldn't miss a fight this good. Bring as many fools as you like. You won't stop what must be done. You don't know what you're doing. The Emperor is too powerful. No, not any longer. I have set my will against this creature for centuries. Only I can destroy him. Can't you see what you've become? Your hatred and regrets are consuming you. My own flesh and blood standing against me. The depths of his corrupting influence are endless. I will waste no more time. This must end now! Revan's spirit lingered still as he observed them now. There can be no doubt that he was proud of his descendants as they battled his dark counterpart. Looking at Satil, one could easily see much of Bastila, both in soul and mind. She inherited Bastila's gift of battle meditation, one that she now used to bolster her allies as they battled their shared enemy. It was also undeniable she inherited his connection to the Force, his power, possessing abilities limited to few in the galaxy much in the same way Revan had used Darth Nyrus's lightning against her centuries ago, absorbing its power to defend his allies. Satil, too, would be gifted with this ability, capable of dissolving and absorbing energy to such an extent that she could dissolve a lightsaber blade with the palm of her hand. Her connection to the Force was undeniable, as was the unfaltering strength of her will. The two shared something else in common, as both Satil and Revan had children who were not Jedi. Even so, her son Theron was a formidable individual who played a critical role in bringing enemies, Sith and Jedi, together against a common enemy, as his ancestor once had. Revan never met his son, never had the chance to see what he would become. Bastila knew he would have been proud of him had he met him. And they both would be proud of Satil, of Theron, along with every daughter and son that connected them through the ages. Revan's spirit understood. He was right in accepting his defeat in the Foundry. 
he had no reason to fear for the future, for his legacy was indeed so powerful, even his darkest form could not destroy it. As the battle neared its end, and Revan lay defeated, the surface of the moon shook as a burst of energy accumulated in the distance. What's happening? Impossible! The ritual hasn't even begun! The deaths you've caused, the war you've fueled, it is all mine! This galaxy is mine! It's time I claim it once more! That was him. The Emperor. He did not assume a physical form or possess a body, and he left as soon as he appeared. None of it makes sense. The Emperor's essence evaded destruction once more, meaning that the Dark Revan failed in his attempt. He failed in achieving the purpose that created him. Weakened, his light side spirit took the opportunity to confront his dark counterpart and aid it in letting go of the anger and hatred that fueled it. You weren't strong enough to survive the torture or the battle in the Foundry. I faced them. I survived them. You've carried on, dragging the remains of a body that should have long since faded to dust. Hatred fueled cunning, but burned out all wisdom. Without me, you could not see. Finally understanding what he had become, the two fragments of Revan allowed themselves to be merged into one, as it was meant to be, and finally faded. Revan's fate was now the same as that of his former general, for he too could never truly rest until the Emperor fell. After seeing his descendants fight in his final moments, he had no doubt that day was coming. The final victory over Revan eliminated one threat, only to fuel another. The deaths of the many Revanites slain by Imperial and Republic troops fed the Emperor's power, acting as fuel for his weakened spirit. He was now powerful enough to leave the moon of Yavin after his long slumber. Theron Shan yet again worked with Imperial agents in hopes of finding and stopping the Emperor before he could return to a physical form. Repeat, Republic call sign Auric Net. Hey, finally! Theron, are you alright? I'm in Imperial space over Zyost. Tried to slip in, help out my ground team, but I used the wrong set of clearance codes and shields are low. And why exactly do you have a ground team on Zyost? Asking myself the same damn thing. I was getting reports demented soldiers, slave and civilian populations under fire. I had suspicions of what it meant, but I wasn't sure. I sent a team in dark to investigate, maybe handle it. It's all gone out of control now. I think it's him, the Emperor. I'm hit! I'm gonna try to land this thing! Don't come looking for me up! Theron? Theron, come in! Zyost is an ancestral world of the Empire, populated by millions. As Theron's team explored the planet's surface undercover, looking for an explanation for its chaotic state, they'd quickly find the responsible party. I had foreseen your arrival, but I didn't believe it. I thought, after bearing witness to my rebirth on the Yavin moon, why? Why would you stand in the face of certain death? You're far from stupid, I know that much. Overly ambitious, perhaps. Well, regardless, I do hope you find your time on Zyost. Enlightening. You'll bear witness to a world's end if you survive long enough. You don't belong here, Jedi. You shouldn't have come. People are in need, and you could use my assistance. Well, you're not wrong about that. And as you can see, things are already out of hand. Pardon the interruption. 
I sent a probe droid to look into that crash shuttle, Minister Benico. It's empty. We know Theron Sean was on that shuttle. So far, Theron has only added to our troubles. He'd better not be here to cause any more. Theron's here to stop the Emperor. Vishit is not our Emperor. Not anymore. As you've witnessed, Vishit is taking hold of an increasing number of soldiers and Sith. His goal continues to be the accumulation of power. Agent. The dark side is strong on Zyost. Using the outpost's resources, our former Emperor can massacre the defenseless to fuel him. The more powerful he becomes, the more people he can control. He will keep on killing until nothing's left. Theron's team tried their hardest to incapacitate all those possessed by the Emperor's spirit, but without killing them. For the more deaths occurred, the stronger the Emperor would become. War has broken out across the globe. Our former Emperor, however, has limited his involvement to the area around New Adasta, near you. I don't think it's a coincidence. It's possible he isn't as strong as he's been letting on. It's possible he's worried about what you could do. Fear is at the heart of Sith philosophy, and he is its purest expression. Quite a simplification, I think, but this is no time for debate. Intrusion! Vitiates pawns! I have a thought. Theron's team came up with a plan to use the resources on the planet and generate an electrostatic field that would shock all of Vitiate's puppets, releasing them from his hold without killing them. Only the weakest prey on the weak. Imagine how much more powerful you would be if you struck me down. I think that did it. That's it. Got to suffer as big a non-lethal burst as we can manage. With the situation somewhat under control, the Republic started to worry that these possessions could spread and endanger their soldiers. What can you tell me about these possessions? I'm curious. Do you really believe you've accomplished anything here? What do you think you've stopped? You would feed on every last life in the galaxy to become immortal. I won't let that happen. I have already cheated death. I have other plans now, as you will see. If you wish to keep railing against me, then so be it. Your interference changes nothing. When I am finished here, when every life on this world has been exhausted, I want you to be alive, to know that I succeeded. Goodbye. Minutes after Theron's steam departed Zyost, hoping to establish a new plan to resolve the chaos on the planet, the Emperor fulfilled his promise. With everything bled from the world, Zyost was now a barren wasteland, adding millions to the infinite list of lives consumed by the Emperor over the centuries. This demonstration of power proved he had indeed transcended the known teachings of Sith and Jedi. It is impossible to expect a being of such reach 
possess a will shackled by any form of mortality or empire. Vitiate was no longer on Zyost. His essence was now elsewhere, and superior as it is, the galaxy could only speculate where it went. Neither the Republic nor the Empire could do anything else but wait for the Emperor to re-emerge. far edge of the galaxy, hidden within wild space, exists a backwater planet carrying the name Zakul. Its people rarely had any contact with the known galaxy since their beginnings. A planet of rich history, Zakul was a home to a people who worshipped their old gods and believed in the prophecies of old. With time, a powerful human warrior carrying the name Valkorion would reveal himself to be a being from their prophecies, their demon savior, believed to bring a new era to their world. And he would do so quite literally. Zakul suddenly began its transformation as Valkorion started uniting tribes across its surface, taking their force-sensitive leaders and reshaping them into the Knights of Zakul, a force-sensitive order meant to protect their homeworld. Zakul's sociology, military, and its very purpose quickly shifted from brutal war-driven ways and towards science and growth. Given time, Valkorion would combine the efforts and knowledge of his people to locate the Eternal Fleet, which was an important part of Zakul's past. The Eternal Fleet was composed of a large number of battlecruisers of unknown design and operated by sentient droids. The Eternal Fleet had been used many centuries ago to destroy and conquer almost every inhabited world within the region of wild space, including Zakul. The stories say the fleet was finally defeated by a mysterious alien vessel known as the Gravestone. This massive alien warship countered the entire might of the Eternal Fleet. All those centuries ago, the Eternal Fleet was defeated over Zakul and deactivated. Once it had been lost to time, but with Valkorion's leadership, it was now found and kept dormant, standing ready to defend Zakul from any threats that may emerge. Valkorion's Eternal Empire was at peace, with the Eternal Fleet rarely being active, other than a small handful of ships to collect the resources. And indeed, the people of Zakul had no interest in conquest, for under Valkorion's leadership, Zakul's inhabitants lived on the lap of luxury, with almost limitless resources arriving to their planet. Each citizen of Zakul wanted for nothing, and had everything their heart would desire, leading to zealous devotion to their leader. And their leader was known to be generous, and was loved by his people, none more than his family. At a certain point during his long reign as the Emperor of Zakul, Valkorion once considered replacing human soldiers with droids. A member of his elite guard, Senya Tural, protested. This boldness to speak her mind caught Valkorion's attention. Soon thereafter, the two became romantically involved. They would eventually marry, and begin a shared life, which perhaps wasn't the most ideal relationship given their positions, but they were happy. Senya would soon give birth to twins, Arkan and Texan. She would offer them all the love she had, but they would give none in return, seeking only to impress their father. Senya noticed that around this time, Valkorion began changing. He would pay less attention to his wife and their children, as the twins did their best to impress their father, who had trained them to be warriors from a young age. Their father began to ignore them in turn. Their third child, and only daughter, Valen, was the greatest trouble of the three from the very start. 
primarily due to the power she inherited from her father. She made furniture move while still in the womb, tore apart droids as a toddler, and even crippled a guard after dropping a ball she had tossed. With Valen's powers growing, Senya started to worry. Valkorian had become increasingly distant, seemingly forgetting his family even existed for weeks at a time. Throughout most of his life, he had moments when his mind appeared to drift. And indeed, as she observed him, Valkorian appeared as if he was thinking about matters light years away. But as of late, this distance seems to have increased, almost as if his mind bore the consciousness of another. Valkorian, even in his distracted state, paid enough attention to his children to see the similarities between himself and his favorite child, Valen. But he also feared that she would challenge him one day. His solution would prove that Valkorian had truly become a different person. He ordered that Valen undergo extreme mental conditioning that would separate her from most of her powers, suppressing her violent and sociopathic tendencies. Her caretakers were allowed to use any and all methods that did not cause her death. Valen underwent brutal experiments, constant fear, pain, isolation, and torture. As a result of this, her mind was conditioned to be powerless against key individuals, in particular Valkorian. But it severely damaged her personality and mental stability. This mental conditioning would last for years, and it would take place on the one planet in the galaxy no Force-sensitive being would ever wish to set foot on. Nathema. Knowing she had no power or say in the matter, Senya could do nothing to protect her daughter from Valkorian, who seemed to be colder than ever. With time, as Valen's suffering grew, her mother could sense it, so she decided to rescue her, or die trying, no matter the consequences. Senya pulled all the connections she had, and managed to reach Nathema, quite literally crossing the entire galaxy to rescue her daughter. She breached the sanitarium and got what she came for, but she had come too late. served those who tormented her. Within the mazes of her mind, the only person she had left to blame for her suffering was her mother, who had abandoned her and whom she now hated more than anything.
And so, Valkorion turned his most favored child into a weapon he could use and dominate, proving that he indeed had no loyalties to anyone but himself. To those who knew him, Valkorion had become someone, something different, and now began pushing new plans forward. His twin sons too would grow up as servants, albeit never facing even a fraction of the methods their younger sister had to face. They would train to be warriors into their adulthood, preparing for the day the Eternal Empire would reveal itself and begin its conquest of the galaxy. And that day was drawing closer. Thirty-six thirty-six before the Battle of Yavin, both Republic and Imperial territories are attacked by a fleet of unknown vessels. These unidentified invaders raided several planets of the two galactic powers, including Korriban and Tython, before retreating into unknown space. A joined team of Republic and Imperial forces, led by Darth Ma, would not sit idly and wait to be attacked again. They ventured into the unknown space of the galaxy in search of both the Emperor and these unidentified invaders. Ma was strong in the Force and the Dark Side, able to sense Vitiate's presence as they went further into unknown space. 3636, before the Battle of Yavin, both Republic and Imperial territories are attacked by a fleet of unknown vessels. These vessels were led by Valkorian's sons, Arkan and Thexan. Once their initial assault on the known galaxy was successful, the two returned to their father, bringing the lightsabers of fallen Jedi and Sith as trophies, symbols of their triumph. After their successful initiation, the Eternal Fleet continued to strike at both the Republic and the Empire, inflicting devastating damage upon their worlds. Darth Maul's fleet of vessels now pursues the trail into the unknown regions. For this purpose, Darth Maul summons a very unique ally. Father, they've come. I already know.
Darth Maul awaits you on the bridge. I trust you remember the way. Has Ma really found the Sith Emperor all the way out here? I wouldn't presume to speak for Lord Ma, but I've never known him to exaggerate. Welcome aboard. I received your message. And now that I'm here, I sense it too. We grow closer every moment. Our former Emperor is out there. Do we know what could have brought him to this area? My ship's charts don't have much. There are rumors of many civilizations in this region, but our only outposts nearby were destroyed without explanation some time ago. The culprits were never determined. Why travel so far? Why consume every living thing on Zyos, then turn and flee into the depths of wild space? For all his shows of power, he must have a weakness. Or he wouldn't have stopped with Zyost. That would be reassuring, <laughs> wouldn't it? Between the two of us, I'm confident we can press the Dark Council into line. But I'm beginning to doubt the Republic will make any serious contributions. Their assistance here has been useful, but limited. There are at least a few people in the Republic who can be reasoned with. I could contact Theron Shan. He is a spy, but... If we have no other means. My lord, sensor contact, 15 clicks, small, no life form readings, some kind of probe. Readings are identical to scans from the unknown force that attacked Korriban. Raise shields, pursue and destroy. Evasive maneuvers, come about 180 degrees. We've been boarded. All decks, report hostile forces. I'll sweep for boarders. You get us out of here. Set deflectors to double aft. Divert weapon power to the engines. The shield generator is under attack. Defend it. The starboard compartment. Stop their advance. I ever get my hands on. There! We're in some trouble here, Sith. Droids shot through the airlock and the docking clamps won't let us loose. I'm on my way, Andronicus. some odd ships out here to shoot at first. If you see an opening to escape, take it. Someone has to make it back to the Empire. And leave you here to rot? Are you kidding me? I'm commanding you. Hurry. All right. It's your call. Just do us a favor and don't die out here, huh? Let's not waste any time, then. The power core is strained to the breaking point. We can recharge the shields, but they still won't last long. The hyperdrive has been completely burnt out. Enemies on the bridge. Repeat, enemies are on the... There are rudimentary backup controls here, but the enemy ships have us surrounded. We have few options left. Then we take as many of them with us as we can. Agreed.
You've awakened. I trust you can walk. Unlock these shackles, and I'll show you exactly what I'm capable of. You are in the heart of our empire now. I assure you, escape is impossible, even if you could make it past me. Come along. A member of the ruling Dark Council, Darth Ma holds command over the Imperial fleet and is feared by many with a reputation for routing entire armies. The only member of the Dark Council trusted by Ma, Darth Nox, is an ambitious and manipulative Sith whose methods are viewed as unorthodox amongst the Sith. Her ancestry rivaled that of the Great Tulak Horde and combined with her intellect and skill, allowed her to rise through the ranks. Both made their mark on the world, but this now means that perhaps two of the most powerful individuals in the known galaxy are held as captives of war. His glorious majesty, immortal master and protector of Zakul, Emperor Valkorion. Welcome. A new name. A new face. These are not enough to hide from us. The Sith Emperor. Your presence is unmistakable. Oh, I think a mistake has been made. But by whom? Do these people have any idea who you really are? The kinds of things you're capable of? Do you? Your constant silence across our history. This was your distraction? This was my focus. Everything else, a means to an end. You claim to have come all this way to find me. Here I am. You say you know me. If that is true, then you know the depths of my power. Whatever you hoped to achieve here, you know deep inside that you cannot succeed. But you do not have to stand against me. Instead, you can kneel. I will never again kneel to you! You would sooner die than acknowledge my superiority. It is you who fears death, Valkorion. I do not. I will not kneel! Why send your new followers away? Something you don't want them to hear? They are not like us. Look around you. Zakul is poised to become the greatest civilization in the history of the galaxy. I have forged this empire to surmount all of my previous works, to span eternity. The Eternal Throne commands a fleet more vast than any ever built. It has the power to reshape the galaxy into any image that I choose. That we choose. I will share all of this with you. If you will only kneel. Share. <laughs> you don't share anything. You enslave. You devour. I will never be a part of that. So be it. Chance. 
First your brother, now your father. Does my ambition truly surprise you? You do not have ambition, only jealousy. That is why you fail. This is for all of the people you forced to suffer and die. <laughs> so be himself, nor has he taken a new body. It is difficult to see. His presence in the Force has always been deceptive. I have always loved the stars. Your death was too good to be true. You can't fool me. Deception was not my desire. I am not your enemy. I will help you see. I don't need allies. Especially cagey beasts like you. Is that so? The Eternal Throne. The new seat of power in the galaxy. It can't be. I've only been gone. Longer than you think. Zakul has surpassed my expectations. The most powerful fleet in history, and an army of guardians who knew the forces more than light or dark. But my children... My children abuse their power. We must deal with my errant son and daughter before they ruin everything. I knew you wanted something. You can't stop them alone. They are deadly, and worse, lack discipline. Do not underestimate their threat. It will take both of us to undo the damage they can inflict. Wake up. We have to go. Don't try to move. You're dying. I may have your cure, but I'm not going to lie. This will hurt. I spared you from dying this very instant. We still have quite a ways to go. The Empire and Republic have all but fallen to the man who imprisoned you. You're our last hope. Come on! Many trials await Darth Nox and her allies within this critical point in history. Valen. Come on! Declaration. Meatbags can't fly. 
Throughout her efforts to combat the Eternal Empire, Valkorion attempts to manipulate Darth Nox from the deep recesses of her mind, guiding her to eliminate his own children and to carve a path to the Eternal Throne. Although uncertain why he's helping her, or why he chose her as a host for his presence, she has no choice but to share in his plans, for his children, Arkan and Valen, are a threat that must be stopped. This journey, her journey, is as delicate and trying as Revan's was. For now, most of it will remain cloaked, and many fates, including those of Alcorian's children, shall remain untold and hidden. The next few minutes should prove quite interesting. In the fight against the Eternal Empire, enemies will once again stand united for a time. Theron Shan. In a long five years. And alliances, once believed impossible in more ways than one, will form. Darth Nox will build a strong following against the Eternal Empire under Valkorion's watchful eye as he looks for any opportunity to manipulate her. Accept my help, or watch her die. Take care of it. Gladly. And she will aim to do the same, knowing he is not to be trusted. Following in familiar footsteps, she will journey to Nathema and unearth its mysteries. And deep within its void, concealed from Valkorion's eyes, she shall find his weakness. Have you come to torment me again? No. I sense his presence, but it is faint. My low-born son has worn many masks. I am Lord Dramath. Darth Nox will find allies in many corners of the galaxy, including those beyond the grip of death, and even those who once served the Eternal Empire. I do hope you're up to fighting your own, Senya. My issue isn't with them, but if they're going to stand in my way... I see you found another pragmatist. Many will join her cause, those with unique talents, skills, and guts. Hey, you dying? Can I have your stuff? What do you think? <laughs> Understood! Those who prefer working alone. I'm giving you a direct order. I'm sorry, your signal's breaking up. It does that when I switch off the holocom. And those with unique ambitions. Pushy droid you've got. You don't want to call her that. What? Pushy? Droid. Ancient mysteries will be unearthed. I have detected a large metallic object nearby. And the galaxy will bear witness to things not seen in centuries. All who fight for its future will stand united once again and grow. We don't all share the same ideologies, but every one of you is here because you believe we can transcend our differences. Either we succeed together or we fail alone. We have come so far. Indeed, they have. They could one day pose a challenge to the Eternal Empire. Perhaps. A pity so many of them will have to die. In the end, past the trials and the sacrifices, Darth Nox will find a way to eliminate the threat of Valkorion's children. Commander, urgent distress call coming in from Empress Asina. Drummond Cass is under attack. The Eternal Fleet is bombing us from orbit. It's not just the Sith who are under attack, Commander. I'm picking up urgent distress signals from Coruscant and the other core worlds. There's more. Emergency calls coming in from Zakul. The Eternal Fleet set up a blockade. They're bombing them into oblivion. You caused this, not I. Leaderless, the fleet has reverted to its most primal function, extermination. Unchecked, they will destroy all life in the galaxy. There is only one way to stop them. Claim the Eternal Throne and seize your destiny.
Shield upgrades are ready for action. It's now or never. Break that blockade. Stations for the Alliance. With the full unity and strength of her alliance, Darth Nox reaches Zakul in an attempt to take the throne and tame the threat of its fleet. There it is. The Eternal Throne. Fleet stop firing. You did it, Commander. Well done. After years of strife, you have become Empress of Zakul, Commander of the Fleet, and heir to the Eternal Throne. Your family's caused enough damage. I won't let the throne fall into the wrong hands again. Neither will I. What's happening? The Corian! I once offered you mercy in this very room, but you refused to bow. Now, you have no choice. Bow. As you command, my Emperor. You were an exemplary pawn, one I forged into a vessel of supreme power, worthy of preserving my spirit. Now I take your body as my own, and rule once more as the immortal Emperor. You can't do this, Falcorian. I already have. The commander's alive. Valkorin has taken hold of her mind, but she's fighting back. Incoming! She prepared for this moment from the beginning. Knowing Valkorian's plans would be revealed the second she took the throne. Father, your mother should have obeyed my orders and drowned you when she had the chance. I ended mother's suffering long ago, but your torment is just beginning. I almost wish I had more of your deranged family members waiting in the wings. Tenebrae, join me in death! Enough! Conjure a hundred more holocrons, an arsenal of super weapons. Nothing will stop me.
Go. I'll cover you. We fight together, we die together. Now you're talking. You're the Alliance Commander. Before that, Force Walker and member of the Dark Council. Save yourself. You may take my body, but you can't have my mind. Impossible! I control what happens here. I am the Immortal Emperor. You cannot defeat me. A lone Sith, bloated with power. You're the same person you always were. I forged you into a being worthy of the Eternal Throne. Without me, you are nothing. Wrong again, Valkorion. It's you who needed me. Now you're alone, and nothing can save you from the fate you deserve. Remember me when your alliance burns to ash. Save yourself. You defeated Valkorion, once and for all. Valkorion's risen from the grave more times than I can count. Are we sure he won't return again? For the first time in my life, I can't feel his presence. We will never see him again. I'm sure of it. For a very brief moment of time, the galaxy was at peace as Zakul, the Empire, and the Republic sought to rebuild. This will be our new frontier, as we work together to rebuild the galaxy. By trusting in each other, we begin a new era in galactic history. The Age of the Eternal Alliance. You're missing the party. Funny, I thought you passed out on the dance floor. I got a second wind. Let me guess. You saw the intelligence reports. The Republic's preparing for war. And the Sith Empire's not far behind. The Eternal Alliance is only hours old, but already I sense dark forces massing against us. Uprisings sparking across the galaxy. We will defeat them. Tomorrow. Tonight, we celebrate. Even though their conflicts shall soon continue, their mutual threat, the Emperor, is no more. And yet, Revan's spirit remains restless, Surix as well, all lives touched by the Emperor. Their stories, Revan's story, it remains incomplete still. And the chains that bind them to this existence remain unbroken. Vishyat was defeated. Valkorion. Now, only one remains. I am Lord Scourge, once a loyal servant of the Empire. Kira Carson, Jedi Knight. Not thrilled to be here. All three of us have fought the same enemy. The former Sith Emperor, Tenebrae, Vitiate, Valkorion, whatever you wish to call him. We know he was once a part of you. And we both felt his destruction, but... He has always been a master of deceit. We had to be sure that he wasn't lingering in your mind, 
hidden, waiting to come out only in the most dire circumstances. I don't see Jedi and Sith cooperating very often outside of my alliance. How did you end up working together? That is a very long story. We can't risk saying more here. Let's travel to your base on Odessan. It should be safe for us to talk there. About what? The final, gruesome weapon of Tenebrae. He sought immortality, but only his endless spite survives now. I was his most powerful servant once, but I learned of his true nature and plotted his downfall for centuries. Ultimately, I saw what had to be done and betrayed my empire in order to destroy its creator. That is how I came to fight alongside Kira. We fought the Emperor's servants constantly for years. We even thought we'd beaten him alongside my master. Then Yavin 4 happened. And Valkorion. I received guidance from an old ally. Instead of seeking out our enemy in his current shell, you, as it turns out, we sought a different target. Tenebrae hid his original body where no one could harm it. As long as that body remained in stasis, the galaxy's greatest evil could never truly be killed. Unless we destroyed Tenebrae, the fight against Valkorion would never really be over. Since Valkorion is gone, I assume you succeeded. We did. As we later learned, we destroyed his first body just as you purged the last vestige of his twisted spirit from your mind. That is when his final weapon was unleashed. A Sith ritual, carved into his very flesh, unleashed an ancient plague from every molecule of his decaying corpse. We were both knocked out cold, comatose for more than a year. Satil Shan was the one who finally pulled us out of that nightmare, and started a new one. Like you, Kira and I have both been vessels for a portion of Tenebrae's power. It acted as a sort of vaccine. But Satil had no such protection, nor did any of her followers. Within days, they were all laid low, trapped in a nightmarish slumber. In helping us, they unknowingly doomed themselves. The infection is worsening. There is a darkness growing among the afflicted. We can feel their minds connecting, communicating. We're afraid they might be merging somehow. Merging into what? Another Valkorian? Is this plague bringing him back somehow? It's too early to make that conclusion. Whatever it is, it is immensely dangerous. We must stop it. How? We loaded Satil and all of her followers onto a transport to keep them quarantined, along with a few Medroids to tend to them. The transport is programmed to fly a random course through unsettled sectors of the Outer Rim, all weeks away from civilization. I can send a signal to alter the course, bring it to another empty system that's closer so that we can meet it in a shuttle. We board the ship and connect our minds with yours through the Force. Together, we will face this entity and purge it from existence. And if we cannot purge it, then we destroy the transport and hope we've ended the old monster's schemes forever. Send the signal. If what you say is true, this thing could be getting stronger by the minute. I'll send the signal right away. We're here, scanning the transport. Locked on and sealed. We're ready to go in. What do you think we'll find in there? Nothing good. So many lives lost. It must end here and now. Revan? The end is closer than ever before, but the threat is as dire as we could have imagined. The ritual inscribed on Tenebrae's body the plague that was unleashed is feeding on its victims' minds. Tenebrae is being remade. I can feel it. You must intervene before it's too late. You must be the ally Scourge mentioned. 
You guided him to Tenebrae's body. We hoped that destroying it would finally end him. But destroying his body wasn't enough. His essence itself must be obliterated. That is our plan. Kira will lead us in meditation. We will join our minds with Satil's and end his blight on the galaxy. Forever. Then go, quickly. I will aid you as best I can. Kira, the bridge has been secured. We're all clear too. Meet you with the Medbay. Does Kira know you've been working with Revan? I did not mention the specifics. Kira fought his followers on Yavin. I wasn't sure she would trust him. Come, the end is in sight. Master Satil, she's still alive. Trad and Sil are dead, and the rest aren't far from it. So much darkness. We have to hurry. Form a circle, quickly. I'll keep you covered from here, just in case any stragglers are hiding out. Baron. She's my mother. I'm glad I can help, but I don't think I want to see the inside of her mind. We're going to join our minds with Satil's to help her fight. Focus your minds on her. Watch her breathing and try to match it. Close your eyes. Let my voice guide you. Listen. Follow my voice. The Force unites us all. Through the Force, all things are one. Follow my voice. Follow. the others. I'm not sure if they made it in. Unexpected guests. Fascinating. Who are you? You don't recognize me? No, but you have come here on purpose. Ah, who else could you be? I've heard so much about you. Impressive. Most impressive. What the...? My wayward child. You of all people should know better than to challenge my strength. Also, I've gathered from this Jedi's memories. Your minds are resilient, to say the least. Adapting so quickly. Resisting so ably. This isn't the first time we've faced each other. You don't remember? Hmm. This Jedi remembers. Though she clearly lacks details. You aren't who you pretend to be. I am. And I am not. That's your original body, isn't it? You're not Valkorian or Vitiate. You're Tenebrae. As shrewd as I've been led to believe. The ritual carved into him isn't a plague, it's an imprint, an echo of who he was back then. It has taken longer than I'd hoped to recompose myself. But time has never been in short supply. Not for me. To be honest, I've quite enjoyed the process. The memories this Jedi and her followers have of me, of us, quite amusing. Am I supposed to think you're so old that shirts haven't been invented? Poor simple-minded creature. Do not fear. Soon, you will not have to think at all. The version of me that you knew became too complacent, too distracted by mortal concerns, empires, wars, even a family. I have seen where that path led. I'm not so easily distracted now. I will succeed where he failed. And thanks to you, I have a choice of interesting bodies to carry me to victory. You cannot succeed, only die alone. 
In the fight against you, no one is alone. He divided us. He knows that together, we are stronger than he can ever hope to be. If this really is Satil's mind, it looks like he's close to taking over completely. Perhaps. But our enemy lies as often as he kills. We can still win. No one person can destroy this threat. But all of us together, we will end him. I control all that happens here. I am immortal, infinite, endless. Everything ends, even you. I believe you tried to destroy me once before. You failed. I saved you then. I will not save you now. Fools! He thinks you will be lost here forever. But you have always known the way to destroy him. Together, we will find his doom. Satil is stronger than this. Duplicate believes. She is not the easy prey he assumes. He gleans the facts of his other lives from the memories and impressions of Satil and her students. But he has only the knowledge of those events. This tenebrae possesses none of the wisdom earned by experiencing them. Do you know how long ago this impression of tenebrae was made? I can only theorize, but it must have been long before our time. Likely before even Riven's time. Do not share in his arrogance. He is more vulnerable than he would have us believe. But he is still the most dangerous being in the galaxy. If we fail to destroy him here and now, there may never be another opportunity. Destroy him. Break the chains he uses to ensnare us all. Free the galaxy from his manipulations. Avenge me. Avenge us all. What could you possibly be thinking? You must realize by now that everything you do here is meaningless. The Jedi's mind can no longer resist me. <laughs> it crumbles by the second. When she is obliterated, only I will remain. Watch, fight, flee, bring as many threats as you like. Nothing can stop me now. You're starting to sound a bit desperate. Who are you trying to convince? I, Mangle's child! Look at them. You're Jedi and her weak-minded students. They will fall, and once again, I will rise. No. Your power is your weakness. It blinds you. Jedi nonsense. Precisely. My students and I. Who are we to resist your power? You knew you could dominate us all. That you could tear a path through our minds, absorbing our essence, strengthening yourself, crashing through all our defenses one by one. In time, your victory was inevitable. In time, you would claw your way here, into the very core of my being. Into the heart of my trap. <laughs> Look around you. Yes, look around me. Look at my students, each of them shaken to their core by the death and chaos that you helped create. Eager for help, guidance, strength. Had you focused on any one of them, you might have succeeded. But your ego wouldn't allow it. Why settle for one student when you could assault them all? 
And why limit yourself to the students when their master was close at hand? I never needed to beat you. I only had to let you think you were invincible. Until now. Until every person who knows your weakness firsthand could come to face you. Until the one person who proved you could be defeated came here to destroy you, once and for all. I am master to all Sith. Not one can challenge my power. Have you forgotten our ways so quickly? To overcome the master is the heart of being Sith. Even you cannot escape it. Enough! You will all learn the true depths of my power. Everything you've done. Everyone you've betrayed. There is no escape. Neil Everyone you've manipulated. I saved you then. I will not save you now. Everyone you've murdered. All your decisions are. The Force seeks balance. Always. Now I understand that a true Jedi is a match for any sin. No! No! The Force is mine! I command it! I am endless! No. In the end, you are nothing. Welcome back. What is this? A victory party. The best I could do on short notice. We destroyed him. Utterly and forever. The Sith Emperor will never rise again. At the end, all those people who appeared around us, who were they? They were the consequences he fled for so many centuries. Where is everyone else? My son is helping Kira and Scourge. They're taking my surviving students to our old training grounds on Coruscant. The rest, Darth Mar, Mitra Surik, Revan. I believe they are one with the Force at last. You have given my son the home he always needed. I never expected a Sith to be the one to help him where I could not, but he is content at last. Thank you. You should spend more time with Theron. He needs you in his life. I would like that more than anything. Today, we defeated the most evil and destructive being in history. It has been centuries since the galaxy knew a day without Tenebrae's dark influence. Today is the first step toward a new future. Let's make that future a better one.
Ah, you're awake. Shouldn't need this, then. Had an eventful day, have we? He's gone, Lana. Destroyed. Forever. I felt it. Kira and Scourge had me pick you up from the hangar. Apparently they were the first to wake from the ritual. You were unconscious for more than an hour. What happened? Satil wanted a word with me. That must have been interesting. That's one way of putting it. You'll have to tell me all about it. But first, what heading should I set? You pick. As long as it's relaxing. So this is Katina, she's my emotional support animal because I'm not used to appearing on camera because I think that the camera is going to devour my skull and just eat my brain. And as long as Katina stays here, I'm literally manifested like a ghost. I'm very surprised actually that she's staying here. Maybe she knows that I need help. You want me to, is it better if I leave? Then it's not the point, you know what I mean? If you, if you leave, know. then I'll think that you're on the other side of the door like this. <laughs> so the video is over and it's been 8 hours and 50 minutes I think. So it's been quite literally one year since I started creating working on this video and I guess this dialogue here marks the very last act because everything at this point in the discussion is rendered, edited, created. The only thing that I need to do is put in timestamps. So at the end I wanted to say where else to go from this point on. So in terms of the story, if you're interested, take a look at what happened in Darth Revan's Holocron and what happens in the future, like some 300, if not a thousand years, I could be wrong. But what happens in the future and who finds it and what they use that knowledge for. Last year I did Kreia's complete video. I would have thought you would walk with her amongst the Jedi, but that is not the way of the Sith, is it? Do not speak to me of the ways of the Sith. You, of all of us, have no conception of what it means to be Sith. So you can visit or revisit that to follow her journey more, or you could stick around and see what happens in the future and what other videos we go through. For example, we might look into what happened in the, in the internal empire and all the details there, like what happened to Valkorian's children and all the characters there. Um, or maybe we could look through Knights of the Old Republic 2 and see that storyline and sort of do it the way that we've done Knights of the Old Republic 1 in this video. And maybe I could do a video bragging with my lightsaber and it's an actual functional lightsaber it can kill people. Um, so I am aware that like some people did not like what happened after Knights of the Old Republic 1 which is the novel and the Old Republic game and I understand again that some people might not like that but I want to a full complete story. I did the best I could have done with the parts that I had, which is to sort of cut out the noise and to give more depth to characters like Surik and to just expand the story a little bit more. Um, there were some choices, like for example, I'm sure in the Eternal Empire people who have played the game The Old Republic will notice that some characters you could pick to play the role of Darth Nox, like you could pick any other class to play her role, but I just, instead of figuring out a way to sort of include every single class in that point, I thought it was easier to just lock on to the one that I like the best personally and then just do it, because it is valid. Um, so, it sounds like I'm like some social justice, where Darth Knox is valid. She is licking my nails. Why is she? This is the first time she's been on this table. Maybe that's why she's happy, because she's not allowed to be on the tables. So what if it's a lie? Why are you coming for me, bitch? Well, how the hell do they know where the cats mean? <laughs> they don't, they didn't know what I look like since 2018. What the hell? Um, what else do I have to say? Oh yeah, and Echoes of Oblivion. I did a damn good job there. I don't care. Um, that was the best part. Just, just fact. So be sure to comment what your favorite parts were. I would have suggested to people to leave comments as they progress through the story and then edit the comment, but whoever's watching this at this point probably already saw the entire story, so it's a bit too late. We can make a community post on the people. Okay, officially in seven days, it's coming up. What the fuck you want me to do now? No, no, I'm just letting you know. Hey, y'all, I made a community post a week ago <laughs> saying how y'all need to go check out the video. They're already watching the video, so they're already here. So good for you. Good for you. You checked it out. So if you want me to do another similar long story, let me know below, as well as what you thought about this project, what your favorite moments are, um, what your favorite moment of 2022 was. 
uh, your favorite pet, um, favorite software for editing audio. Should I tell them I'm depressed? No. Oh, see, that'd be funny if I included that in the video. So I will try to upload more videos and maybe perhaps even revisit the things chapter by chapter with Robin because it was an interesting journey to edit these things like how I build certain scenes and why I chose to build certain scenes a certain type of way. And um, so that, that could be an interesting thing interesting thing to go through. I was considering streams, but I honestly am just not a stream person. I don't think I'm interesting enough for that, but I'm like, maybe I could try that. I could do a playthrough of Knights of the Old Republic. That might be interesting to go through each zone. And then as I'm going through the zone, I can I can see see that bitch over there. We skip that because she's fat. Or if you want to make me, what? Stroke. Or if you, or. I don't really anything about it. <laughs> Um, or if you want me to do a video bragging about how cool my lightsaber is, um, I can do that as well. You can uh, say, actually, here's a little snippet of me wielding it. No, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm not doing that. If we are not at nine hours yet to surround it all up, I'll include white noise. I once made an audiobook. Why am I talking about this? I once made an audiobook where someone told me, like, this book is nine hours, 50 minutes. We need 10 more minutes. Can you just stretch every single file so we get another? I'm like, sure. And then you sound like, like a robot because you stretch. So, yeah, I. I will see you in the next very short project that's waiting around the corner. Who knows, you know, what it could be. Okay, I'm gonna take Katina off the table because she's gonna get too used to being here. Oh, you know what? I thought like how cliche it would be to when people end their videos when they're like, and may the force be with you. And I'm like, <laughs> like I don't want to do that. Oh, you know what a good outro would be if I'm just talking and then there's a, light, a red lightsaber right next to me somewhere, you know what I mean? And then I just die. Okay, bye. Let's go, let's go Katina. So if you stuck around in these nine hours, you're probably 1% of the people to say some funny, thank you, whatever. So. Okay, so I've been instructed to say that if you stuck around for this 1% and then I need to say some funny and then yeah. It's <laughs>